Section 1 of Europe and Renaissance and Reformation, 1453 to 1660. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Pamela Nagami, M.D. Europe in Renaissance and Reformation, 1453 to 1660 by Mary A. Hollings. Introduction our own times are separated from the middle ages mainly by two differences the boundaries both of the geographical world and of the world of thought have been enlarged the globe has been explored men no longer set limits to the knowledge they may gain these are the great results of two movements which may be said to divide medieval from modern times namely the renaissance which made a rediscovery to man of the powers of the human mind and the age of discovery which meant for the medieval mind the enlargement of the universe to both these a stimulus was given by the fall of the greek empire in fourteen fifty three constantinople was at last captured by the turks who for over a century had been pressing toward its gates during the early fifteenth century greek scholars had occasionally settled in italy to teach their language there was already among italians an enthusiastic interest in greek literature and art when the fall of the eastern empire drove many more of its subjects to seek a livelihood in florence and other wealthy towns students crowded to greek lectures monastic libraries were ransacked for classical manuscripts the increased demand for copies soon created a supply by means of the new german invention of printing which was promptly taken up in italy the treasures of the new learning could therefore be shared by all europe but it was the keen italian mind that fell most under the spell of the deep critical thought of the greeks their joy in life their worship of beauty it was natural too that classical study should first be revived in italy because the great traditions of ancient rome and its greek civilization had never quite lost their hold on italians so universal among italian scholars was the use of latin or greek that there was almost a danger of the disappearance of their own language but though it produced no great italian literature the renaissance found wonderful expression in the arts of painting sculpture and architecture and the great schools of central italy florence and venice gave to the world mighty artists raphael michelangelo da vinci and titian it would be interesting to trace from these beginnings how the influence of the renaissance went on to show itself in other countries in the form most natural to each in germany and the netherlands in painting in england in literature in spain in painting and literature the fall of constantinople also hastened the age of discovery the navigators of the time were the portuguese and it seems that a desire to wrest from the moors some of the gains of african trade first started their voyages down the west coast in eastern europe the fact that the turks now overran the trade routes made asiatic commerce risky and expensive since constantinople the chief oriental mart for europe was lost to the christian some other way must be found to the east necessity proved the mother of discovery in looking for a track to the far east columbus stumbled upon a new continent while vasco da gama's famous voyage to india by the cape of good hope in fourteen ninety seven finished the work of diaz and the portuguese mariners and opened up the oldest continent to european trade and conquest in fifteen nineteen magellan's expedition earned the proud distinction of first circumnavigating the globe europe turned her face to the west and the mediterranean ceased to be her commercial centre new countries on the shores of the atlantic took their places in the forefront of commercial enterprise the great age of the italian and south german towns was past this was realized by the venetian diarist who notes on the arrival of the news of da gama's achievement the whole city was distressed and astounded and the wisest heads take it to be the worst piece of information that we could ever have had 
the great states of our own times were in this period of change being built up in christendom which it had been the dream of the middle ages to keep intact as one church and one empire of these young nations the chief were france england and spain each ruled by a strong king in germany and italy on the other hand the weakness of the central power in the first and the total absence in the second left the people of each so free to go their own way that they lacked sense enough of a common life to wish to be nations at all but the variety for which these circumstances made room gives their history special interest in warfare the use of gunpowder and the invention of artillery gradually destroyed feudalism and put into the hands of governments a weapon against which rebellion was at first powerless but the rise of the people was beginning as wealth and education increased though it did not keep pace at first with that of the kings to society at large men were beginning to have an importance in themselves in the middle ages their importance was generally swallowed up in the class or institution or order to which they belonged section two of europe in renaissance and reformation by mary a hollings this librivox recording is in the public domain read by pamela nagami chapter one the empire in the fifteenth century part one owing to the weakness of the crown germany was still the most feudal of all countries and lagged far behind the rest in national growth the holy roman empire to give it the full and proper name was at this time ruled by the habsburg emperor frederick the third it consisted of a collection of states including the seven electorates namely the three rhenish archbishoprics of mainz mayence trier treves and Cologne, cologne and the four states of bohemia saxony brandenburg and the palatinate other important members of the empire were the group of the austrian dominions including austria proper tyrol east schwabia styria carinthia and carniola then divided between three branches of the habsburg family and the duchies of bavaria and württemberg these territories which were already almost independent states had all sprung from the larger feudal fiefs their growth to complete independence is one of the chief features of german history of this period for in face of their opposition it seemed impossible to provide the empire with a strong government and the habsburgs in their family dominions themselves became the worst offenders against national unity each prince had the same problem to solve in his state that so sorely needed to be solved for the empire namely how to provide a system of justice and of taxation and an efficient fighting force but he was jealous of any imperial organization that might interfere with his private arrangements and frederick and his successor maximilian as austrian princes were the most jealous of all as the forest tree for lack of proper nourishment for its roots begins to wither and fall away at the tips of its branches so did the extremities or outlying states of the empire burgundy ruled franche comte had annexed guilders and was ambitious of becoming an independent kingdom france was turning her gaze toward the rhine the swiss cantons were practically though not yet legally a republic italy was already lost and the attitude of the eastern states of hungary bohemia and poland a cause of grave anxiety to say nothing of the turk who threatened the whole of the southeastern frontier to these dangers the habsburgs were not indifferent they made it their business to build up a great family dominion by means of marriages and a keen attention to foreign policy through family possessions or connections they became guardians of the frontier on the west and southeast they planned to recover the hold upon italy and at all events to prevent the french from securing a footing there and they retained their own hold upon the empire as long as it lasted the election of frederick the third who reigned from fourteen forty to fourteen ninety four was due to his insignificance and his reign was long and confused resembling in some respects that of henry the third of england 
yet it has been said of him that he won all his objects in the end Ranka. he also helped to shape the destinies both of his family and of the empire almost as much by what he avoided doing as by what he did the most important questions of the day were three the relations with outlying and foreign states the state of the church and domestic reform in the first place frederick was deeply interested in the fate of two important kingdoms on his eastern borders bohemia and hungary his cousin and ward ladislav posthumus king of bohemia was a boy hungary had just passed into the hands of ladislav the third king of poland and every inch of land that increased the power of the rival slav race increased the anxiety of the german but when ladislav fell fighting the turks at varna ladislav posthumus was chosen king of hungary thus uniting these two kingdoms under a ruler of the elder habsburg line whose heir frederick the third a member of a younger branch hoped to become the opportunity seemed to have come when ladislav posthumus died suddenly at the age of eighteen leaving vacant the thrones of hungary and bohemia and the duchy of austria frederick eventually secured austria but the two kingdoms took each its own line and respectively chose matthias corvinus son of the hungarian hero john hunyadi and george podiabrad the leader of the hussite party in bohemia and regent during ladislav's minority under the rule of these two able kings hungary and bohemia became models to the rest of europe of strong and tolerant government unfortunately neither of them left a successor ladislav of poland eventually reigned in their stead but frederick had the satisfaction of witnessing the conclusion of the treaty of pressburg fourteen ninety one by which the habsburgs were to become the heirs of ladislav when the male line of his house should fail by fifteen twenty six this had come to pass on the death at mohawks of his son louis whose sister anne was the wife of frederick's great-grandson thus ferdinand of austria by the double claim of marriage and treaty rights became king of hungary and bohemia which the emperors his descendants continued to hold as their family possessions during the critical years of this question frederick's chief attention was drawn to affairs in the west charles the bold ruler of the netherlands and the two burgundies was the most headstrong and ambitious prince of his time in his double position as french and german prince holding his fiefs both of king louis and of the emperor he was quite a match for either of his overlords the aim of his career is best described in his own words instead of one king of france i should like to see six by fourteen seventy two he had however come to the conclusion that his purpose would be better served by uniting his dominions into a kingdom of the rhine with the emperor's sanction a powerful new state on his western frontier was the last thing frederick the third desired to see attracted for a moment by charles's proposal of a marriage between his heiress mary of burgundy and the emperor's son maximilian he consented to an interview at trier but when charles arrived with crown and sceptre for his expected coronation in fourteen seventy three frederick the third whose habit was never to face a difficulty when it could be shirked crept away down the moselle one night and the disgusted duke returned no greater a man than he came a second chance never appeared for charles soon involved himself in the wars with the swiss in which he fell tyrol and alsace the original habsburg inheritance in schwabia which had been pledged for a sum of money to charles the bold were recovered by their owner frederick the third's cousin who being without an heir presently handed them over to frederick's son maximilian and mary of burgundy was glad to find a husband and protector in maximilian amid the ruin of her father's fortunes frederick had every reason to congratulate himself by the deaths of his cousin and ladislav posthumus the entire austrian dominions were once more united under his son while charles the bold's daughter brought to his descendants that great burgundian inheritance on which his heart was set 
the struggle between german and slav for supremacy in eastern europe was even more marked in the fate of the teutonic order than in the history of hungary and bohemia this society of german knights whose original aim since twelve thirty one had been to convert and conquer the heathen prussian slavs had become a ruling power for the promotion of german colonization and inevitably clashed with the interests of slavonic poland at first the knights carried all before them but in the fifteenth century the tide of success turned in favour of the slav race defeat in battle the outcome of a decline in loyalty vigour and self-restraint within the order itself at last overthrew it in fourteen sixty six by the treaty of torn the whole of west prussia was surrendered to poland while east prussia was left to the order as a polish fief in vain did the knights appeal to frederick the third for help throughout this struggle and finally in disgust at the selfish indifference of the habsburgs the grand master albert of hohenzollern converted east prussia into a duchy for himself and his descendants and the teutonic order came to an inglorious end in frederick's dealings with the church in germany his conduct was the reverse of patriotic germany had kept outside the dispute between pope eugenius the fourth and the last great reforming council at basel until eugenius could secure the support of the empire there seemed little chance of his recovering his authority to this end he wished to withdraw the pragmatic sanction of mainz which under frederick's predecessor had secured considerable freedom to the german church in the matters of elections and taxation frederick was anxious to be on good terms with the pope at a time when he was surrounded by difficulties with the electors the swiss and the hungarians for reasons of diplomacy therefore he consented to be bought over through his clever agent aeneas silvius and by the concordat of vienna in fourteen forty eight sacrificed the pragmatic sanction for the sake of an understanding with rome papal interference in germany was already thoroughly unpopular and had it not been for the unlucky perpetual divisions among the german princes a scheme to depose the emperor and reform the church might have been carried out as it was however the pope succeeded in raising for a so-called turkish crusade large sums of money which went into his own treasury a proceeding which the victims denounced as a papal plot to tame germany finally aeneas silvius now pope pius the second effectually checked all attempts at reform in fourteen sixty by condemning in the bull execrabilis all appeals to a general council as wicked and heretical for the next fifty years german resistance to papal claims was of the feeblest frederick's reign in germany has been described as the climax of imperial neglect the general contempt for the emperor's authority was shown by constant private wars among which that between albert achilles of hohenzollern and the town of nuremberg may be quoted as an example the fact was that as long as frederick had his way as prince in his austrian states he cared little what indignities the empire might suffer indeed in this matter he outprinced the princes for thirty years he hid himself in his own territories and was deaf to what passed outside when desperate efforts were made to rouse frederick to head a crusade for the rescue of constantinople in fourteen fifty three it was reported that the emperor was planting his gardens and snaring little birds End of section three of europe and renaissance and reformation by mary a hollings this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 1. The Empire in the Fifteenth Century. Part 2. Since Frederick would not fulfill his responsibilities, reformers arose to relieve him of them. The Diet or Parliament of the Empire consisted of the seven electors, the princes, and the imperial towns, although the towns only made good their right to be consulted in 1489. There remained two important unrepresented classes, the imperial knights, who like the towns were tenants-in-chief, and the peasants. But it was not until the reign of Frederick's great-grandson Charles 
that their grievances became a public danger. All the earlier attempts at reform in his reign Frederick persistently ignored. A proposal in 1461 to depose him in favor of George Podiabrat came to nothing. The scheme which had most chance of success in his later years was that of Berthold, Archbishop of Mainz, who in 1484 planned to provide an efficient central government, somewhat after the manner of the baronial party in Henry III's reign, not under the crown, but under a committee of nobles. Its chief features were a permanent court of justice, the land peace to supersede Faustrecht, or the right of waging private war, a system of taxation called the common penny, and the raising of an imperial army. The emperor proved the worst enemy of the plan, which as long as he lived had not much life in it. Frederick did not lay up for himself a peaceful old age. He was driven from his capital by the Hungarians in 1485, and wandered from one monastery to another seeking refuge. Yet even then he scored the second great triumph of his reign in persuading the electors to accept in his lifetime his son as king of the Romans. To Maximilian, indeed, he confided the chief authority during his last years. From his own point of view, Frederick's reign was on the whole a success. He had come to a working understanding with the Pope. He had defeated reform. He had outlived all his worst enemies and had built up a great family dominion. His belief in Austria's future was shown by his practice of marking his property with the five vowels A-E-I-O-U, which stand in either German or Latin for Austria shall rule the world. Frederick was to some extent far-sighted. He moved slowly to his ends, uninfluenced by dislike or popularity. He was undignified, miserly, and in the opinion of contemporaries, cowardly. But that may have been because he was neither soldier nor sportsman. He had a sense of humor and unfailing cheerfulness. He was not a statesman. To the German patriot of his time he must have been past praying for. Yet there is something masterly about the inactivity of his reign. Maximilian I, who reigned from 1493 to 1519, Kaiser Max, as his subjects called him, was a great contrast to his father, and from his frank and friendly intercourse with all classes was one of the most popular of kings. He was brave, adventurous, and dignified a mighty hunter and a master of all the arts of chivalry. He was very gifted, very cultivated, and so quick and resourceful that some of his failures may have been due to his inability to recognize any limits at all to his capacity. There was a queer strain in his character which led him to carry about his own coffin with him in later life, to write that curious book The White King, describing his own career, and to talk apparently seriously of being elected pope. He was vain, restless, and fickle, as Bacon said of him. He ended things by imagination, as an ill archer who draws not his arrows up to the head. If it suited his purpose, he could lie and cheat. Despite his popularity, he was not well served, for he never trusted his ministers with full powers but with all his faults and eccentricities he remains one of the most brilliant and attractive figures of his age. The great question of reform of the empire faced Maximilian in Germany. It had been shelved in his father's reign, but his own plans forbade that it should be any longer ignored. There seemed three possible methods of reform. The strongest measure would have been reformed through a monarchy resembling those which were being built up at the moment in England, France, and Spain. The second method, though also aiming at converting the disconnected German states into a living united nation, proposed to bind them by the looser tie of a federal union. And the third method made no appeal to national feelings at all, 
but contented itself with a reorganization of each state internally. Few men were better fitted than Maximilian to play the part demanded by the first method. But unfortunately, his object was not reform at all, but war, and the two aims were naturally opposed. The state of Europe interested him far more than the state of Germany, both because he built up schemes of European diplomacy and because the extension of the Habsburg inheritance, rather than the strengthening of the empire, was as dear to his heart as it had been to Frederick III's. The European situation, just after his accession, was full of possibilities for Maximilian. His position in the Netherlands had at last improved. Charles VIII had just started on his fateful Italian journey, after rejecting Maximilian's daughter Margaret and taking another bride in the person of Anne of Brittany, who had been married by proxy to Maximilian himself. The Pope was on the point of flight from Rome, and the Austrian dominions were threatened by the Turks. Maximilian soon joined the Italian League against France, and this made some concession to the reforming party inevitable, or he could not get money for his outfit. The proceedings of the Diet of Worms in 1498 may be said to sum up all the difficulties of this question. Maximilian came demanding money to relieve Milan from the French and to keep a standing army for ten years. The only available troops were raised by detachments by the electors, princes, and cities, and had no common organization at all. In return, the reforming party put forth its scheme drawn up by Berthold, Archbishop of Mainz, who was more deeply impressed than any other man with the crying needs of the empire. They hoped to relieve Maximilian practically of all authority, except command in war. They set up the imperial chamber, a stationary and permanent court of sixteen members, half of whom were to be lawyers, chosen by the Diet and responsible to it alone. Its duties were to try breaches of the peace, for the abolition of the Faustrecht or private war was proclaimed throughout the empire, to act as a court of appeal, and to administer the national revenue, which was to be raised in future by the system known as the common penny. This combined the features of both property and income taxes, being levied at the rate of one florin in every thousand, while in the case of the poor it was equivalent to a poll tax one florin being collected from a group of twenty-four. The tax was to be collected by the princes in the towns, and here the difficulty began. The knights announced that as they did not attend diets, they were not bound by them, while the bishops objected to taking orders from a lay council such as the chamber. Maximilian set a bad example by declining to collect the tax in Austria. He was jealous of the proposed court, and was besides annoyed that the administration of justice by the chamber would deprive him of his principal source of income, namely the fees of his Austrian court of justice. As soon as possible he left for Italy. He made no effort to return for the annual meetings of the Diet, and in his absence any scheme of reform was doomed to failure. Troubles abroad, however, thickened around him, not the least of these being a war with the Swiss in 1499. The reforms of the Diet applied to Switzerland, as it was still in theory part of the Empire, but the Swiss objected to the Imperial Chamber, and saw no reason for collecting the common penny, since they were able to maintain peace in their cantons without interference from the Diet, in which, indeed, they were not represented. By the death of Sigismund of Tyrol in 1496, his lands had passed to Maximilian, and certain local leagues, alarmed at this addition to his power, associated themselves with the ten cantons of the Confederation, thereby drawing the latter into their own quarrels with Tyrol. In the war that broke out, only the Schwabian League gave help, and after suffering defeats which were a great blow to his military prestige, Maximilian came to terms in the Treaty of Basel, which freed the Swiss from the tax and all imperial jurisdiction, though they continued to be part of the empire in name until the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. 
under circumstances that were not improved by the french conquest of milan in fifteen hundred maximilian himself proposed at the diet of augsburg a standing committee of the diet known as the council of regency to act as the executive in his prolonged absences from germany the power lay with the electors and princes it was as the venetian ambassador described it an abdication of the emperor but maximilian had only abdicated to gain help against france and when the council concluded on its own account a treaty with that country thereby setting it free to recover naples he was furious at being outwitted and himself sold the duchy of milan to louis the twelfth he withheld the pay of the members of the imperial chamber which broke up when the electors assembled a meeting to discuss his deposition maximilian at the lowest ebb of his fortune set his face toward austria he would in future he said act as an austrian prince the result for austria was the establishment of a real central government such as germany lacked but he also applied himself to form a party among the younger princes who soon yielded to his fascination to win the nobles by concessions of toll and the bishops by nominating his supporters to their sees with the pope's help whilst the plan of deposition ended in talk maximilian's prospects began to clear the death of berthold of mainz removed almost the only man he regarded as an enemy the marriages of his two children with the son and eldest daughter of ferdinand and isabella promised much for the house of Habsburg, and relieved his immediate needs. After the birth in 1500 of his grandson Charles, Maximilian thought seriously of taking the imperial crown, though he contented himself with the title of Imperator Electus, without receiving the crown from the Pope's hands. Thereafter he was styled Emperor, and his successors, with the sole exception of Charles, took the same course meanwhile the prospects of the reform movement waned as the emperor's position improved all chance of national reform had disappeared all that remained possible was reorganization within each state and in this direction maximilian did something to set an example in austria to those who really cared for their country the failure of national reform must have been a heartbreaking affair but the responsibility for it does not lie with the emperor alone german jealousy of austria's predominance had something to do with it as had the indifference displayed by the electors to the emperor's foreign policy there is no doubt too that most of the schemes aroused the opposition of the smaller princes because they proposed to give overwhelming influence to the greater maximilian never even attempted to give life to any plan for welding the german states into a modern monarchy and as that form of government contained perhaps the best chance of success in that age it only remained for each state to do for itself what no one seemed able to do for the empire and make its prince the real centre of government at the same time it must not be supposed that the reform movement left no traces behind it at one of the later diets the whole of the empire except bohemia was divided into ten circles in each of which a captain was locally appointed to carry out with the aid of a force of cavalry the decisions of the imperial chamber a plan that came into working order under charles v the imperial chamber itself as subsequently revived was one of the most valuable results of the movement after the abandonment of the common penny military forces were raised by the matricular system which ignoring the principle of imperial unity provided that a quota should be contributed by each estate maximilian must be credited with the success of the german landsknecht or foot soldier whom he took great pains to make efficient in battle and for whose equipment he borrowed ideas from the swiss he was also a practical pioneer in the invention of light field artillery nevertheless the political and social disorders of the reign became more marked at its end the schwabian league of nobles knights and cities which had done useful work in south germany for the past twenty years split up 
a counter-league under the Duke of Württemberg sprang into being and fell to blows with the League itself. The knights, wolves to commerce, were once more prominent in the person of the famous Sickingen, waging private war against the city of Worms. The roads were insecure. Justice was not done. The French were carrying all before them in Italy while Maximilian was harassed by the eternal shortness of money. The religious troubles under Luther had broken out, and the misery of the peasants manifested itself in the rise of the Bunchu. Everything, in short, was in train for the Reformation, which in Germany was to be much more than a purely religious movement. End Section 4 of Europe and Renaissance and Reformation by Mary A. Hollings this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 2. France under Louis XI and Charles VIII. Part 1. By 1453, Calais was all that remained to the English of their dominions in France. The reign of Charles VII is famous for a thorough reform of his kingdom, yet the king's last years were destined to pass in uneasy suspicion he banished his eldest son louis to his province of dauphine which soon became a meeting-place for the disloyal and discontented the dauphin married the duke of savoy's daughter and looked round for other supporters of his cause chief among these was his father's vassal and former foe philip the good duke of burgundy when in fourteen fifty six the king sent an army to subdue dauphine louis took refuge at the duke's court during his five years stay he gained a knowledge of men and matters that was to prove of the greatest use in his later dealings with burgundy as charles the seventh grimly put it my cousin is sheltering the fox that will one day eat his chickens this somewhat scattered flock his territories, Philip was in fact busy trying to gather together. The northern group, consisting mainly of Flanders, Brabant, and Luxembourg, was separated by the independent Duchy of Lorraine from the two Burgundies in the south. By the Treaty of Arras, 1425, certain strong towns on the Somme had been handed over to Philip on the understanding that they might be redeemed by France later. But Charles discovered before long that this was not to be in his lifetime. Meanwhile, the Croix party at the Burgundian court was friendly to France, and their influence upon Duke Philip was strong. There was a curious likeness between the two courts at this time. In each case there was a sovereign controlled by an unpopular favorite, with a hostile heir, Charles of Charolais, the future Charles the Bold, played the Dauphin's part in Burgundy, while the arch-intriguer, the Count of St. Paul, hovered between them both, turning to his own account every possible advantage. Louis managed, however, to keep on good terms with both Burgundian parties until the news of his father's death in 1461 raised him to the French throne, 1461 to 1483. The new reign began badly. The foundations of a strong kingship had been well and truly laid by Charles the Seventh, but at first his son showed an almost reckless faculty for taking false steps. Fortunately, he was at the same time, as Comines said, the cleverest of kings at recovering his footing, yet a little tact would have saved him this trouble. His dismissal of his father's ministers and generals, especially Dunois, Duchatel and Dammartin, though probably eventually necessary, was so hasty as to drive these important public servants to the side of the discontented nobles. The outcome of this alliance was the War of the Public Wheel in 1465. The great French nobles, the princes of the lilies, were of the blood royal, and their general aim was to make themselves as independent as possible. The most powerful leaders were the Dukes of Bourbon and Brittany, and the Count of Charolais, son of the Duke of Burgundy. Others were Charles of Berry, the king's brother, 
John of Calabria, brother of Margaret of Anjou, and the Count of St. Paul. Their grievances were of a personal or class nature, but these private aims were hidden under the patriotic title of the League of the Public Wheel. For instance, the king had on his accession restricted hunting rights. He had removed Bourbon and Charolais from their respective posts as governors of Guienne and Normandy. By the help of the Qua party in Burgundy, he had persuaded Philip to let him redeem the some towns, with the result that the Qua were expelled from court, where Charles of Charolais became the real ruler. Louis quarrelled with the Duke of Brittany about a question of homage, and the latter tried to bring into play that alliance between England and Burgundy, which had been such an important feature in the last part of the Hundred Years' War. The kingmaker Warwick was in favour of Louis's suggestion of a French marriage alliance for Edward IV. But the English king, without consulting anyone, chose to marry Elizabeth Woodville, St. Paul's niece, and thus arose between him and Warwick a coolness which soon became open hostility, and led England to play some part in the affairs of France and Burgundy in this reign. Meanwhile, Louis, determined to strike first at the rebels, found that most of the trained forces responded to his call, thus giving him an advantage over the feudal levies of the enemy led by Charolais. The only engagement was an indecisive skirmish at Montlhery. Louis exerted himself greatly to break up the League, whose members, recognizable by a red silk tag, numbered more than five hundred lords, ladies, and knights. He won over the city of Paris by remitting taxes and inviting its representatives to his council. He set himself to divide the nobles by redressing the special grievances of each. Their demands were set forth in the Treaty of saint mar in 1465, but Louis's design was merely to satisfy each for the time being by giving largely and promising still more, commines. Nothing further was heard of the public wrongs. The public wheel became individual wheel, and the king lost no time in recovering most of what he had yielded to the princes. He stirred up an insurrection in Liège, a little state in the Netherlands, ruled by its own bishop under the patronage of Burgundy. While Charolais was suppressing the rising, he recovered Normandy, which the treaty had obliged him to entrust to his brother. He decided to see what a personal interview would do for him with Charles the Bold, and armed with a safe conduct, visited him at Peronne. This, the second of his false steps, nearly ended in tragedy. With the king arrived news of a renewed outbreak at Liège, openly encouraged by the king's envoys. Charles, beside himself with rage, swore to have his sovereign's life, and it was only through a well-judged distribution of handsome sums of gold among Charles's ministers that their master was pacified. As it was, Louis had to agree to carry out the Treaty of saint mar give up Champagne to his brother instead of Normandy, and accompany Charles on a punitive expedition against Liège, so lately his ally. The town was taken and sacked. This done, Louis, taking leave of the Duke, casually asked, Supposing my brother is discontented with Champagne, what would you like me to do? Charles replied absently, Settle it between you, as long as he is satisfied the king seized the chance to persuade his brother to accept Guienne, which, being unlike Champagne, remote from both Burgundy and Brittany, was comparatively safe in the hands of the easily led duke. Thus Louis contrived not only to escape from the worst scrape of his life, but in his crafty way to turn it to account. He even delayed to give up the some towns till his brother's death in 1471, made it safe flatly to refuse to fulfill his promise. For several years before that event, however, Louis's relations with Brittany, Burgundy, and England continued to be full of difficulties. Since 1466, he had been allied with Warwick, who had quarrelled with Edward IV, 
while the Yorkist party in England had definitely ranged itself on the side of Burgundy by the marriage of Edward's sister Margaret with Charles the Bold. Preparations were made for a war between France on the one hand and Burgundy, Brittany, and England on the other. But at the critical moment, Edward was distracted by a Lancastrian rising in Wales, and Francis of Brittany withdrew from the alliance. Warwick played his hand so as to become indispensable whichever party should succeed. He married his elder daughter Isabella to Clarence, Edward's brother, and with his son-in-law defeated and took prisoner the king. But the intervention of Charles the Bold and Edward's own popularity made it necessary to release him, and Warwick and Clarence fled to France. Louis brought about a reconciliation between his cousin Queen Margaret of Anjou and the kingmaker, which resulted in the marriage of the Prince of Wales with Anne Neville, Warwick's younger daughter. In 1470, a rapid revolution followed in England. Henry VI found himself once more upon the throne, while Edward took refuge in Burgundy, to the great annoyance of Charles the Bold. In spite of the fact that the fugitive was his brother-in-law, Charles was fond of dwelling upon his own Lancastrian descent through his Portuguese mother, being alive to the possibility of succeeding in this way to the English throne. His solution of the difficulty was characteristic of the time. While publicly recognizing Henry VI as king and threatening death to any of his subjects who should join Edward, he secretly gave him help to return to England. The utter overthrow of the Lancastrian cause at Barnet and Tewkesbury was a blow to the hopes of Louis XI, for whom fresh trouble with Burgundy, Brittany, and Guienne had already arisen through the agency of St. Paul. This noble was at once a vassal of Burgundy and constable or commander-in-chief of the French army. His wife was the queen's sister, and his niece married to Edward IV. Through these connections, and by carefully balancing his relations with France and Burgundy, he hoped to fill a semi-royal position in Europe, and was fairly safe in his intrigues, as long as France and Burgundy did not combine against him. He now persuaded Louis to seize Saint-Quentin and Amiens, hoping that the Duke would hasten to buy the alliance of Charles of Guienne by giving him his daughter Mary in marriage. Thus he hoped to secure the Duke of Guienne's lasting support, which might enable him in future to dispense with that of France and Burgundy. To this scheme, however, Edward IV was unfriendly. Mary was the heiress of Charles the Bold, and as in the event of the death of the Dauphin, a delicate baby, the Duke of Guienne would succeed his brother as king, the result of this marriage might be the union of Burgundy and France, which would prove a danger to English interests. He was even now ready to throw over the Burgundian alliance for one with France. But Louis preferred a truce with Burgundy to new entanglements with England, and the opportune death of the Duke of Guienne in 1472 released him from his difficulties. Guienne itself became crown property once more. Louis threw over the negotiations with Burgundy and promptly invaded Brittany. Charles made a furious attack on the French border country, took and sacked Nell with great cruelty, lay siege to Beauvais, and tried to gain Edward IV's help. Beauvais resisted so gallantly that the Duke, realizing that it would be a long affair, and wearying of a struggle which no longer accorded with the policy shaping itself in his mind, made a truce with France, which was destined to be a lasting peace. Thus ended, in 1472, Charles's career as leader of the French princes. His ambition now turned to building up a kingdom of Burgundy, midway between France and Germany, which would stretch from Holland to Italy and cover most of the territory once ruled by Lothar, grandson of Charles the Great. By rapid stages, Charles followed out this new path. As early as 1468, he had lent money to Sigismund of Tyrol in his difficulties with the Swiss, 
and had received as security of repayment Alsace and Breisgau, which he was now trying to reduce to order under his harsh and unpopular bailiff, Hagenbach. In 1473 he bought Gelderland from its unwilling duke, between whom and his son Charles had undertaken to arbitrate in a dispute. In the same year the death of Nicholas, son of John of Calabria, the last descendant in the male line of King René of Anjou, gave him an excuse for interfering in Lorraine, though the young René, Nicholas's sister's son, was ready and willing to defend his own claim. After Frederick III decamped from Treves, Charles took up the cudgels on behalf of the Archbishop of Cologne against his subjects, wasting a year in besieging Neuss and arousing the displeasure of the Emperor, who considered it none of his business. Meanwhile, Louis, who had been regarding these events with watchful eye, judged that the moment had come for him to set on foot an alliance between the Duke's increasing foes. He reconciled Sigismund with the Swiss, the Alsatian towns found the money to repay Charles, and Hagenbach was put to death. French gold fostered the war party among the cantons led by Bern. Even Frederick III was brought into Louis's net, though he replied with his usual caution to a proposal of the king to share Charles's inheritance, saying that it was better to wait to divide the bear skin till the beast was dead. Lastly, René of Lorraine invaded Luxembourg. On his side, Charles made an agreement with the regent of Savoy, Louis's own sister, and an Italian friend of hers, who brought mercenaries to his aid, and at once Granson and Morat in her territories was overrun. But a more striking event was an alliance between the Duke and Edward IV in 1475. After some delay, Edward reached Calais, only to find Charles and a small following to receive him, for the bulk of the Duke's army, though exhausted by the siege of Neuss, had been sent off to attack Lorraine. In this quest it was successful, and Charles had the great joy of seeing his northern and southern dominions at last united. Section 5 of Europe and Renaissance and Reformation by Mary A. Hollings. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain read by pamela nagami chapter two france under louis the eleventh and charles the eighth part two another ally of the english saint paul actually fired on them from saint quentin whose gates he had offered to open to them edward was not pleased with the situation nothing says the critical comine can be imagined more foolish and uncouth than the figure cut by the English army on its first landing. But in a short time, he admits, they became brave and skillful soldiers. Louis now exerted himself to turn aside Edward's intention. To garter king at arms, charged with declaring England's defiance, he made presents of gold and velvet. So that no time should be lost, he improvised a herald of his own, and in 1475, arranged a meeting with Edward at Pekingy. For a sum of money from Louis, referred to as Prince of France, Edward promised to withdraw his troops and to give in marriage to the Dauphin his daughter Elizabeth. When the news came to his ears, Charles roundly abused Edward in English for the benefit of the bystanders. But he was obliged to make terms with France. This truce proved the ruin of the Constable St. Paul, who had betrayed both France and Burgundy in turn, and he was executed. On his fall, Louis recovered Picardy. Charles now seemed at the summit of his fortunes, but his new gains, without the recovery of Alsace, did not satisfy him. In 1476, he therefore declared war on the Swiss. At Grinson, in the territory of Savoy, the two forces met. The victory of the Swiss was overwhelming. The Duke's guns, camp, and war chest fell into their hands. He retreated into a castle near Pontarlier, cursing the hitherto despised enemy. In a second battle a few months later, the Duke's army was overthrown at Morat, when many of his troops were driven into the lake to perish. 
That year, young René of Lorraine recovered Nancy, his capital, and the duke, though it was midwinter, laid siege to the town. The battle which raged about its walls was to be the last of his unsuccessful sieges. On his great black charger, Charles was last seen alive where the fight was hottest. His dead body was recovered on January 5, 1477, frozen hard into the mud of a brook, and no man knew the manner of his death. So great was the impression Charles made on his own age that for a long time his subjects, unable to believe him dead, prophesied that like Arthur or Barbarossa he would return. Yet Charles to us seems a figure of somewhat showy splendor, aspiring to a greater part than he could play. His character was not attractive, he was outwitted by better brains than his own. Though temperate in life, inflexibly just, ever ready to listen to grievances, courageous, sincere, and more straightforward than most of his brother rulers, his virtues did not eclipse in the popular mind his cold severity, his chariness of praise, the outbursts of violence and cruelty that disfigured his later years. Restless and grasping as he was, he had neither insight nor judgment to cope with subtle and discriminating minds. Even his family affections were sacrificed to ambition, and rather than put up with a son-in-law, he left his defenseless child to hold her own as best she might between her callous subjects and Louis, her unprincipled godfather. The latter, we are told, celebrated the news of Charles's death by a grand banquet, at which the uneasy guests, conscious of many lapses from loyalty, wondered gloomily what fate was likely to overtake them, now that the king's hands were free. Louis, indeed, could not make up his mind whether to marry Mary to some French prince, or to despoil her of her inheritance, and ended up by trying to do both at once. This policy was its own ruin. Having gained over to his marriage scheme Mary's confidential Burgundian ministers, he next betrayed them to their bitter enemies, the estates of Ghent, with whom he also wished to stand well. In vain Mary pleaded in the marketplace for their lives. They were put to death. At the same time, Louis was already in possession of the Duchy of Burgundy, and the Somme towns which he had seized on the first news of Charles's death, and of other territories which he was obliged later to restore. War broke out between France and Burgundy. Louis conquered Arras, and Artois submitted. The death before Tournay of Adolf of Gelderland, a young ruffian whom Mary's subjects sought to force upon her in marriage, caused Louis to revert during a truce to his marriage schemes but his agents were unpopular, and Mary had never forgiven Louis his treachery towards her. The suit of Maximilian of Austria was revived, and the young duchess was solemnly betrothed to him in 1477. So mean, however, about money was Frederick III, that the emperor's son made his state entry into Ghent at his bride's expense. Though Maximilian was two years younger than Mary, he showed a gay courage in facing the situation that would have won the heart of a less distressful princess. When the wedding festivities were over, he made ready to defend his wife's dominions. In the war that followed, French troops overran the county of Burgundy. In the north, Maximilian laid siege to Terouenne, and in the one pitched battle of the war held his ground. But the early death of Mary from the results of a fall from her horse, left her husband without real authority in the Netherlands, since the guardianship of the two children, Philip and Margaret, was claimed by the estates of Flanders. He was therefore ready to come to terms with France, and Louis, whose health was visibly failing, was not unwilling for peace. By the Treaty of Arras in 1482, the Dauphin was to marry Margaret of Austria, Maximilian's little daughter, who was to be educated in France for her future destiny, and to bring Artois and the county of Burgundy as dowry to her husband. 
the solemn betrothal of the children took place to the intense anger of edward the fourth who however died before he could take any steps to avenge the insult to his daughter already styled dauphiness after several turbulent years in the netherlands and having even undergone the indignity of imprisonment at the hands of his subjects in bruges maximilian returned to germany since no objection had been raised in the treaty of arras louis retained the sum towns and the duchy of burgundy at the time of his death other important possessions had come into his hands by his intervention between the king of aragon and his subjects louis had already gained roussillon and cerdagne thus bringing his frontier to the pyrenees the possessions of the house of anjou namely anjou men bar and provence and the angevin claim upon naples had been left to the king by the will of his cousin the count of men who had been made king rene's heir the position of the great vassals had altered greatly since the war of the public wheel the king's brother and the duke of burgundy were no more the duke of alencon had died in prison the count of armagnac was killed leading a rising on his estates the duke of nemours and st paul had ended on the block the duke of bourbon was failing in health and his brother and heir was married to the king's younger daughter while louis of orleans was husband of the elder of the throng of princes of the lilies the duke of brittany alone remained powerful and dangerous during the last years of his life louis tried by feverish activity to disguise the fact of his failing health he sent frequent embassies made collections of relics and of strange animals and relentlessly punished offenders lest it should be supposed that his grasp of affairs had relaxed the notoriously shabby king developed a liking for gorgeous apparel but he lived in darkened rooms and in great seclusion his natural suspiciousness increased with illness and he shut himself up at plessis les tours where he was strongly guarded but soldiers were no protection against poison which was his chief dread his attendants mostly low-born favourites treated him harshly but they were the only men in whom he felt any confidence since they depended entirely on his favour the dying king filled with nervous terrors in his gloomy fortress is a tragic figure after a paralytic stroke his life ended at the age of sixty-one in fourteen eighty three the whole reign of louis bears the stamp of his character in virtues and vices alike he lived according to a public not a private standard he had acute intelligence great wit wide interests and boundless perseverance he would spare no pains to gain a man who could either serve or harm him like napoleon he studied carefully the characters of the chief men of those courts with whom he had most to do he spent great sums on intrigues and negotiations invariably preferring the crooked way to the straight in political cunning and subtlety he had nothing to learn from the most finished italian of the age and he hated above all things expenditure on wars in regard to money matters he was businesslike and honourably exact in discharging his obligations though suspicious and timid he had an unbridled tongue the origin of most of his worst scrapes his religion was mere grovelling superstition though not perhaps vindictive he was certainly cruel he played an apparently losing game with endless resource and courage and was seen at his best in adversity as charles the eighth was still a minor the government was carried on by a regent his sister anne de beaujeu whose husband was a younger brother of the duke of bourbon she was a woman of power and vigour and inherited the political ability of her father she had anything but an easy time for the death of louis was a signal for the outbreak of discontent the states-general at tours presented a number of grievances reflecting upon the methods of the late government the nobles led by the duke of orleans rose in rebellion and began to intrigue with richard the third of england and therefore took advantage of the presence in brittany of henry of richmond to support his expedition against richard 
René of Lorraine, too, who showed signs of attempting to recover his lost inheritance, was pacified by the present of the Duchy of Bar. The most important question for the Regency was, however, the marriage of Anne of Brittany, heiress of the Duke, who had been for so long a thorn in the side of France. On the death of Duke Francis, Anne de Beaujeu began to negotiate for the hand of his heiress for the young king, but was indignant at finding that she was already the bride by proxy of Maximilian of Austria. On the ground that the royal consent was necessary for the marriage of a vassal and heiress, the regent swept aside the marriage. Anne of Brittany, however, still refused her royal suitor, and only submitted after a war in which her hand was the price of defeat. Maximilian was, however, too busy elsewhere to avenge the insult to himself and his daughter, for the marriage of Anne of Brittany with Charles the Eighth not only robbed Maximilian of his bride, but his daughter Margaret of her future husband. Anne de Beaujeu had now retired from the regency, but expressed her strong disapproval of a policy she was no longer able to prevent. This was a scheme proposed by the San Severini barons of Naples, that Charles should lay claim to that throne as inheritor of the rights of the House of Anjou. The feather-brained young king was easily attracted by such an adventure, and so as to leave behind him a state of peace and goodwill, he concluded with Henry the Seventh, already forgetful of the regent's support during his exile, the Treaty of Etaples, restored Roussillon and Cerdagne to Spain, and handed back to Maximilian the county of Burgundy and Artois, which had been the proposed dowry of Margaret of Austria. Charles then made ready for that fateful journey across the Alps, which may be called the first chapter in modern history. Section 6 of Europe in Renaissance and Reformation by Mary A. Hollings. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 3. Spain under Ferdinand and Isabella and Charles I. The history of the peninsula was, before 1479, the history of at least five kingdoms, namely Castile, Aragon, Portugal, Navarre, and Granada. All with the exception of French Navarre, the western half of the little kingdom that bestrid the Pyrenees, came in one period under the rule of one man. In 1479, Ferdinand, who was already married to Isabella, Queen of Castile, succeeded his father John II upon the throne of Aragon, and the two countries were united ever after. Though the connection between them was personal, each kingdom keeping its own institutions and customs, their resources were often combined for common aims, and in this way the union had a great effect on the history of both. The kingdom of Spain also became heir to their foreign relations. It is true that circumstances caught her into the vast net of the Habsburg interests, and their multiplicity proved the ruin of Spain. Her resources were drained for Dutch wars, French wars, Italian wars, till exhaustion set in. But her own double character, shaped by the different aims and ambitions of Aragon and Castile, would have drawn her, apart from this circumstance, into European complications. Aragon's rivalry with France for the possession of Navarre and of Naples, and her dream of becoming a Mediterranean sea power, which explains her painful interest from the remote west in the Turkish advance. Castile's passionate orthodoxy, which marked her out as champion of the church abroad, her covetousness of the maritime power of Portugal, leading to endless schemes for its possession, these and other aims would have driven Spain to play a leading part in Europe as soon as she had overcome the chief difficulties at home. There was some resemblance between the condition of Castile and Aragon. Both had lately suffered at the hands of careless or feeble rulers, and in both the succession was disputed. Isabella's firm diplomacy made good her claim to succeed her brother. Ferdinand's elder brother was removed by poison, and eventually he inherited all his father's dominions except Roussillon and Cerdagne, and these, 
though temporarily pawned to win the goodwill of Louis XI, were recovered from Charles VIII. Naples, which had formed part of the Aragonese dominions for a short time under Alphonse the Magnanimous, was bequeathed on his death in 1458 to his illegitimate son Ferrante, while Sicily and Sardinia passed from Aragon to the legal heir, Ferdinand's father. There were therefore two reigning branches of the House of Aragon, the lawful line in Aragon and its dependencies, and the illegitimate line in Naples. Both in Aragon and Castile the power of the crown had sunk very low, and the period that follows the accession of Ferdinand and Isabella is one of reform and revival. Theoretically, the powers of the crown in Castile were great. The Cortes, or Parliament, consisted of three houses, clergy, nobles, and commons. The first and second estates were free from taxation and had so little interest in attending that they dropped out altogether after 1538. The commons only represented certain towns and had no real share in lawmaking. The time, place of meeting, and agenda of the Cortes alike were fixed by the crown, and supplies were always granted before grievances were dealt with. Besides, the royal decrees were valid without the Cortes's assent. But in Aragon, where in addition to the three usual estates there was a house of knights, the Cortes was much more powerful. By law it must meet every two years, and the maxim that redress must precede supply was observed there as it had been in Lancastrian England. Even when the Cortes was not sitting, its powers were entrusted to a standing committee, which carried on the government. As peacemaker between king and his subjects, there was a notable official called the Justiciar, who came to be the guardian also of constitutional liberties. The first object of the new sovereigns was to recover from the nobles the powers they had usurped from the crown in both kingdoms. Everywhere in Europe at this time, kings were strengthening themselves at the expense of the feudal baronage, so that the policy of the Spanish rulers was part of a general tendency. They sometimes apparently forgot to summon the nobles to the Cortes, a privilege the latter rated low. They raised up a class of official nobles from the commons, many of whom were lawyers and inclined, as their way is, through familiarity with the maxims of Roman law, to uphold the royal authority. The new ministers of the crown were chosen not for their pedigrees, but for personal merit. Of these, the most famous was Cardinal Ximenes, who, having been promoted from the position of an obscure monk to be Archbishop of Toledo and Regent of Spain, energetically seconded his sovereign's efforts to crush the arrogant grandees. The grand masterships of the three great Spanish military orders of Santiago, Alcantara, and Calatrava had always attracted ambitious spirits, on account of the immense patronage and large armed forces at their disposal. But now, as they became vacant, Isabella appointed Ferdinand to each office, and from thenceforth they were annexed to the crown, which thus enjoyed their revenues and no longer had to fear their military strength. During the reign of Henry the Impotent of Castile, the queen's brother, the nobles had encroached upon the crown lands, and had even received some sort of title to their possessions. These territories were recovered by Isabella and Ferdinand, who also obliged the grandees to pull down their fortified castles, abolish their private mints, abandon their private feuds, forgo the style of royalty and yield themselves up as loyal and orderly subjects of the crown. The Hermandad, or Confederacy of the Towns, was revived for checking robbery and other crimes of violence in the open country, and it proved a very effective police system. The great hereditary offices of state were shorn of their chief powers and became merely honorary titles in carefully chosen loyal houses. The royal forces at the beginning of the reign had been insignificant, but the troops used to conquer Granada were retained, in part, as a standing force in 1492, and there was added to them a volunteer army trained by the great captain 
Gonsalvo di Cordova himself. Careful economy in the royal household made frequent assembling of the Cortes unnecessary, and the sovereigns made a good deal of use of royal ordinances in place of its legislation without perhaps abusing this privilege. Though they fully deserved their titles, their Catholic majesties did not hesitate to resist all attempts on the part of the clergy to encroach upon their civil authority in the church, and by threatening the Pope, Sixtus the Fourth, with a general council, they gained from him a concordat, conferring upon the crown the right of appointment to the highest offices in the church. Sometimes, too, they overruled the Pope's choice in smaller livings. The general work of government was carried on by different departments of the royal council, whose chiefs took their orders from the crown. Among these, the most important were the Council of the Indies, a kind of colonial office, the Council of Aragon, which under Ferdinand ruled that kingdom and its dependencies, Naples and Sicily, and last but not least, the Council of the Inquisition. This court was at first revived to detect and punish relapsed Jews. It was a temptation to the crown to extend its scope, because of the profits arising from its confiscations. In 1492 the Jews of Castile were given four months in which to seek baptism or leave the country. More than 200,000 left Spain. Those who remained, however orthodox, were treated as outcasts from society. It was hardly to be expected that Ferdinand and Isabella, in their strong desire for national union and their fervid crusading zeal, should refrain from conquering, if they could, all that remained of the Moorish dominion in Spain, the kingdom of Granada. For ten years, between 1482 and 1492, in spite of many reverses, they struggled on with a determination that finally overcame the enemy's lack of concentrated resistance. The conquest of Granada was the reward of systematic organization. On either side the line of march the country was invariably devastated. Forests were cut down, roads made and towns built, most famous of which was Santa Fe, that literally sat down opposite to Granada. The inhabitants of captured towns such as Malaga were enslaved, and a new Christian population settled in their stead. Isabella herself was the life and soul of the undertaking. She rode on her war-horse, clad in mail at the head of her troops. She pawned her crown and personal jewels to raise funds. She fitted up hospitals at her own expense. Her energy and enthusiasm never flagged. At last, on receiving pledges of civil and religious liberty and of the safety of the lives and property of her defenders, Granada surrendered. But on the Spanish side, the promise was shamefully broken. Seven years later, the intolerant party at court got the upper hand and enlisted the Queen's narrow religious sympathies on their side. As in the case of the Jews, the alternative offered was baptism or exile. Many chose exile, and the irreparable loss of this diligent and thrifty population is silently testified to this day by the uncultivated tracts in southern Spain. The sovereigns themselves were their own foreign ministers, and in a later chapter some account will be given of the part played by Spain in the great Italian wars after 1494. The alliances formed at this time were also of great importance. By the marriage of their only son Juan, with Maximilian's daughter Margaret, and of their eldest daughter Juana, or Joan, with his son Philip, the kings, as they commonly were called, not only formed a strong league against France, but in the case of the second marriage, prepared the way for the great inheritance of their grandson, Charles V. Henry the Seventh of England was also anxious to be admitted into this august circle, and it was arranged that Arthur, Prince of Wales, whose place was afterwards taken by his brother Henry, should marry the youngest infanta, Catherine of Aragon. The prestige of the crown was further increased by the discovery of the New World on Friday, October 12th, 1492, by the Genoese navigator Christopher Columbus. From the first... 
Isabella had taken the deepest interest in his enterprise, and had shown it in a practical way. The queen and her husband rose to receive Columbus when he came to Barcelona on his return to recount his wonderful adventure and to display the Indians, the parrots, gold, cotton, and countless curiosities he had brought with him. The newly discovered territories were regarded as the property of the crown rather than of the nation. By certain papal bulls, the countries east and west of an imaginary line were granted to Portugal and Spain respectively, while supreme control of religion in these western possessions was conferred upon the Spanish kings by Pope Alexander the Sixth. Footnote. It was in this way that Portugal gained possession of Brazil. The death of Isabella in 1504 may be said to close the period of reform in the joint reign. It was important in lessening Ferdinand's power, and it was followed by a time of disorder, which lasted till 1522. In appearance, Isabella was of a dignified presence with regular features, chestnut hair, and blue eyes. She lived simply and dressed plainly, except at public ceremonials when she knew how to be sumptuous. She had a strong will, a great sense of duty, tenacity, courage, and honesty. Her judgment, except in religious affairs in which she lent too much upon her confessor, was sound and independent. If bigoted and unmerciful, she was pious, and unlike some persons of her rather precise type, she was not small-minded. She had a better brain and a far better heart than her husband, whose illiterate mind and suspicious, false, and grasping nature combined to form a very unattractive character. As Isabella's beloved only son had died before her, her eldest daughter Joan and her husband Philip the Fair of Austria were declared sovereigns of Castile. But to the disgust of the Castilians, who were always jealous of Aragon and of Philip, who tried to assert his authority, Ferdinand secured the regency. The real sovereign Joan was the victim of some form of hysteria, which plunged her into periods of gloom, when, since she would neither speak nor act, she was quite unfit to govern. It was finally settled that the government should be jointly carried on in the names of Joan, Philip, and Ferdinand. On Philip's death in 1506, Ximenes supported Ferdinand as candidate for the regency, for Joan's melancholy deepened and became permanent, and in this capacity he ruled Castile for his unfortunate daughter until his death. In the year after Isabella died, Ferdinand decided to marry again, and chose as his second wife Germaine de Foix, a niece of Louis the Twelfth, whose friendship he desired. The elder line of the same family reigned in Navarre, but when Germaine's brother Gaston fell at Ravenna, Ferdinand urged her claims to the kingdom as his heiress. A party in Navarre supported him, and the brave Queen Catherine de Foix, deserted by her cowardly husband, John d'Albret was forced to fly. Ferdinand seized all Spanish Navarre. But the d'Albret family continued to rule on the French side of the Pyrenees until their descendant, Henry of Navarre, brought the kingdom to France. From the outbreak of the Italian War, which will be fully described later, the interest of Ferdinand's last years centered in Italy. After the great French victory of Marignano, he decided not to divide his dominions between his elder grandson Charles and his favorite grandson Ferdinand, the two sons of Joan, but to make Charles his sole heir, so as to fit him for rivalry with so great a power as France had become. Charles I succeeded his grandfather at the age of sixteen in 1516, and by the advice of his ministers decided to walk warily at first in the slippery paths of diplomacy. He therefore concluded the Treaty of Noyon, promising to marry Francis's infant daughter Louise, whose mother Claude had been his last proposed bride. By birth, Charles was the heir of four great houses. Through his mother Joan, he succeeded to the Spanish dominions, Castile, Aragon, Naples and Sicily, and the possessions in the New World. From his father Philip the Fair, 
he received the great burgundian inheritance of his grandmother mary of burgundy and the netherlands from his austrian grandfather maximilian the duchy of austria at the time of his accession he was a slow awkward boy tongue-tied in the one language french with which he was really familiar and completely under the tuition of his flemish minister chievre the regent of castile isabella's trusted servant ximenes urged charles to lose no time in visiting spain where the greatest jealousy was felt of flemish influence charles consented but the cold ingratitude of his letter dismissing ximenes from a long and devoted service is believed to have caused the death of the great old cardinal the new king made an informal progress through his dominions but as he journeyed through castile aragon and catalonia he created in each place a worse impression than in the last and before his visit was accomplished to turbulent valencia he was relieved to be summoned to germany by the news of maximilian's death in their dealings with charles the cortes showed themselves on the defensive slow to recognize his title to rule suspicious of his confidential advisers and indignant at his approaching departure from spain charles's mind was full of the coming imperial election he showed great carelessness of the feelings of his spanish subjects and want of tact in appointing his flemings to high office as in the choice of his tutor adrian of utrecht to be regent of castile in his absence besides while accepting such money grants as the cortes would allow him he turned a deaf ear to their grievances in fifteen twenty one the unrest which had been stirring in many castilian towns since isabella's death now became active and on the king's embarkation they formed an association or junta in defence of their privileges and drew up a grand remonstrance condemning the royal acts then they drew joan from her seclusion and proclaimed her queen the regent's warning dispatches were treated by charles in germany with the utmost unconcern in castile aragon and valencia the townspeople flew to arms the chief centres of trouble were toledo and valladolid there was unfortunately no thought of united action but the causes varied with the district being social political or religious or all three at once their social programme alarmed the nobles who declared against them a decisive battle was fought between the two parties at villalar after which the leader of the rebels a noble from toledo named juan de padilla was executed with two of his comrades the castilian rebellion then subsided and not without cruelty order was gradually restored in valencia and aragon the rising had signally failed and the royal authority emerged so strong that charles was able to override the liberties of the cortes in such important matters as freedom of speech and of elections and redress preceding supply section seven of europe in renaissance and reformation by mary a hollings this librivox recording is in the public domain read by pamela nagami chapter four the italian states in the fifteenth century part one in the last half of the fifteenth century italy was not yet a nation merely a bundle of states living a keen political life and finding the great game of politics the most exciting of occupations each state played for its own hand and for high stakes with entire unscrupulousness thus absorbed they none of them saw that they were observed by others from without who with new methods and greater resources were coming unbidden to the board a united resistance to the foreigner was out of the question for it was only by ceaseless intrigue that any state managed to hold its own among the rest yet there was method in this intrigue dictated by certain inevitable alliances and equally inevitable quarrels by following these out briefly we may unravel the tangled threads of italian politics a little way the five states of which special account must be taken were milan florence venice naples and the papacy a principality two republics a kingdom and the states of the church 
During this half-century they were usually grouped into one of two leagues, the Triple Alliance or the Northern League. The Triple Alliance, consisting of Milan, Florence, and Naples, may be called the normal or usual balance of power in Italy. And the main exceptions to this rule, when the Northern League, Milan, Florence, and Venice, against the Papacy in Naples, prevailed, were during the Pazzi conspiracy and after 1485, when Naples became hostile to Milan, on account of Ludovico Sforza's usurpation. These alliances were the outcome of certain permanent interests. For instance, it was difficult for Naples and Venice to keep on good terms, for they were rival maritime powers, to whom the possession of the Apulian port seemed equally necessary, and Venice regarded Naples as the chief foe to her advance in Italy and Greece. Again, except during a period of sixteen years, when Venice was at war with the Turks, that republic was Milan's most serious rival for the supremacy of North Italy. On the other hand, Milan had a strong common bond with Naples against the claims of the French houses of Orléans and Anjou. As both Naples and Florence were likely to interfere with the Pope's ambitious family schemes in Romagna, the papacy was usually hostile to them both, though the Medici did their best to maintain peaceable relations. But the popes were drawn toward Venice by sharing with her the burden of resistance to the Turk and by a common dislike of Naples. These general rules point to the triple alliance of Milan, Florence, and Naples being the natural outcome of circumstances and we must look more closely at those of each state in turn. The kingdom of Naples, of which the popes claimed the right of investiture, was deeply divided within itself. The rude mountaineers differed in race from the civilized coast-dwellers. In the struggle between Aragon and Anjou, the Abruzzi had always supported Aragon. Calabria, Anjou this rivalry had rent in twain the land from the thirteenth century until the final accession of Alfonso the Magnanimous of Aragon in 1442. He proved a strong and popular leader, but the condition of Naples at his death in 1458 was showy rather than sound. There was a parliament, but it was scarcely representative, and had only been called once to confirm Ferrante's succession. The army was unreliable compared with the bands of retainers commanded by the great barons, for the social state of the kingdom was still thoroughly feudal, and Naples had been too long the happy hunting ground of the condottieri to rely upon native military talent. The court expenditure was lavish, and justice was already sold to raise funds. As Alfonso had no lawful heir, he was obliged to leave Aragon and Sicily to his brother. All he could bequeath to Ferrante, his illegitimate son, was Naples, his own conquest. This was the moment for the House of Anjou to reassert its claim to Naples, and John of Calabria, whom we recognize as a member of the League of the Public Wheel, appeared as claimant. Like the rest of his house, he was inefficient, unlucky, and attractive. Ferrante tried to strengthen himself by alliances with Milan and the Pope, but his own harsh and cruel nature soon provoked a war with his barons which should have given John his opportunity. At first the latter had some success, but after 1461 the tide turned. The new French king, Louis XI, disliked his Angevin relations, and as a token of his regard for Sforza, was ready to present Milan with Genoa, which had been John's military base in Italy. Finally the fickle barons returned to their allegiance, and in 1464 John withdrew from the contest. His claim, as we have seen, eventually passed through his cousin the Count of Men to the French crown, and the proposal that it should be adopted by Charles the Eighth came directly from the discontented Neapolitan barons, who had rebelled again in 1485, 
in favor of rene of lorraine ferrante broke his promise of pardon to the rebels and put to death all but those who were beyond his reach this time in fourteen ninety three they appealed to the french king and at the crisis in fourteen ninety four ferrante died leaving alfonso his heir and associate in his rule to face the situation they had created between them the neapolitan exiles had been encouraged by venice to apply to france and we have now to trace the republic's reasons for giving this advice the fifteenth century was outwardly the most splendid period in the splendid career of what comines describes as the most triumphant city i have ever seen but the burden of dominion was pressing heavily upon her the wealth of venice was gained not from manufactures but from her carrying trade chiefly of timber and woollen goods in return for spices and other goods of the east and by this connection her possessions in the levant had been built up the opposite coasts of the adriatic the ionian islands crete and some of the aegean islands certain ports of the morea all belonged to venice with treaty rights of trade with constantinople and a number of towns in palestine and egypt it would perhaps have been the republic's best policy to become an eastern that is a greek and illyrian power but unluckily her treatment of her levantine subjects in its corruption and injustice bore a strong contrast to her government of the mainland up to the middle of the fourteenth century venice had no mainland possessions and it was not until a century later that her advance became rapid partly because she despised her maritime subjects partly because the claims of her inland trade and the jealousy of powerful neighbors drove her into increasing her territory but most of all because of the appearance of an overwhelming foe the turk in the eastern waters venice joined the general scramble for territory in italy no state there had more loyal subjects but in greed and unscrupulousness in gaining them venice soon outdistanced even italian competitors and it was said of her at the time that she was the fame the defence and the ornament of italy without but her plague and torment within from another standpoint the change of policy was ruinous her wealth depended upon her maritime trade the mainland provinces never paid their way and were costly to gain and when her eastern possessions fell by degrees into turkish hands her revenues declined as long as venice retained her colonial empire and her vast commercial interests she needed a class like her merchant princes to attend to her foreign policy for this reason the venetians became the most observant acute and practised of european diplomatists again the administration of affairs tended to fall to a few the doge had already become a figurehead and the real rulers of venice in the fifteenth century were a clique of the newer nobility who numbered in the sixteenth century about forty they controlled the famous council of ten which really consisted of seventeen members from the senate and great council including the doge the ten or their chiefs the three managed all the most important business of the state and in their methods somewhat resembled the ephors of sparta they were therefore despotic and governed by secrecy and terrorism at the same time they made no parade of power there were few or no revolutions and the order and prosperity of the state secured the support of its citizens the year fourteen fifty four is a convenient starting point for a sketch of the history of venice during the next fifty years for it is marked by peace with milan after a lengthy war and peace with the turks by the peace of lodi piacenza and lodi were confirmed to venice and she came to terms with the new lord of milan francesco sforza the capture of constantinople the year before had been an even more serious shock to venice than to the rest of europe for venice desired not war with the turks but trade and she saw that this new conquest meant war however venice came to an agreement which staved off for a few years the evil day 
in return for tribute the turks allowed the republic to keep her possessions and trade in the levant meanwhile the turkish advance under mohammed the second continued the great conqueror overran servia hungary was only snatched from his grasp by the splendid exertions of its hero john hunyadi and the infectious fervour of friar capistrano hunyadi raised the siege first of the key fortress of semendria in 1456 and afterwards of belgrade breaking through a barrier of boats across the river he entered the city whose walls were shattered by a fortnight's assault and drove the turks who greatly outnumbered his raw and ragged forces in headlong flight leaving fifty thousand dead behind them but a few days later christendom lost its champion from the plague capistrano died of fever and the main burden of defence fell to the lot of george castriot despot of albania his turkish title skanderbeg the lord alexander recalls the fact that though brought up in the sultan's court he is one of the few who ever return to their faith and fatherland for ten years he led his people to heroic defence of their country of which he was acknowledged ruler by the sultan then he joined the pope hungary and venice and after driving the turks from croja his capital cleared the country of the enemy this athlete of christendom died in fourteen sixty seven commending his son to the protection of the venetians to whom he had been as shield and buckler elsewhere mohammed's successes continued the quarrels of the greek rulers let the turks into the morea which was devastated beyond repair and in fourteen sixty four bosnia was subdued in fourteen seventy three venice at last declared war which was mainly maritime at first the chief event was the fall of negroponte which might have been saved had the venetian commander niccolo canale been a hunyadi for the rest however venice fought valiantly and almost single-handed against a foe which having added a new fleet to its equipment in fourteen seventy one had become more formidable than ever mohammed's conquest of asia minor had now left him free from europe and he renewed his attack on albania and this time took croja and scutari by fourteen seventy nine venice could do no more and concluded the peace of constantinople retaining in return for tribute to the sultan crete seven ports in greece and her trading quarter in constantinople having been an idle spectator of the war europe was filled with consternation at the peace it set free the turks and also this mainly concerned the italians the venetians for further aggressions by the advice as all italy believed of venice the turks besieged and took otranto in apulia in 1480 it seemed as if rome might share constantinople's fate at this crisis however mohammed's attention was diverted to rhodes and he died next year in 1481 by 1483 the turkish conquest of herzegovina was completed montenegro alone of all the slavonic states in the balkans held out its hardy mountaineers under their ruler ivan the black son of a comrade of skanderbeg deserted their capital and mounted to their new airy of Cetinje. they rose to where their sovereign eagle sails they kept their faith their freedom on the height chaste frugal savage armed by day and night against the turk the death of mohammed the great was a welcome reprieve to europe with the exception of a short war in which the turks raided venetian territory as far as vicenza and seized most of her greek ports nothing serious happened until the conquest of egypt in fifteen seventeen by selim i the last of the trade routes from the east was thereby blocked that is along the persian gulf to aden up the red sea and by a short caravan journey to alexandria whence the goods were distributed to venetian and genoese galleys and sent across the brenner to bruges since the discovery of the cape route to india the portuguese had rapidly pushed on their commerce with the east they were able by fifteen o nine 
to offer spice pepper and sugar at such cheap rates that a general fall in the prices of eastern produce ruined many of the older established merchants in the netherlands on the rhine and in genoa and venice the venetians joined in expeditions sent from cairo to fight the portuguese but even had they been successful their eastern trade was doomed and the conquest of egypt set the seal upon their doom and we shall see that the year fifteen o nine was to be fatal to venice on land as well as on sea that her ancient spirit was not yet dead she was still to show in her dying resistance to the turk in cyprus in fifteen seventy and candia in sixteen sixty nine and her love of pomp and luxuriant colour immortalized itself in the greatest school of italian colourists those artists of the sixteenth century titian tintoretto giorgione veronese who have expressed on canvas the pride and glory of venice meanwhile italy had been right in dreading the use venice might make of the leisure bestowed on her by the treaty of constantinople certainly her policy from fourteen seventy nine became more aggressive as the three following instances may show in fourteen eighty one she quarrelled with ferrara who was a rival for her salt monopoly and war broke out in which pope sixtus the fourth helped venice to seize rovigo the triple alliance then interfered the pope seeing that venice would gain all the spoil went over to the league the republic whose supplies were exhausted concluded the peace of bagnolo which allowed her to keep rovigo only of all her conquests the pope died immediately afterwards it was said of vexation at the peace secondly it was by high-handed conduct that venice gained possession of cyprus in fourteen eighty eight the last king of that island james of lusignan whose extraordinary personal fascination had secured for him his disputed throne had married a venetian lady catarina cornaro and to make her worthy a crown the republic formally adopted her as daughter of saint mark when shortly afterwards james died venice became the guardian of her daughter and her daughter's child next the republic undertook the government of the island and finally fearing the intentions of alfonso of naples who proposed to marry the queen persuaded catarina now childless to abdicate in its favour catarina was loath to leave her little kingdom but it was made clear to her that there was no alternative a tiny state was found for her in the hill town and plain of Azolo, and there she reigned with the titles of queen of cyprus and lady of Azolo, till the troubles following the league of cambrai caused her to take refuge in venice where she died in fifteen ten lastly venice turning envious eyes on the six apulian ports gallipoli otranto brindisi trani monopoli and bari decided that her best chance of gaining them was to invite foreign interference and by upsetting the balance of power in italy to secure her prey as the price of her help so she encouraged the fugitive neapolitan nobles who came in fourteen ninety three to ask her advice to call in charles the eighth and the duke of orleans to make good their claims upon naples and milan it was a fatal mistake for Galeazzo Sforza's words to Venice were still true. You are alone, and all the world is against you, not merely in Italy, but also beyond the Alps. End Section 8 of Europe and Renaissance and Reformation by Mary A. Hollings. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 4 The Italian States in the 15th Century. Part two. Turning now to the papacy, we will first sketch the history of the seven popes belonging to this half century, and then point out some of the chief changes that were taking place in their position and aims. The first of these was Nicholas V, fourteen forty seven to fourteen fifty five. The librarian, as he was surnamed, from his intense interest in the new learning, 
and his collection of ancient manuscripts which became the foundation of the famous vatican library it was said that he was chosen pope for his perfect latinity his greatest desires were for the furtherance of peace and the promotion of learning and art in rome by the irony of fate it was to him that europe turned when constantinople fell in fourteen fifty three but it was not in nicholas to inspire a crusade the pope it was said is spending in buildings what ought to save us from the turks among them were the vatican and the basilica of st peter's from several points of view nicholas v may be regarded as the last pope of the middle ages he was the last to crown an emperor frederick the third at rome the last to contest the throne of st peter with an antipope the series of great general church councils ended at basel during his pontificate with the fall of constantinople was closed the long rivalry between eastern and western churches and after nicholas each pope frankly merged himself in the italian prince whose first object was territory his successor was the spaniard calixtus the third fourteen fifty five to fourteen fifty eight who unlike nicholas was eager for a turkish crusade which he left as a legacy for pius the second he is better remembered however as the first pope who systematically tried to advance the fortunes of his own family calixtus had three nephews of his own name borgia for whom high preferments were found in the church one of them later becoming pope alexander the sixth it is possible that their interests may have prompted him to refuse the investiture of naples to ferrante but his death put an end to their projects pius the second fourteen fifty eight to fourteen sixty four was already well known as aeneas silvius frederick the third's famous secretary and had been the chief means of recovering the obedience of the german church to rome in the course of a gay and varied career he had travelled as far north as england and scotland on becoming pope he was anxious to forget the past and devote himself to the needs of christendom he therefore acknowledged ferrante of naples and summoned the western princes to a conference on the eastern question at mantua only the pope and his attendants arrived at the appointed date a few envoys straggled in later and the venetians drove a hard bargain with the congress demanding pay for providing means of transport and all the spoil there might be before the assembly dispersed pius published the bull execrabilis denouncing as an execrable abuse any appeal against the pope to a future council at this point the outbreak of the war in naples between ferrante and john of calabria distracted attention from the crusade with immense exertions the pope secured the help of hungary and venice but a paltry handful of crusaders was all that met him at ancona and exhausted by his efforts the pope sank and died there the ideals of pius the second were no doubt beyond his achievements yet his aims were higher than those of succeeding popes his life was abstemious and he loved the simple pleasures of the country he was a distinguished man of letters but to the last he kept his freshness of outlook and readiness to receive new ideas passing over the somewhat uneventful reign of paul the second fourteen sixty four to fourteen seventy one we come to sixtus the fourth fourteen seventy one to fourteen eighty four the first pope says machiavelli to show the extent of the papal power it was employed by sixtus in the interests of his family with a thorough unscrupulousness that is only surpassed by alexander the sixth sixtus had five nephews belonging to the della rovere and riario families he arranged for them marriages into princely houses or promoted them to high places in the church two became cardinals and one giuliano della rovere was afterwards pope julius the second it was in the interests of girolamo riario 
that Sixtus set on foot the Pazzi conspiracy to overthrow Lorenzo de' Medici and joined Naples against him. Fortunately, the capture of Otranto by the Turks brought the Pope to reason. Yet almost directly after, he is found with Venice and Naples attacking Ferrara for the benefit of the last Riario nephew. Having gained nothing by the war, Sixtus died of the peace at Bagnolo. Innocent the Eighth, fourteen eighty four to fourteen ninety two, was a far less vigorous pope. Almost his only political exploit was an attempt to force from Naples the ancient tribute to the papacy, which had been gradually reduced to the formal annual gift of a white charger. He therefore joined the discontented Neapolitan barons in 1485, who invited young René of Lorraine to adopt the Angevin claims to the throne. But René was vainly occupied in trying to recover Provence from the French crown, and the Italian states were up in arms at the idea of foreign invasion. Ferranti gave in about the former tribute, and the barons submitted to him, as we have seen, only to be treacherously dealt with. Innocent the Eighth died before any further development of the survivors' policy in inviting Charles the Eighth had taken place. This pope was the first publicly to recognize his children, and by the marriage of his son with Lorenzo de' Medici's daughter, began a connection between that family and the Holy See, which ended in giving two Medici popes, Leo X and Clement VII, to Italy. The election on Innocent's death was warmly contested by Giuliano della Rovere and Ludovico Sforza's brother, Ascanio. But by giving much and promising still more, a third candidate won his way. This was Rodrigo Borgia, a nephew of Calixtus III, who, in spite of his notorious character as cardinal, was elected as Alexander VI, 1492 to 1503. Modern criticism has tried to prove that the Borgias, father and son, were less black than they are painted. Yet a few crimes less or more cannot really alter our opinion when so much remains to be answered for. Tried even by the low moral standard of their age, they were worse than their age, cruel, cunning, and resolute, audacious in crime beyond their contemporaries and the part played by Alexander the Sixth and Cesare Borgia during the Italian wars will speak for itself. Meanwhile, it may be noticed that the new pope soon threw in his lot with the Aragonese house of Naples by recognizing Alfonso as king on Ferranti's death in 1494. This, of course, pledged him to oppose the coming French invasion by Charles the Eighth. At this point it may be well to sum up the position of the Pope since the Councillor movement to control them had failed with the Council of Basel. If we compare the papacy to a temporal monarchy, we shall find that the cardinals are the nobles or aristocracy of the Church, while the democratic element is supplied by the assembling from time to time of general councils. The Holy See had come out of the threatened ordeal of reform, with all its privileges intact. In the first place, it had evaded control on the part of the cardinals in spite of a number of compacts limiting the Pope's power over them. At the close of the half century, Alexander VI was still able to treat the cardinals as his tools, appointing whom he would, or selling the office at a high price to raise money for Cesare Borgia's wars. Secondly, the Pope had triumphed over reform in the shape of control by councils. Political and national jealousies had ruined the Council of Basel, and the failure of the movement was summed up in the bull Execropolis of Pius II. Threats of appealing to general councils were indeed freely used against Sixtus IV, Alexander VI, and Julius II, but with little or no effect. Even the movement in favor of the liberty of national churches, which had seemed so vigorous in the early part of the century, had been minimized by agreements between their rulers and the Pope. Louis XI and Francis I 
gave up the liberties of the French Church as Frederick III had given up those of the German. Nevertheless, in becoming political, the papacy had lost the moral leadership of Christendom, which had been its unique and special task, and had become an Italian power, as yet not of the first rank. The failure of several popes to arouse Europe against the Turks was a judgment on the papacy for the many false alarms it had raised in the past in order to replenish its treasury. No one believed any longer in the purity of the pope's motives. Political intrigues were suspected behind every cause, however worthy in itself, and Europe was further enlightened as to the real character of the papacy by the Italian invasions and Alexander the Sixth Jubilee in 1500. The popes, becoming wise in their generation, as children of this world, found that Italy would only respect their sway if they were too strong to be attacked. The problem was twofold. How to control the turbulent Roman populace, whose republican spirit slept but was not dead, and awoke at intervals under leaders such as Rienzi and Porcaro, how, secondly, to subdue the lawless Roman nobles of the Campania, the Colonna, Orsini, and Savelli. Nicholas V attacked the first difficulty by gaining military control of Rome, by widening the streets and connecting the fortress of Sant'Angelo with the city, though Sixtus IV and Innocent VIII took the nobles in hand. The real suppression of the Colonna and Orsini was only accomplished by Alexander VI and Cesare Borgia. Towards a general solution of the problem, Sixtus IV and Alexander VI set themselves to gain territory, which in the hands of their relations should be the principal support of the Pope's power. In this way, the Holy See might possibly have become hereditary, but it is clear that their plan differed altogether from that of Julius II, who is rightly regarded as the founder of the Papal States, because he built up a dominion which he passed on not to his family, but to his successor. The Duchy of Milan had in 1450 come into the possession of the House of Sforza. With masterly skill, Francesco, the husband of Bianca, the last of the Visconti, had played off his two chief enemies against each other, namely the Republican Party in Milan and the Venetians. First, he defended Milan against Venice, then made peace with Venice, finally turning his victorious army upon Milan and became its master. Milan was the richest prize ever won by a successful condottiere. However, Francesco was not only the greatest of the condottieri, but an able statesman, whose chief object thereafter was peace. Between him and Cosmo de' Medici a real friendship existed. He came to terms with Venice in the Peace of Lodi in 1454, by which the Adda was to be the boundary between the two states, and having a common interest with Naples in resisting French claims in Italy, he united his son and daughter in marriage with Alfonso's granddaughter and grandson. As has been already pointed out, Sforza was on the best terms with Louis XI, who yielded to him the French rights to Genoa. Galeazzo Maria Sforza, who succeeded his father in 1466, drew closer this connection by marrying Bona of Savoy, sister of the French queen. In him were united the worst vices of the Visconti and Sforza. Weak, cowardly, and a slave to the worst passions, he is one of the comparatively few who have delighted in cruelty for its own sake. After suffering ten years of this unbridled tyranny, three nobles whose families he had wronged slew him in a church in 1476. Two of them were killed by the guard, and their leader, Oljati, maintaining to the last the justice of his cause, died with Spartan endurance under torture. The Milanese, taken by surprise, had not been prompt enough to save themselves, and the tyrant's son, Gian Galeazzo, aged eight, succeeded under the regency of his mother and Simonetta, formerly Francesco's secretary. 
In 1479, the peace of Italy was upset by the Pazzi conspiracy in Florence, and while Naples and the Pope armed against the Republic, Milan prepared to stand by her ally. To cause a distraction in Milan, Ferrante encouraged the return of the young Duke's uncles, who had been exiled for hostility to the Regency. A revolution followed in Milan. Simonetta was executed, and the nominal reign began of John Galeazzo, aged twelve, his eldest uncle, Ludovico, being the real ruler. Ludovico Sforza, called the Moor, from his swarthy complexion, was after his father Francesco, the ablest of his house. Yet he had no pretensions to soldierly qualities, was in fact wanting in courage in emergencies. Like the average Italian tyrant, he was cruel when political necessity demanded, cunning, grasping, and self-confident. Nevertheless, when once he had vaulted into the saddle, he was disposed to rule well, to maintain a splendid court, and dispense generous patronage to literature and art. But, like Richard III, he was encumbered with a nephew, and to make matters worse, that nephew took to wife Ferranti's granddaughter, Isabella of Naples. The young duke was a feeble creature, but Isabella was a princess of spirit, and complained to her own family of Ludovico's usurpation. She contrasted her own neglected position with that of Ludovico's new wife, Beatrice d'Este, the idol of a brilliant court, and the prospects of her infant son with those of Ludovico's heir. Remonstrances from Naples had no result, except that they warned Ludovico that he must strengthen his position against an open rupture. Florence could no longer be depended upon, for, as we shall see, Piero de' Medici was himself inclined toward Naples, and Ludovico was not blind to the greed of Venice. He therefore seconded the invitation given by the Neapolitan barons to Charles the Eighth, hoping to use the French as a screen between himself and Naples while he made good his own position in Milan. Afterwards, he trusted to his own dexterity to relieve Italy of their presence. With the consent of France, Ludovico gave his niece Bianca Maria in marriage to Maximilian I. In return for a more than princely dowry, the emperor conferred upon Ludovico the investiture of Milan. John Galeazzo died soon after, precisely as might have been foreseen, though his uncle's share in the business has not been absolutely proved. Ludovico was not left long undisturbed in his new dignity. With the French came Louis of Orléans, bent upon making good upon Milan. His claim through his grandmother, Valentina Visconti, and though this first attempt was foiled, we shall see that Ludovico was unable to withstand Louis the Twelfth at the head of a league for the partition of Milan in 1499. The history of Florence during this half-century is covered by the rule of the Medici family, for Cosmo was firmly settled by 1434 and ruled until 1464, and Piero was expelled exactly sixty years later. The means by which they won and kept their power may first be pointed out. The Medici owed their greatness to trade, and principally to their great European banking connection. By raising loans for foreign governments and lending large sums to Florentine citizens, they gained political influence at home and abroad. Both Cosmo and Lorenzo maintained their position in Italy, largely through their unrivaled knowledge of foreign politics. In their hands, politics and commerce worked together to advance the interests of both. Cosmo, it was said, made many a fortune besides his own. As employers of labor, collectors of books and gems, and patrons of literary men and artists, the Medici turned to their own pleasures and advantage, the Renaissance movement, at a time when it was one of the chief forces in Italian life. Their private revenues were at the service of the state, and they spent enormous sums on charity and public works, a system by which Florence was at first the gainer, but which later, when less attention to business diminished their incomes, led to these being largely supplemented from public money. At first the Medici were careful to live and marry like other people of their wealth and position. 
Cosmo's works were regal, says Machiavelli, his conduct civic. He rejected Brunelleschi's design for his palace as being too pretentious, and never allowed the luxury of his family to appear as royal state. Lorenzo was the first of his house to seek a bride outside Florence. At the same time, they thoroughly understood the value of public fetes and shows as a way of keeping their popularity with the pleasure-loving Florentines. Dazzled by these brilliant features of the Medici rule, the populace was blinded to the changes quietly and steadily at work in the government. A progressive income tax was introduced, and taxation was managed in such a way as to enrich friends and ruin enemies. Cosmo used the taxes instead of the dagger notes Giuciardini. The forms of government were preserved, but elections were in Medicean hands. The chief magistrates of Florence were the signori, consisting of the gonfaloniere of justice and eight priors, holding office for two months. Bills approved by them went through three councils representing the trade guilds before becoming law. It was their right to call a parliament and draw up the agenda for business. A parliament, in Florentine phrase, was simply a mass meeting of the rabble, who shouted their assent to certain names proposed by the dominant party, as being fit to exercise special powers. Thus elected, this body, called the Balia, proceeded to appoint ten accopiatori, joiners, whose chief duty was to collect in purses or bags, from which eight at a time were afterwards drawn by lot, the names of some four hundred candidates for office. Even without a Balia, the names were subject to a scrutiny, and the means of disqualification were numerous. But when the purses had been carefully weeded, there was no danger that any appointment would be made displeasing to the ruling powers. The Medici contrived that the Balia should generally be renewed every five years, and thus they secured the choice of all the magistrates. Occasionally the names were drawn by lot from the purses, but as a rule they were simply chosen by the accopiatori. The drawback to the signori was its very short term of office, and to remedy this defect Lorenzo de' Medici established a board of seventy life members, a kind of privy council. They were to act as standing accopiatori, that is, to nominate two offices. That day, said one of them, was liberty dead and buried. End. Section 9 of Europe and Renaissance and Reformation by Mary A. Hollings. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 4. The Italian States in the 15th Century. Part 3. From this Council of Seventy were chosen two permanent committees for police and war. After the fall of the Medici, the latter became known as the Ten of War, which is famous through its secretary, Machiavelli. The old councils were not abolished, but as a constantly changing body has little chance of influence compared with a permanent assembly, it is easy to see in whose hands the real power lay. Other arbitrary things they did, but it was not the people, but the wealthy citizens who suffered from their high-handed methods. Even with the private life of the nobles, their marriage alliances, and regulation of their incomes, the Medici interfered. Yet much was forgiven them, because, by general agreement, they were the most genuine of Florentines, in token of which Florence bestowed upon Cosmo his title of Pater Patriae. The last years of Cosmo's life were marked by important changes. Discontent in Florence led to the revival of elections by the people in 1455, but for a short time only. Luca Pitti, one of Cosmo's oldest supporters, was taken into his confidence and allowed to call a balia with the result that absolute rule was restored. It was said that Cosmo had to let his friends believe themselves as powerful as he was himself, and Luca Pitti actually tried to supplant his leader and began building himself the splendid palace which is now the great picture gallery of Florence. It was with the Pitti party that Cosmo's successor Piero had finally to deal. Cosmo's relations with other Italian states 
became the traditional policy of his house he cultivated a good understanding with the pope and his friendship with milan stamps him as the real founder of the triple alliance piero i the gaudi fourteen sixty four to fourteen sixty nine was a great contrast to his father a man of average capacity he was always prevented by ill health from taking an active part in affairs and his rule was a critical time for the medici power he made himself unpopular by recalling his business loans at great inconvenience to the borrowers and investing the money in land the support of galeazzo maria who had just succeeded in milan was not worth much at home the balia was not renewed and the opposition which cosmo had left so strong was still more hostile to his son a struggle between the pitti and medici parties followed the mountain and the plain so called from the position of the rival leaders houses the opposition tried three ways of getting rid of piero first they hoped to overthrow him by the lawful method of restoring the lot in elections but piero's great wealth enabled him to buy up many of his opponents among them pitti himself and the rest were exiled next they unsuccessfully attempted murder and finally with the secret support of venice they hired the condottiere bartolomeo colleone to attack florence piero strengthened the alliance with milan and naples and his general the duke of urbino was held to have defeated the mountain at molinella where contrary to the usual experience in italian warfare a few lives were lost it was clear that the prospects of the exiles had not improved and as Coleone had another engagement to fight the Turks, peace was made. The exiles remained exiles. A new Balia was granted for ten years, and there was no doubt that the hold of the Medici upon Florence was even stronger than it had been before Cosmo's death. Piero's eldest son, Lorenzo, 1469 to 1492, though under age for holding office, was invited to succeed his father from the first he was inclined to act as the prince rather than the citizen he had visited at the chief italian courts and had taken his bride cladice from the great roman house of orsini he was young and self-confident and ready to undertake the management of affairs there is no doubt that the crisis of fourteen seventy nine was brought about by three blunders of his own first certain changes were made in the government which may be described as tending to sweep away old offices and concentrate business in the hands of the signori thereby reducing the number of families who enjoyed political influence among these were the wealthy family of the pazzi of whom nine were qualified to hold office secondly lorenzo forced on a war with volterra whose chief source of wealth was its alum mines. Lorenzo himself had a private interest in alum, and took no pains to patch up the quarrel. Through an accident, the town was sacked, and to the disgust of the Florentines, a despoiled city was all they gained. Lastly, while keeping up the Triple Alliance, Lorenzo succeeded in adding the new pope, Sixtus IV, and the venetians to the list of his friends but the jealousy between venice and naples made it impossible for the same league to hold them both naples was offended and used her influence to win over sixtus this was all the more easy because the pope's plans to buy imola in romagna for girolamo riario alarmed lorenzo for the safety of florence he refused to lend the money and in revenge Sixtus appointed Salviati to the archbishopric of Pisa against Lorenzo's wishes. Thus the ambition of Girolamo Riario in 1478 became the centre of a plot to destroy the Medici. He was on friendly terms with Francesco Pazzi, the papal treasurer in Rome, and they persuaded Jacopo Pazzi, the head of the family in Florence, to join them there can be no doubt that the pope was aware of the plot though the active part in it was his nephew's 
and that Ferrante was also implicated. The plot was well organized and was kept wonderfully secret. It was necessary to get rid of both Lorenzo de' Medici and his younger brother Giuliano, who was the more popular of the two, and at the same time. Several promising opportunities were missed through a slight illness of Giuliano's. At last, it was settled to kill the brothers at high mass at the solemn moment of the elevation of the host. This task was entrusted to two priests, who did not share the objection felt by the soldiers to committing sacrilege in church. Jacopo Pazzi was to raise the populace in the streets, and Archbishop Salviati to seize the palace of the Signori. At the given moment, Giuliano was struck down, but Lorenzo, though wounded, found safety behind the bronze doors of the sacristy. The mob outside only responded to Jacopo's efforts with shouts of the Medici cry, Palle, and hustled his followers to the palace of the Signori. Here, Salviati's nervousness had betrayed his errand, and he was already under arrest. Hearing that Giuliano was dead, the mob hanged Salviati, Francesco Pazzi, and others from the palace windows. The other leaders were captured and suffered death with several hundred of their accomplices. This, says Giuciardini, was the luckiest day of Lorenzo's life. He lost his brother and confirmed his power. Together with the changes in the government already mentioned, the failure of the plot left Lorenzo prince in everything but name. He was still, however, in danger from the foreign members of the conspiracy. Sixtus the Fourth at once excommunicated him for the archbishop's death and laid Florence under an interdict for refusing to give him up. Ferrante of Naples joined the Pope in declaring war. There was great danger from disloyalty within Florence herself and in her subject states. France threatening the Pope with a general council and Ferrante with an Angevin invasion seemed the only ally likely to be of practical help as Venice, now freed from the Turks, was thinking to fish in troubled waters, and Milan, through Ferrante's contrivance, was in the throes of revolution. Florence was outnumbered by her enemies, and the plague broke out in the city. Only the quarrels among the rival generals of the League prevented her defeat on all sides. Lorenzo offered to sacrifice himself for the public wheel, he would go on a mission of peace to Naples, and meanwhile the real feeling in the city would declare itself. The last suggestion contained the chief risk there was in carrying out this plan, which seems to have been talked over first with Naples. Ferrante, indeed, might prove treacherous, but after keeping Lorenzo three months to see whether Florence would rise or not, he decided to come to terms. The Pope was of the same mind, for the Turks had just seized Otranto. The terms were hard for Florence. She had to pay a yearly sum to Alfonso of Calabria, who was left in occupation of Siena, from which, however, pressure from the Turks soon forced his withdrawal. The Florentine forts taken during the war were to be given back at Ferrante's pleasure. Six were actually restored in 1481. And the lords of Romagna, who were under Florentine protection, were left to the Pope's vengeance. Still Lorenzo was enthusiastically welcomed on his return from a brave mission, and he met with no opposition to his new Council of Seventy and the committees which we should call the War and Home Offices. These experiences proved of lasting value to Lorenzo. The tranquil state of Florence left him free to devote himself to foreign affairs, his tact, his judgment, his influence developed with years. He became, as it was said, the balance of Italy, for his policy was to keep the peace by means of the Triple Alliance. But even in Lorenzo's lifetime it became clear that the alliance itself was doomed by the growing ill-feeling between Naples and Milan after Ludovico's accession. If any man could have prevented the rupture, that man was Lorenzo, but at the critical time in 1492, to the consternation of Italy, he died. 
During his later years, Lorenzo neglected mercantile affairs for political and social duties. He gathered round him a wonderful group of artists and men of letters. The Platonic Academy, founded by Cosmo, had its meetings at Lorenzo's palace. It numbered among its members the brilliant writers and scholars Politiano, Ficino, and Pico della Mirandola, the architect Alberti and Michelangelo, the greatest of Florentine painters. It says much for Lorenzo's own gifts that of such a circle he was fitted to be the patron and leader. In his great history of Florence, Giugiardini sums up for us the character of Lorenzo. Though not a soldier, he had all the other qualities necessary to a ruler. He was much less able than Cosmo as a man of business, but more eloquent and cultivated. Universal deference had brought out a certain haughtiness in him, but he was a witty talker and good company. The title of Il Magnifico, commonly given to Italian magnates of no definite rank, was very fittingly used of Lorenzo in its literal sense of the magnificent. In appearance, he was a man of middle height and dark complexion. His features were irregular and his voice unmusical. It may be asked whether on the whole the Medici rule was a gain or a loss to Florence. As to the answer, opinions differ. On the one hand, it may be said that their taxation was a great burden, and that they robbed the state, that they corrupted the public service, lowered its standards of honor, and stole from Florence her liberty and the power of her citizens to act for themselves. On the other, that they gave a peaceful and orderly government to the city without undue severity, that they brought her prosperity and fame, and made her the brilliant center of the most brilliant age in history since the great days of Athens. Those who think that self-government with all its mistakes is best will decide against the Medici. Others, remembering the general fate of despotism that overtook all Italian states at the time, may accept Giugiardini's summing up. The city had not liberty, but could not have had a much more pleasant tyranny. The Medici rule really ended with Lorenzo, for even had the invasion of Charles the Eighth not suddenly terminated it, Piero's misgovernment would have brought about the same result, if less quietly, almost as soon. Piero II, 1492 to 1495, was not without brains, but he was headstrong and giddy and ignorant of politics. He haughtily set his secretary to take his orders to the signori, he offended all his father's friends, and played ball with his minions in the street to the public inconvenience. His manners were those of an ungracious princeling, not of the first citizen of the state. His marriage with Alfonsina Orsini renewed the tie with his mother's family, and drew him towards Naples, between whom and the Orsini there was a long-standing connection. The Florentines, however, disliked the House of Aragon, and Milan had now still stronger reasons for doing so. It is clear, therefore, that the old balance of power was upset. Charles the Eighth was nearing Florence on his march south, and Piero felt himself unequal to the occasion. He decided to imitate his father's bold journey to Naples at an equally critical time, as the feeling of Florence was all in favor of a French alliance, Piero resolved, without consulting his government, to be the first to approach the French, and set out to meet them at Sarzana. With a little foresight, the French might have been turned back. Their way lay through barren pasture lands where food was scarce, and a line of fortresses might have been manned to shut off the enemy between the mountains and the sea but no effort had been made even to defend the passes of the Apennines. Thus, when Piero found himself in the king's presence, he yielded the four fortresses, Sarzana, Pietrasanta, Pisa, and Logorn, without a struggle, much to Charles's astonishment. When he returned to Florence with well-founded misgivings, the city revolted against the idea of such an unauthorized surrender, and shut the gates of the palace of the Signory in his face. All exertions to raise the populace on the part of Paolo Rossini with a troop of horse, and of Piero's brother, the young Cardinal Giovanni, were useless, 
and Piero fled by way of Bologna to Venice in 1495. On the same day, Pisa, after 87 years of Florentine rule, revolted and became independent. End of Section 10 of Europe and Renaissance and Reformation by Mary A. Hollings. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 5. The Italian Wars to 1518. Part 1. At this point, it may be as well to collect together the various causes that brought about the invasion of Charles VIII in 1494. The king himself was ambitious of making good his claim on Naples, and perhaps, in the second place, of using his conquest as a stepping stone to a crusade against Constantinople. Secondly, the Pope, by the scandals of his life and his hatred of the Cardinal de la Rovere, who had fled to the French court, indirectly gave ground for interference in Italian affairs. It was as a scourge to the church that Savonarola had predicted that Charles should come to Italy. Thirdly, Ferrante's broken word and harsh treatment had driven the revolted Neapolitan baronage to be the first to call in French aid. Fourthly, the usurpation of Milan by Ludovico had upset the old balance of powers and led to his appeal to France to distract his chief enemy, Naples. Lastly, the old tie between Florence and France, strengthened by the prophecies of Savonarola, inclined the Florentines in the same direction, and the hasty action of Piero de' Medici placed the city almost at Charles's mercy. The only powers prepared to resist the king were Naples and the Pope, while Venice counted on remaining neutral till she saw how things turned out. Charles crossed the Alps in September by the Pass of Montgenevre with the bulk of his army, which was thoroughly up to date in its three divisions of infantry, cavalry, and artillery. The first states on his line of march, Savoy, Montferrat, and Genoa, were only too ready to give him passage. From Genoa also sailed a squadron accompanying the French fleet and attacked the Neapolitan ships which had occupied Rapallo. There a rude shock was felt by the Italians at the amount of blood spilt in this first engagement. By Asti, Pavia, Piacenza, and Sarzana came to the king, whose meeting with Piero de' Medici occurred at this last Florentine town. A second embassy under Savonarola reached the king at Pisa, and besought him to deal mercifully and honorably with Florence. But forgetful of the fact that he came as the ally and guest of the city, he proceeded to release Pisa from her oppressive yoke. In the same spirit with lances in rest as conquerors, the French entered Florence. The officers even chalked out the lodging for their companies at will. The inhabitants gazed at what was for them a great military display. The king, conspicuous by his ugly face and his misshapen figure, arrayed in black velvet and cloth of gold, was surrounded by several cardinals, including his minister Brissonnet and de la Rovere, and by his bodyguard of bowmen. He graciously declined to allow the seigneury to hold his bridle, as was their custom for pope, emperor, or king. Then followed knights on foot, the fierce-looking Swiss vanguard, Gascon light infantry, the chivalry of France, fine men on fine horses, and the Scottish archers, whose height attracted notice. Charles was lodged in the Medici palace, which had been set in order after its sack at the hands of the mob on Piero's flight. He put forward unreasonable demands for the restoration of Piero and control of the city through his lieutenant. Bold words followed to clothe the secret fear which each party had of the other. Then we will sound our trumpets, cried Charles impatiently, and Caponi, the most independent Florentine in the city, tearing the insolent treaty in pieces, retorted with his famous, and we will ring our bells. 
the king lowered his demands but florence was obliged to leave in his hands the four fortresses and furnish him with a huge sum of money the french then left for rome the pope was filled with alarm at their approach visions of a general council and the exposure of his many crimes rose before his eyes and he came to terms he was obliged to abandon the neapolitan alliance dismiss ferrantino alfonso's son with his army and admit the french but in negotiation the pope proved the better man of the two he agreed to send his son cesare borgia as a hostage and to deliver to charles jem the brother of the sultan the affair of jem which was extremely discreditable to the pope is also important as bearing evidence to charles's intention of leading a crusade jem was the gifted younger brother of the sultan bajazet son of the great mahomet to his schemes of dividing the turkish dominion with bajazet the latter had objected that the empire was the bride of one lord jem defeated in battle took refuge with the knights of rhodes who were paid by bajazet for keeping him but they presently sent him under guard to france as being at a safe distance from turkey from being a guest with a safe conduct for his departure from rhodes jem had become a prisoner innocent the eighth arranged with the knights to hand jem over thinking he might be used with advantage against the sultan once the crusade was under way it was however the policy of alexander the sixth to enlist the sultan's help against the coming french invasions and part of bajazet's correspondence with him was unfortunately for the pope seized and opened by the french it contained an offer from the sultan of three hundred thousand ducats wherewith your highness may buy some dominions for your children in return for the pope's compassing gems death charles the eighth was as anxious as innocent the eighth had been to secure gem for his crusade and the prince as has been seen was delivered to him by alexander but when they reached naples gem died it was thought from some form of slow poisoning the pope has always been suspected of the crime and appearances are certainly against him meanwhile it was disturbing to find that the hostage cesare borgia had escaped at the first opportunity charles's steady advance on naples drove the craven alfonso into flight though ferrantino prepared to stand his ground his troops showed no pluck and trivulzio a melanese in his pay of whom ludovico had said a halter awaits him when caught made terms with the french ferrantino truly declaring that the sins of the fathers were being visited on the children followed alfonso to sicily in less than a month all naples save a few forts was in french hands fourteen ninety five the success of charles's expedition has something of the glamour of a fairy tale it was made possible by the miserable divisions in italy and the panic of the italians on being brought face to face for the first time with the grim realities of war for instance the deadly nature of the french artillery which fired iron and not stone was a revelation to them but the loss of naples was no less rapid than its conquest the french made every kind of mistake when it came to political dealings with the people the italian states began to consult together at last in their own defence a league was formed at venice between the republic the pope spain milan and the emperor for protection against aggressive powers in italy seizing the pretext of an attack by orleans on novara they declared war charles after lingering at naples at last turned north leaving montpensier as viceroy italy glad to see the last of him offered no resistance till he reached the river taro in the milanese where the marquis of mantua in command of the army of the league awaited him the allies lay on the opposite bank of the river which was swollen by a thunderstorm the french rear was attacked by them after the army had crossed the artillery hardly came into action at all and more than half the allies never fought ludovico who was still hedging between venice and france 
forbade his troops to act vigorously. The French marched away without further hindrance, and the Allies left some four thousand dead on the field. The Battle of Fornovo may be regarded as a French victory, though a useless one. The departure of Charles was followed by a general revolt in Naples. Ferrantino returned with troops lent by Spain under the great captain Gonsalvo di Cordoba, and a fleet lent by Venice in return for her possession of the much-coveted Apulian ports. Fever carried off Montpensier and other French officials. One stronghold after another fell into Ferrantino's hands, and though he died before the war was over, his uncle Federigo succeeded to a recovered kingdom. The results of Charles's invasion may here be summed up. Nothing whatever was left to him in Naples. Yet his expedition had one lasting effect. It had introduced Italy to the northern nations, and the wealth, beauty, and possibilities of this almost unknown land made a deep impression on their minds. For some sixty-five years, Italy was to be the prey of the nations beyond the Alps. For the rest, Florence, the only cordial ally of France, came off worst, for she did not regain the promised fortresses, and Pisa recovered her independence. Venice was the gainer by the six Apulian ports. The war left Milan, for the time being, as it found her. For several years Charles amused himself in France with schemes for restoring French influence in Italy, but in 1498 these were cut short by an accident. The king struck his head against a doorpost in his fine new tennis court at Amboise and died immediately from the effects. As none of his children had survived their infancy, the Duke of Orléans, his sister Jeanne's husband, succeeded him as Louis the Twelfth. We must now return to Florence, where events of the first importance had been taking place since the downfall of the Medici. In this crisis of her fate, the city turned to the man who had long foreseen what should come to pass, confidently expecting that now his prophecy had been fulfilled, he would tell them how to act. Girolamo Savonarola, a Dominican friar from Ferrara, had come to St. Mark's convent in Florence in 1481, and had made himself famous by the remarkable series of sermons he preached in the cathedral. He foretold that a sword should come upon the earth to reform the church, and that without delay. He applied his intimate knowledge of the Bible to everyday problems. Though ceremonies and formal repetitions had no charm for him, he never in any sense departed from the fold of the church. His creed was the simplest and most direct, yet he was the only preacher who could keep the attention of the critical and fickle Florentine public year after year without falling in their estimation. His fiery natural eloquence was suited to subjects generally chosen from the prophetic books or from the Revelation, and his sermons were largely political. He was no respecter of persons. His portrait of the Italian tyrant of the day was so true to life that each guilty ruler recognized in it himself. To Lorenzo on his deathbed, to Charles the Eighth, and Pope Alexander the Sixth, his attitude was equally bold and unswerving. In 1492 the convent of St. Mark had become independent of all authority save that of the Pope and the head of the Dominican order. As its prior, Savonarola was therefore given almost a free hand, and he proceeded to reform the convent and develop its activities. But in the next year, with the sudden onset of the French, Savonarola became the chief political power in Florence. First, he used all his influence to keep order in the city. Then, he set to work on the new constitution which had to be framed in place of the government of the Medici upon their fall. It was not original, nor did the friar always suggest the borrowed ideas, but his hand seems mainly to have shaped them. The councils representing the guilds were abolished, and in imitation of Venice, a permanent grand council was formed of all citizens aged twenty-nine, who had paid taxes and whose families for three generations had been drawn for the three chief offices. About thirty-five hundred citizens fulfilled these conditions, that is, about 
one twenty-fifth of the population. Their duties were to pass laws, hear appeals, control the elections to magistracies by lot, and choose a senate of eighty, holding office for six months, to advise the signori who, with the priors and gonfolonieri, remained part of the scheme. In 1502, however, the latter was chosen for life. The Ten of War also continued to control foreign affairs. All bills were originated in the signori, but to become law must pass through the Senate and be sanctioned by the Grand Council. As only one twenty-fifth of the inhabitants sat in the Grand Council, it will be seen that Florence had not become a democracy. We should call it an upper-middle-class government. Yet, in comparison with the personal rule of the Medici, it seemed almost democratic. The Parliament, or mass meeting, was abolished. In this, and in some general features of the new government, Savonarola's influence may be traced more clearly than in its institutions. The law of appeal in political offences from the seigneury to the Grand Council was certainly passed with his support, as was also an inquiry into the robbery of public money. Again he tried to rouse public feeling in favour of the reforms. All must do their part to ensure success. He saw that a people so long corrupted by a tyrant's rule could not be fit for self-government. He therefore aimed at founding his reformed government upon a moral reform of the population. The friar's personal influence had often worked wonders upon frivolous young men. It found new scope in leading a Puritan movement in Florence. At the burning of the vanities, great public bonfires, a clearance was made of many articles of luxury or fashion, false hair, cards, charms, masks, scents, undesirable books, and pictures. Even the street boys of Florence, who were hitherto terrible hooligans, were enlisted in the cause to collect alms in organized bands. Noisy festivities and processions were suppressed. An extraordinary change came over the outward life of the city, which must be admitted in many cases, at least, to have been the visible sign of real inward change. In becoming a politician, however, the friar became the leader of a party, and speedily party divisions, always rife in Florence, became fierce. His own party, the Piagnoni, or Weepers, were by degrees opposed by the Bigi, the Greys, so called because working for the Medici restoration at first without much vigor, they were neither white nor black. And the Orabiati, enraged, who hated Puritanism, and though not desiring Piero's return, eventually came round to supporting the younger branch of his house. Of this faction, the Campagnacci were an offshoot, consisting of the dandies of the city. They both regarded the Piagnoni as little Italians, on account of their leaning toward France. They themselves were in league with Milan, and their motto might have been Italy for the Italians. The foreign policy of the Piagnoni made them unpopular with other Italian states, while outside Florence we must add to the friar's opponents Pope Alexander the Sixth, whose life he continued freely to denounce. In spite of the papal prohibition in 1495, in the following Lent, the Signori encouraged the friar to continue his sermons. The Pope then tried the bribe of a cardinal's hat. Come to my next sermon, replied Savonarola to the envoy, and you shall hear my reply. It was a yet fiercer attack on the sins of the Church, and a forecast of great troubles still to come upon Italy. Savonarola's boundless energy as preacher and ruler reached its height in the carnival of 1497. From that time there were signs that his power was on the wane. Hitherto the Piagnoni had been politically in the ascendant. The election of the Medicean, Bernardo del Nero as Gonfalonier, showed the beginning of a change, which was confirmed by an attempt of Piero upon Florence, and by the tumult raised by the Campagnacci in the cathedral, where Savonarola was preaching on Ascension Day. End. Section 11 of Europe in Renaissance and Reformation by Mary A. Hollings. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 5. 
the italian wars to fifteen eighteen part two the pope took advantage of the opportunity to excommunicate savonarola for disobedience and heresy the signori pleaded for the withdrawal of the brief and in the meantime stopped savonarola from preaching so that the excitement in florence subsided the new signori was even favourable to the friar and the sudden discovery that five leading citizens had been concerned in the late medici plot stirred florence to its depths the five including bernardo del nero were condemned to death and so strong was popular feeling against them that they were refused the right of appeal to the great council and were executed though savonarola himself seems to have taken no direct part in the matter it would have been quite safe to allow the appeal so strongly was the piagnone majority supported by the feeling of the city the refusal no doubt injured him from this time the friar never recovered his position alexander fearful of savonarola's constant appeals to france and their probable result a general council and mindful of the fact that a french invasion could be barred merely by the union of florence and ferrara now resolved upon the friar's ruin he threatened the city with an interdict if it continued to defend savonarola the latter appealed against the pope to the kings of europe but the letters never reached their destination and one of them was intercepted and carried to rome if any other proof of the friar's audacity were needed it was now in the pope's hands in florence itself his old rivals the franciscans were clamouring for some sign of his prophetic gift many waverers in the city awaited this test to confirm their belief in him and that it should take the form of the ordeal by fire was suggested by past events in florentine history the challenge of the franciscans was accepted by fra domenico a faithful disciple of the friar a huge pile of wood gunpowder and oil was laid in the piazza and thither thronged all florence eager for a spectacle the monk who could walk unscathed in the narrow path through the lighted pile would by the divine judgment have proved his innocence amid the suspense of the waiting crowds the franciscans began to object first to the fra domenico's robes then to his carrying the sacrament through the fire hours passed in dispute a furious thunderstorm swept the piazza night was falling and the signori announced that the ordeal was postponed wet and hungry and cheated of the expected sensation the mob had to be thrust back from the friars by the guard next day led by the compagnacci it attacked st mark's the monks and the piagnoni defended it valiantly the leader of the party francesco valori fell among the slain outside the signori interfered to restore order and savonarola and his two chief followers fra domenico and fra silvestro were arrested it was decided that the pope should send a commission to try them for offences against the church and that the city should deal with their offences against herself under torture savonarola is said to have confessed that his prophetic visions were false but that the evidence is unreliable is certain he never however denied his mission to reform the church and give florence free government though nothing worse than ambition could be proved against him the arabiati and the pope were bent on his destruction two hundred piagnoni were forcibly excluded from the grand council and a signory of arabiati was returned but none dared to protest the pope granted to the city a tax of three tenths on church revenues for which said one of the piagnoni they have sold our master the three friars found guilty of heresy schism and treason to the state were sentenced to be hanged from the gibbet and their dead bodies consumed by fire on may twenty third fourteen ninety eight the end came what have i done to thee o florence murmured savonarola as he gazed his last at the silent crowd beneath him neither his party nor his influence died with him the former became all-powerful once more his constitution except during the period of the medici restoration 
lasted till the overthrow of the florentine republic but it is not chiefly as a politician that savonarola appeals to succeeding ages he belongs in more senses than one to those who see visions and dream dreams we cannot explain his prophetic strangely fulfilled utterances except by believing that to the spiritually minded of all ages has undoubtedly been given some insight into the unseen which is beyond common experience we are no longer puzzled to decide as were some of his contemporaries whether or not he was a good man his place is among those who are given a power beyond their fellows to love righteousness and hate iniquity it was this force in him that called forth the devotion of his followers that attracted to him men of the world and level-headed politicians that has forever enshrined his memory in the city that he loved at the crisis of savonarola's fate had died charles the eighth whose interference might possibly have averted it the new king louis the twelfth fourteen ninety eight to fifteen twelve was generous and tolerant but the credit for his useful and popular domestic government which won him the title of father of his people rather belongs to his minister cardinal amboise louis gained the clergy by yielding to them the right of free elections and the nobles by relaxing the tight hold kept upon them by the last kings granting them for instance certain royal rights of the chase he proved the truth of his saying that it would ill become the king to avenge the wrongs of the duke by showing suzanne the only child of anne of bourbon a special favour anne as regent had imprisoned louis for opposing her government but the king allowed her daughter to succeed to the bourbon estates which were due on the failure of an heir to fall to the crown louis also made himself popular with the middle classes by granting a share in patronage to the parliaments by keeping an economical court and strict accounts and by the frank geniality of his manners taxation was light the tie or perpetual tax on land and income which fell only on the middle and lower classes and had been steadily increased was reduced almost to its original rate the development of trade thanks to the wise measures of charles the seventh and louis the eleventh added to the general contentment of the country peace was maintained within the kingdom without effort the first reign of which this could be said since the accession of the valois nevertheless the continuance by louis the twelfth of charles the eighth's disastrous italian policy cannot be justified it added to the woes of italy and wasted the resources of france it was made possible by persuading venice to desert the league in return for the possession of cremona and the ghiara d'adda by bribing florence with troops to assist in recovering pisa still in revolt and by a discreditable bargain with alexander the sixth whom louis won over from the league the same pope be it remembered who to gain florence for the same league had contrived savonarola's fall alexander declared louis divorced from his first wife jeanne of france in order that he might marry charles the eighth's widow anne of brittany he also raised amboise to the rank of cardinal of rouen the pope fitted his side of the bargain to the needs of his new policy he was bent on making his son cesare borgia duke of romagna a district long in theory the property of the holy see but always held by a number of petty romagnan princes the opportunity had come because florentine protection of the district had ended with the medici rule and venice was occupied with the turks cesare who had already been deprived of his rank as cardinal is believed to have made away with his elder brother in preparation for his new career louis consented to give him the french title of duke of valentinois and the hand of his niece charlotte d'albret in marriage other members of the pope's family became pawns in the game his daughter the placid fair-haired lucrezia had been married to the son of alfonso of naples the neapolitan alliance was no longer important while that of ferrara which secured romagna on its northern side now became so by cesare borgia's contrivance 
Lucrezia's husband was murdered, and at the age of twenty-one she found a fourth husband provided for her in Alfonso d'Este, son of the Duke of Ferrara. Cesare proceeded to conquer Romagna. It was devoured piecemeal by the dragon. The French invasion of Milan had just taken place, and Imola, Forli, and Pesaro, all Sforza lordships, were his first prey. The Malatesta were driven from Rimini, the Manfredi from Faenza. By 1501, Cesare was Duke of Romagna. That land, which Dante had said, never is and never shall be without war. Apart from its cruel and ruthless conquest, the fate of Romagna is not to be regretted. Its sixteen petty lordships were always at strife. It had supplied Italy with a long line of brutal condottieri. Cesare, in overcoming it, had succeeded in an attempt which had been vainly made by Ladislaus of Naples, the Visconti, the Sforza, and several popes. Cesare now turned his mind to more ambitious plans. The Pope supplied him with plenty of money, and he was able to secure the services of the best condottieri. France and Spain, as will be seen, had begun to quarrel over their prey, and Cesare was the vulture in their train. He advanced into Florentine territory, fixing his attention upon certain surrounding strongholds and arousing the deepest suspicion in the city but his expulsion of the good duke Guido Baldo from Urbino opened the eyes of France, and Louis made Cesare understand that he must keep his hands off Florence. Pisa, however, offered to make him her lord, and he was about to attack Bologna when a serious conspiracy broke out at Sinigalia among his discontented condottieri, including several of the Orsini. Aided by help from France, Cesare used the wisdom of the serpent in beguiling the rebellious captains to their doom, while the Pope completed the downfall of the Orsini family in Rome. Cesare then resumed his plans for becoming king of Tuscany, or even of Italy, with the help of Spain, for it was becoming apparent to the Borgias that in the duel with Spain, France was losing ground. He also hoped, by increasing the number of Spanish cardinals, to control the next papal election in the event of Alexander's death. But he could not foresee what actually happened. In 1503, after a banquet given by the Borgias to some rich cardinals, the Pope and Cesare fell violently ill, and the Pope died with every appearance of having been poisoned. It was said that a cup prepared for the guest of the evening had found its way into the wrong hands, and no attempts to prove that the summer heat and the insanitary state of Rome might have produced fever and apoplexy have ever seemed really convincing. So died Alexander the Sixth, of whose pontificate it was said that Rome in his day was a cave of robbers and assassins, a man without religion or honor, stained with the worst vices and infinitely ambitious, the wickedest and luckiest of the popes for centuries past. Lucky the Pope would certainly have admitted himself to be. He was devoted to his family, for whom, in fact, he sacrificed worldly goods and his immortal reputation. Despite his vices, he had many human qualities, and he shared to the full the Italian joy of living. At the all-important crisis of the papal election, Cesare was paralyzed by illness. The Cardinal of Rouen was successfully opposed, but the Borgia party was unable to prevent the choice of Pius III, a nephew of Pius II. When a second opportunity occurred on the Pope's death a month later, Cesare, somewhat strangely, allowed himself to be brought over by the enemy of his house, Cardinal de la Rovere, who was duly elected as Julius II, 1503-1513. to 1513. Meanwhile, Romagna was recovering its independence, not rapidly, for its duke had humbled the strong and protected the weak, and his government, though harsh, had been so just and upright that he was greatly loved there. Julius II became the real heir to his conquests, but allowed Cesare to go free. He was, however, sent as a prisoner to Spain, and having escaped to Navarre, he was run through in a petty fight 
with a rebel subject of his brother-in-law. The career of Cesare has been given in some detail because it has a twofold importance in history. Of all the Italian adventurers, he came nearest to uniting Italy into one kingdom. No other was equally conspicuous for craft, brains, and treachery. No other was so favored by fortune. So it came about that Cesare, the most resplendent rogue of history, is held up to the admiration of all who would learn how to gain and govern states as the hero of Machiavelli's wonderful study of the prince. Meanwhile, the French invasion of Milan was being accomplished by a brilliant army under Trivulzio, who had formerly been in the pay of Naples. Ludovico, in 1499, relied on the services of the San Severini brothers, but Galeazzo, who was defending Alessandria, lost heart and fled, and a few days later Ludovico himself with his valuables escaped from Milan into Tyrol. Two-thirds of his duchy west of the Adda was seized by the French, the remaining third east of the river by the Venetians, but Trivulzio turned out an unsatisfactory governor, and Ludovico soon felt encouraged to try, with the help of Maximilian and the southern Swiss cantons, to join Galeazzo San Severino, and regain his duchy. The Swiss of the other cantons in the pay of France found themselves face to face with their countrymen at Novara. Knowing that their employer was short of money, those on Ludovico's side declined to fight. In the retreat, the duke himself was captured and sent to Loche in Touraine, where he died a prisoner in 1508. The French army entered the city of Milan, and the Cardinal of Rouen arrived to take Trivulzio's former place as governor. For the next three years, French influence was supreme in Italy. From the conquest of Milan, Louis turned to Naples, in which, however, France was no longer the only interested foreign power. Federigo had been restored by the help of his kinsman Ferdinand of Spain, and by a great error of judgment, Louis decided to take Ferdinand into partnership in his attack on Naples. In the hypocritical pretense of uniting against the Turk, with whom Federigo, in his sorest need in 1494, had been for a short time allied, the kings of France and Spain agreed in the Treaty of Granada, 1500, to share Naples equally between them, Louis taking the Abruzzi and Lavoro, Ferdinand, Calabria, and Apulia. This arrangement was presently confirmed by the Pope. Federigo, a gifted and capable ruler, retired in the face of overwhelming odds to France, where he was considerately treated. His young son, Ferrante, lived out a long life of exile in Spain. Soon, however, the robber kings fell to quarreling over the division of their spoil. The central districts of Naples, the Basilicata, Capitanata, and the Principati had not been definitely given to either, and they could not settle their claims peaceably. War broke out between them in 1502, a war made memorable by the deeds of a goodly company of famous knights, among whom the French Bayard and the Spanish Gonzalo de Cordova are the most renowned. At first Spain had difficulty in holding her own against the superior quality and quantity of the French troops, but time and fortune were on her side. The French were not quick to make the most of their advantages to begin with, and two important changes in the situation were favorable to Spain. In the first place, Louis was induced by the Treaty of Lyon, conferring Naples as a dowry upon two infants, Ferdinand's grandson Charles and his own daughter Claude, to withdraw the reinforcements which were in the act of joining his army in Naples. Secondly, the Spaniards gained command of the sea, which cut off French supplies. These two facts encouraged Spain to take the offensive in the war, with the result that the two important victories of Seminara and Cerignola made them masters respectively of Calabria and Apulia. The French retired to Gaeta, and it was soon found that no fortress could hold out long against the skill of the famous Spanish engineer, Pedro Navarra. In three weeks, the French resistance would have been at an end had not Louis sent a new army to Naples. 
It was, however, detained at Rome by Amboise to add weight to his chances in the papal election. Again, therefore, the slowness of the French hampered their cause, and they suffered even more than the Spanish army from lying long in a damp and cold position. They were hemmed in between Gaeta, their last foothold, and the river Garaliano, across which their way south was barred by Gonsalvo di Cordova. At last, just after Christmas, Gonsalvo himself crossed the river above the French position and fell upon their army unexpectedly. The French discipline had been weak for some time, and the Battle of Garigliano was a mere rout. The French fled towards Gaeta, pursued by the victorious enemy. Among the fugitives trying to escape by boat was Piero di Medici, who was upset and drowned. On New Year's Day, 1504, the French surrendered what territory was still left to them, and in the next year, Louis made a wedding present of his rights over Naples to his niece, Germaine de Foix, on her marriage with Ferdinand. End. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Section 12 of Europe and Renaissance and Reformation by Mary A. Hollings. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 5. The Italian Wars to 1518, Part 3. The sudden reverse of fortune in the war is not difficult to explain. The Spaniards were always at an advantage in possessing Sicily as a base of supplies, and in Gonsalvo they had a matchless leader equally at home in the arts of the court and the arts of war. The great captain is the most splendid type of the Spanish soldier who thenceforth for nearly a century and a half was to teach the laws of war to Europe. But he served a jealous master. His invariable success roused Ferdinand's suspicions, and four years after his conquest of Naples he was dismissed from public life. The kingdom of Naples, his conquest, remained part of the Spanish monarchy until the division of the latter by the Treaty of Utrecht. On the downfall of Cesare Borgia, Venice had intended to become his heir in Romagna, and having succeeded in gaining everything but Imola and Forli, was prepared to offer the Pope tribute. Julius II, however, as we have seen, was not only determined to recover all Romagna for the Holy See, but also to make the states of the Church the strong central power in Italy, holding the balance between France in the north and Spain in the south. As Venice was now the only Italian state able to dispute the Pope's intentions, Julius decided upon the ruin of Venice. This was unfortunately only too easy to accomplish for the Republic had many enemies. Spain and France had become reconciled at the time of the marriage of Ferdinand with Germaine de Foix, and both powers coveted Venetian territory. Spain wanted the Neapolitan ports to complete her conquest, and France, eastern Milan. The Emperor had claims on Padua, Verona, and Friuli while the Pope desired Faenza, Rimini, and Ravenna. Thus came into being the disgraceful compact known as the League of Cambrai, 1508, whose members were nothing more than brigands of unusual eminence. Venice made ready to face her foes, hired the cautious Pitigliano and the fiery Alviano, and finding it difficult, as always, to raise troops, only attempted to defend Romagna, bar Maximilian's advance, and hold the Neapolitan ports with small garrisons, trusting to their natural strength. So the war broke out from 1509 to 1519, a war whose consequences were to last for ten years. France was first in the field, Louis the Twelfth, having had occasion to send troops in 1507 to punish a riot in Genoa. The French army encountered the Venetians on the Republic's frontier, 
and a battle was fought at Añadelo or Vaila. It was a struggle between the Venetian rear under Alviano and the French vanguard. Pitigliano, in command of the Venetian van, for some reason never engaged his forces at all. The rain damped the powder, and a large part of the artillery fell into the enemy's hands, but the struggle was hot, ending in the capture of Alviano and the complete rout of his army. This defeat was the signal for the temporary breakup of the Venetian dominion. Cremona, Crema, and Bergamo were at once seized by the French, and the other greedy powers swooped upon their coveted prey. As Venice could no longer defend her subject cities, it was decided to release them from their allegiance. But a brief experience of other masters soon made them appreciate the blessing of Venetian rule. Before long, Padua was recovered from Maximilian, and an attempt on his part to reduce the city completely failed. He revenged himself by ravaging Friuli for more than a year, setting the inhabitants hopelessly against him. Meanwhile, the Pope's views were changing. He had recovered Romagna for the church and had humbled Venice. As an Italian patriot, he had no desire to see Italy overrun by the foreigner again. He therefore not only came to terms with Venice, but challenged the French, the most successful of the crew of bandits, by attacking the Duke of Ferrara, who had gone over from the League to their side. The capture of Ferrara proved a task beyond the Pope's powers, yet, in spite of old age and illness, his indomitable spirit carried him successfully at the head of his army through a bitter winter campaign against Mirandola. In the spring, however, the French retook Bologna, the earliest of the Pope's conquests, and the tide seemed to have turned in their favor until they took the ill-advised step of summoning a general council at Pisa to depose the Pope. With this plan, Europe dreading a renewal of the schism was not in sympathy, and the Pope triumphantly concluded the Holy League with Spain, England, Venice, and the Swiss in 1511 to drive the French out of Italy. The French governor of Milan, Gaston de Foix, Duke of Namur, closely related to both parties as the brother-in-law of Ferdinand and the nephew of Louis, was in command of the French army. The wonderful lad, as a contemporary calls him, for he was only twenty-three, flashed through a brief three-months campaign with meteoric speed and splendor. Confronting a double foe, the Spaniards before Bologna and the Venetians within Brescia, he raised the siege of the first, and after a march of extraordinary rapidity, stormed and sacked the second within the fortnight. Turning south, he drove the enemy from the neighborhood of Bologna, and made ready to march on Rome and capture the Pope. The Spaniards lay at Ravenna, and Gaston, throwing a bridge of boats across the river in the night, determined to force them to battle before Maximilian and the Swiss could come into the field. Easter Sunday dawned blood-red, a sign it was foretold, that one of the leaders must fall. Gaston trained the famous artillery of Ferrara on Cardona's position, which was defended by ditches, wagons mounted with scythes, and heavy guns. For three hours the cannonade lasted, then the opposing cavalry and infantry hurled themselves upon each other, and the furious onset of the French horse dislodged the troops of the League from their entrenched position and decided the day. Cardona fled, Pescara, Pedro Navarra and the future Pope Leo X were among the fine haul of prisoners taken by the French. It was a battle of picturesque contrasts, knights in armor, infantry fighting behind crossed spears, Gaston in coat of mail with his lady's colors on his arm, directing the bloodiest battle yet fought in Italy, and wresting a victory by means of the most up-to-date artillery. The day was already won, when, catching sight of a retreating band of Spaniards, he dashed with a handful of followers into their midst. 
he was unhorsed and fought desperately on foot spare him shouted lautrec to the unheeding spaniards he is the brother of your queen with fourteen wounds in front gaston fell i had rather have lost the battle lamented louis the twelfth when the news reached him and in truth the death of the brilliant young leader meant the loss not indeed of the battle but of the campaign it was soon found that the spaniards had no cause to summon the great captain from his retirement for la palice who succeeded gaston by seniority had not gaston's hold upon his troops besides maximilian in the hope of winning milan chose this moment for deserting the league while the swiss who had done louis yeoman service in the past now fell under the influence of the bishop of sillon the sworn foe of france only two months after the battle of ravenna in fifteen twelve the french army crossed the mont Cenis, leaving everything but a few castles in the enemy's hands machiavelli severely sums up the causes of this collapse as follows louis increased the power of the church invited the spaniards into italy and ruined venice his best friend the members of the league divided the spoil of which the pope secured the chief part they then took in hand florentine affairs and demanded the retirement of the life gonfalonieri soderini and the restoration of the medici the reluctance of the citizens to dispose soderini brought upon them the brutal sack by the spaniards of prato a subject town a few miles away accordingly the medici in 1512 that is piero san lorenzo with his uncles returned once more to florence and swept away all the changes that had taken place in the government since the death of lorenzo the magnificent among those who were driven from office was machiavelli who occupied himself in writing the prince and other works by a curious coincidence the sforza family were restored at the same time to milan by the swiss who carved out a fine reward for themselves in what are now the Italian cantons. Maximilian Sforza, Ludovico's son, reigned in his father's place, but as little more than a vassal of the Swiss, who, it was said, came as deliverers and remained as masters, after repulsing a French attempt to rescue Milan in the famous Battle of Novara in 1513 other members of the league were active elsewhere henry the eighth of england anxious to make an impression upon europe carried out an invasion of northern france at the moment when ferdinand was lured from invading the south by the chance of conquering navarre the scots the inveterate allies of the french chose the opportunity to attack england and suffered the great disaster of flodden just after henry had driven the french from guinugat in the battle of the spurs however before long henry and his minister cardinal wolsey convinced of the greed and worthlessness of their allies ferdinand and maximilian came to terms independently with the french henry's young sister mary much against her will became the third wife of louis the twelfth but through keeping late hours and sharing in the unwonted gaiety of the court the elderly bridegroom overtaxed his strength and died three months after the wedding leaving his kingdom to his hot-headed and ambitious cousin and son-in-law francis of angouleme aged twenty who reigned as francis i from fifteen fifteen to fifteen forty seven the new king was bent on losing no time in enforcing his claims as a descendant of valentina visconti upon milan and at the time of his accession the champion and originator of the holy league had already passed away julius the second died in fifteen thirteen having secured for the papal states thereby earning the title of their founder the campagna the march of ancona urbino romagna madena parma and piacenza in the leisure of his strenuous old age the pope gained another title to fame as the patron of bramante michelangelo and raphael and with masterly insight 
Raphael presents him to us in one of his finest portraits. In his scheme to rid Italy of the foreigner, the Pope had, however, signally failed, as the invasion of Italy by Francis I was soon to prove beyond a doubt. The election of the successor of Julius astonished everyone, for the choice fell on Cardinal Giovanni de' Medici, who was not yet forty, and who reigned from 1513 to 1521. To have shared in the changing fortunes of his family seemed to him enough excitement for a lifetime, and he was prepared to settle down as Leo X to an uneventful reign in Rome. Since God has given us the papacy, he is reported to have said, let us enjoy it. Circumstances demanded, however, that he should at once declare himself for or against the coming French invasion, and to save unpleasantness he joined the French in the League against them in turn. To avoid the Swiss, Francis crossed the Alps in 1515 by the difficult pass of the Col d'Argentière, leading the largest army that France had yet sent to Italy. As Swiss infantry were no longer available, their place was supplied by Germans, and forces raised by Pedro Navarra, who had been driven into the arms of the French by Ferdinand's mean refusal to ransom him after the Battle of Ravenna. Maximilian Sforza's defenders, the Swiss, were unfortunately divided against themselves. One party, led by Bern and Fribourg, being ready to retire, while the men of the forest cantons were lured to battle by the prospect of booty. Finally, preceded by the cardinal of Sillon, and dragging with them some small pieces of artillery, the whole body of the Swiss marched out of Milan to encounter the French army encamped near Marignano, on ground that was intersected by ditches and small canals. 1515. Francis, lined with his German Lanskenechts, the causeway by which the Swiss must approach, and stationed Navarro with the big guns in a strong position close by. The Swiss, hoping to carry the day by furious charges of the kind which have played so large a part in our own highland warfare, hurled themselves upon their sworn foes, the Lansconecks. The situation was saved by the king in person, who led a brilliant cavalry charge to rescue his guns from falling into the hands of the Swiss. They fought on confusedly till the setting of the moon, about eleven o'clock, plunged the field in darkness, when they lay down to rest where they stood. All night long, however, the French trumpets and the Swiss horns sounded, indicating reformation of the troops, and at dawn the French appeared in a stronger position than before. In three divisions the Swiss advanced upon the French center and wings, but they failed to dislodge the main body of the enemy. The cry of San Marco announced the arrival of the Venetian vanguard under Alviano, and being caught in the flank by the French artillery, the Swiss gave the signal for retreat, carrying with them their wounded and leaving seven thousand dead upon the field. The defeat was a mortal blow to their military reputation. Never again were they to play an independent and decisive part in European warfare. The causes of the sudden downfall of this hitherto invincible infantry are not far to seek. Their only idea of fighting, said Machiavelli, is to receive the enemy on their pike points. Their victories were in truth soldiers' battles, and their want of generalship and prejudice in the face of modern military methods against the use of artillery rendered even their valor of no avail the french losses at marignano were also heavy trivulzio whose eighteenth big engagement this was pronounced it a battle of giants in comparison with which all the others were child's play francis had covered himself with glory and on the scene of victory received the honor of knighthood from bayard the knight without fear without reproach Milan opened its gates to the conqueror in 1515, and Maximilian Sforza, surrendering all his claims to Francis, retired contentedly into private life in France. Leo X hastened to come to terms. Francis took the Florentine Republic under his protection, promising to support the Medici. 
the pope gave up parma and piacenza to milan but skilfully dissuaded francis from carrying out his intention of conquering naples a fief it will be remembered of the holy see the king and pope being made friends proceeded to destroy the liberties which the pragmatic sanction of bourges had confirmed to the french church henceforth by the concordat of 1516 the king dispensed all the patronage of the sees and monastic communities while the pope confirmed the royal appointments in return for the restoration of first fruits to the holy see in every sense the french church ceased to be the national guardian of liberties these proceedings of francis in italy had alarmed ferdinand who hoped to make his grandson and heir charles a match for the french by bequeathing to him the entire spanish monarchy the young king upon his accession in fifteen sixteen concluded the treaty of noyon with france the french were to keep milan the spaniards naples venice the only ally of france recovered verona from the emperor who accepted the treaty a little later all the possessions of which the republic had been robbed by the league of cambrai were now restored to her the swiss and the english also came to terms with france the former concluding at fribourg an everlasting peace which actually outlived the french monarchy fifteen eighteen the english surrendered their recent capture tournay thus the year fifteen eighteen saw a general peace in europe and even a fantastic scheme of union between the western powers against the turk it was at least to prove a welcome breathing space between two long and weary periods of war End section thirteen of europe in renaissance and reformation by mary a hollings this librivox recording is in the public domain read by pamela nagami chapter six the rivalry of charles v and francis i the general peace of fifteen eighteen left francis i at the height of his fame success fired his ambition into disastrous rivalry with charles a rivalry which the character and position of each made almost inevitable francis was the elder dashing irresponsible frivolous and vain of his military reputation charles was as yet an inexperienced boy but serious persevering and much more resolute than francis to become the first sovereign in europe in war and peace and wherever their dominions lay their interests clashed to the little kingdom of navarre francis was ready to assert the claims of his kinsman d'albret who it will be remembered had been driven out by ferdinand the catholic in italy the two kings disputed the right to both milan and naples charles already represented the aragonese claims to naples and on his election to the empire revived the imperial claim to milan while francis was heir to the house of orleans in milan and to the house of anjou in naples charles was actually in possession of naples and francis of milan and each coveted the other's landmark it has been said that at first the centre of gravity of charles's policy was neither german nor even spanish but burgundian he aimed in fact at recovering the duchy of burgundy and the sum towns which had been torn from the duchess mary his grandmother by louis the eleventh on the other hand francis regarded flanders and artois as french fiefs and charles in return pretended to consider provence and dauphine imperial fiefs and as if there were not enough cause for hostility there was added the stimulus of the contest for the imperial crown at maximilian's death in fifteen nineteen the election was keenly contested by the two chief candidates charles and francis for henry the eighth soon withdrew in favour of francis was his military reputation pointing him out as the coming champion of europe against the turk the support of the pope and the electors on the rhine and his position as leader of the independent states of europe against those united under the austro-spanish house 
but charles was a german and a Habsburg, and his family had now worn the imperial crown for eighty-one years in succession the elector frederick of saxony declared for him after declining the crown for himself and the famous knight franz von sickingen at the head of forces of the schwabian league was prepared to draw the sword for charles money was poured out like water on both sides but eventually the contest was decided by german feeling in charles's favour on his election in june 1519 he took the title not of the king of the romans but of emperor elect the ceremony over charles and francis both set themselves to secure henry the eighth as an ally henry received the emperor at canterbury paraded himself with francis on the field of the cloth of gold and on his return journey met charles again at gravelines when no doubt they came to an understanding the pope who had been wavering between the rival attractions of charles and francis as allies decided that charles had most to give since he might restore parma and piacenza to the holy see expel the french from milan replace francesco sforza on the throne and unite with the pope in crushing the reform movement under luther in germany in fifteen twenty two war broke out between charles and francis it was fated to last until fifteen fifty nine and the first of its five periods ends in fifteen twenty five with the battle of pavia the two opening campaigns in navarre and the netherlands were uneventful except for the wound received by ignatius loyola at the siege of pampeluna which was destined to become the turning point in his career the real business of the war began as usual in italy where the combined papal and imperial forces drove the french army under lautrec out of milan repulsing an attempt on his part to regain it by a crushing defeat at ricocca francesco sforza was duly restored in the duchy and the delight of leo x at recovering parma and piacenza was so unbounded that he is said to have died from joy the only purpose of his life had been artistic and he is chiefly to be remembered for his patronage of men of genius and learning notably of raphael easy going toward himself and others he was so blind to realities that the great religious crisis to which germany was hastening scarcely even caused him uneasiness the conclave passed over wolsey for charles v's flemish tutor adrian of utrecht who had proved himself unequal to his position as regent of spain austere pious earnest and totally without artistic sympathies he was the greatest contrast to his medici predecessor but adrian the sixth failed to satisfy one single section of the roman community and a placard posted on his doctor's door at the time of the pope's death in fifteen twenty three expressed the thanks of the senate and the people of rome for their country's deliverance henry the eighth on behalf of wolsey and charles were keenly interested in the next election but feeling was strongly against a foreigner and giulio de medici whose father giuliano had fallen in the pazzi conspiracy was easily elected with the title clement the seventh fifteen twenty three to fifteen thirty four much was hoped from the new pope his life was respectable and his views moderate his ecclesiastical career had been generally successful and he was in sympathy with the artistic tastes of the time unfortunately as pope he proved neither independent nor decided he was swayed alternately by his two confidants one of whom was attached to the emperor's interests the other to those of francis such a policy was certain to end in treachery to one or the other party and as will be seen to expose the pope to extreme humiliation and disaster the campaign in italy it will be remembered opened badly for the french and events in france also turned to the emperor's advantage charles of montpensier the greatest subject of francis had been estranged from the court 
by claims which the king and his mother Louise of Savoy asserted to his great inheritance. Louis the Twelfth had allowed the Bourbon lands to pass to Suzanne of Bourbon when the male line had failed, and on her marriage with Charles of Montpensier, her husband took the title of Duke of Bourbon. When, however, Suzanne died childless in 1521, Francis and Louise respectively asserted the royal rights and the claims of next of kin to the great Bourbon estates. Whereupon the Duke of Bourbon offered his services to the emperor and escaped into Burgundy. Francis was detained at home by this misfortune, and the army led by Bonnevay into Italy was soon forced to retreat under the conduct of Bayard, his second in command. At his post of danger, protecting the vanguard, Bayard was mortally wounded, though he succeeded in conveying his troops safely out of Italy. Excited by their recent success, the imperialists under Bourbon and Pescara invaded Provence and besieged Marseille. The town, however, had been put into a good state of defence and nothing was achieved. The imperialists retreated into Italy with Francis hard upon their heels. The two armies reached Milan almost together, and the disheartened imperial troops, feeling unequal to a pitched battle after abandoning Milan itself, threw a garrison under de Leva into Pavia. The position of things looked hopeful for Francis, but he made two bad blunders in refraining from a prompt attack on the disorganized enemy and in detaching part of his troops for service in Naples. He then turned aside and blockaded Pavia, and in January 1525 the imperial army, having recovered itself, arrived to attack the besiegers. A third interested party was the Pope, who, convinced of the probable success of Francis, had thrown over his alliance with Charles for a secret understanding with France. The dawn of February 24th, 1525, the Emperor's 25th birthday, broke clear and cold upon the imperialist army breaching the park walls of Mirabello, once the scene of the light-hearted gaieties of the Milanese court, and now occupied by the French entrenchments. The attempt of the imperialists to file past the enemy and to join hands with de Leva and the garrison in Milan was frustrated by the deadly fire of the French artillery, and the former were forced into a direct attack. From that moment the battle was so fierce and so confused that accounts of it are difficult to reconcile. The shock of the French cavalry charge led by Francis was so overwhelming that the king cried out, Today I will call myself Duke of Milan. But Pescara coolly reformed his troops. The Lansconecs in French pay, who formed the right wing, were mowed down by a merciless fire, and the centre met with a like fate from the deadly accuracy of the Spanish arquebusiers. The Swiss, surrounded on all sides, gave way and fled. Francis, supported by the flower of his chivalry, desperate with the resolution of men who will not retreat nor surrender nor survive disaster, flung himself upon the enemy's cavalry in Arcbusier. Pescara was now in touch with the Leva from Pavia, and he rallied his generals round him for a final fight. Amid the devastation of the royal bodyguard, the king's horse fell under him, and angrily declining to surrender to Bourbon, Francis I yielded his sword to the viceroy of Naples. Ten thousand French soldiers lay dead upon the field, among them heroes of every fight upon Italian soil during a quarter of a century. All is lost save life and honor, wrote Francis to his mother, and indeed the enthusiasm for their captive shown by the victorious soldiers is witness to the valor displayed by the king on that fatal day. With great composure, Charles received in Spain the news of this astonishing victory. It seemed as if Europe lay at his feet. Yet its results were very far from fulfilling expectations. Henry the Eighth urged Charles to join him in invading France, proposing that the emperor should wed his daughter Mary and succeed to the French throne. Charles offended Henry by declining the offer, 
and Wolsey had already a grudge against the emperor for failing to secure him the papacy at either of the last two elections. A French alliance was not generally popular in England, but to redress the European balance it had become necessary, though it was not definitely concluded until 1527. Meanwhile, Charles was irresolute as to the terms he should impose, and Francis was removed to Spain to await his pleasure. Captivity and loss of his accustomed exercise preyed upon Francis's health, until Charles suddenly realized that there was a danger of his prisoners slipping through his fingers. News from Italy hastened his decision. Fear of the emperor's supremacy had driven the pope and the leading states to support the French. The imperialist army was clamoring for pay. From his best general, Pescara, sick unto death, came a last message urging Charles to make peace with France if he hoped to save Italy. The outcome of these considerations was the Treaty of Madrid, 1526. 1. Francis agreed to surrender Burgundy, his feudal rights over Flanders and Artois, and all Italian claims, and to abandon his late allies, notably d'Albre and the Duke of Gelderland. 2. The Duke of Bourbon was to recover his wife's inheritance. 3. Charles's sister Eleanor, the widowed Queen of Portugal, was to marry Francis. 4. The two little sons of Francis were to remain in Spain as hostages until the treaty should be fulfilled. Francis swore upon the Gospels and on his knightly word to fulfill it, but in his own and contemporary opinion, he was as soon as free, absolved from his promise on the ground of compulsion. He at once declared against the treaty and joined the League of Cognac with the Pope, Florence, Venice, and Sforza to drive Charles from Italy. The second period of the Italian War consequently began, 1525 to 1529. The League, however, showed itself lukewarm in waging it. The imperialists captured the fortress of Milan and expelled Sforza. The arrival of 6,000 Spanish troops and 8,000 Germans, mostly Lutherans under Freundsberg, a declared enemy of the Pope, fulfilled an unusually candid prophecy of the emperors before the Battle of Pavia, I shall go to Italy to obtain my own and to take my revenge on those who may have wronged me, especially on that villain Pope. Who knows but some day Luther may become a man of value. It must not be supposed, however, that Charles foresaw what actually occurred. Yet while the Pope showed himself irritatingly irresolute, the German and Spanish troops were pressing with ever greater insistence for their arrears of pay. At Milan the two armies united and were soon manifestly out of hand. They demanded to be led to Rome. In the heat of argument, Freudsberg was seized with apoplexy, and Bourbon resigned himself to circumstances. The mutinous forces marched on Rome, and at the second assault the city was at their mercy. Bourbon was shot in the act of scaling the walls, and his death left his starving and utterly uncontrolled troops face to face with the undefended wealth and treasures of the Eternal City, 1527. The horrors of the eight days sack that followed exceeded all the outrages Rome had ever suffered from Gaul or Vandal. About 4,000 people perished in the capture. Cardinals, writes a witness, bishops, friars, priests, old nuns, infants, ladies, pages, servants, the poorest of the poor, were tormented with unheard-of cruelties, often three times over, first by the Italians, then by the Spaniards, afterwards by the Lance Knights. The Spanish soldiers showed themselves most brutal and cunning in hiding their plunder, the Germans were the most irreligious and prodigal of their booty, the Italians the most refined in their cruelty. Arrayed in vestments of silk and brocade, the mad soldiery robbed and feasted, stabling their beasts in the churches, tearing nuns from the shelter of their convents, holding the richest cardinals to ransom and exacting payment by torture. 
it was nine months before the prince of orange who had nominally succeeded bourbon dared to take up his command the pope escaped not a moment too soon from the vatican to the impregnable fortress of st angelo and as all help from the league failed he was obliged to come to terms with charles he was chiefly distressed by tidings from florence of the expulsion of his family and the restoration of the republic the news of the sack of rome was received with universal horror in europe that the armies of the catholic king should ruin and plunder the capital of christendom caused a revulsion of feeling against charles which had practical results henry the eighth openly declared for france lautrec set out with a new french army to reconquer milan and was presently master of all the duchy but the capital still held by the dauntless de leva andrea doria the great genoese admiral who was as it has been well said in himself almost a european power joined france and set up in genoa the party favourable to her cause the war between charles and francis broke out again in fifteen twenty eight the two rulers exchanging a challenge to single combat which was not however followed up the imperialist position in italy rapidly became alarming practically all that remained to charles was the two capitals milan and its starving garrison held by de leva and naples held by orange and blockaded by doria's fleet and lautrec's army charles was at his wit's end for succour he had no money and his brother ferdinand who had so often proved his right hand in difficulties had been elected to the hungarian throne on the downfall of the jagalon family on the fatal field of mohach in 1526 the new king was defending his throne against a formidable rival john sopolia and his kingdom against the advance of solomon the magnificent the conqueror of mohach field yet as once before light dawned for the imperialists when all seemed darkest francis offended doria by haggling over money matters and by encouraging at genoa's expense the commercial aspirations of savona a neighbouring port the admiral offered his services to charles at the price of the freedom and independence of the genoese republic and the offer was accepted suddenly the genoese squadrons off naples hoisted the imperial colours provisions were thrown into the town and the french army was forced to raise the siege in the north genoa now lay as a barrier on the direct route between france and italy the armies of the league made a last effort to take milan but were beaten by de leva at the small but very decisive battle of landriano both parties ardently desired peace and as charles and francis since the affair of the duel were not on speaking terms the negotiations were entrusted to charles's aunt margaret ruler of the netherlands and louise the mother of francis the result was the peace of cambrai also known as the ladies peace in fifteen twenty nine it was a repetition of the treaty of madrid with two differences the immediate cession of burgundy to charles was no longer insisted upon and the little princes were to be redeemed from captivity by a money payment francis and eleanor proceeded to celebrate their marriage eight years of warfare had left spain unquestioned ruler of italy milan and naples were under her direct government the pope and florence were in a sense subject allies charles visited italy for the first time in fifteen twenty nine to view his new possessions and to receive the iron crown of italy and the imperial crown of rome at the pope's hands the ceremony however took place at bologna for the pressure of german events did not allow time for a journey to rome this the last italian coronation of a roman emperor was a military pageant conspicuous by the presence of imperialist soldiers of three nations and of the hero of the milanese defence old gaudi valiant de leva charles received the homage of sforza for milan and yielded to the pope's demand for the restoration of his family in florence as the florentines declined to have the medici on any terms even as private citizens 
the city underwent at the hands of the Prince of Orange a ten months' siege. It was fortified by Michelangelo and heroically defended by Machiavelli's militia. Orange was killed during the siege, but Florence was obliged to surrender, and except as ruler in 1530 the worthless Alessandro de' Medici, the Pope's cousin, who was married to Margaret, an illegitimate daughter of Charles. It must be admitted that the fortune of war had favoured Charles, but his success was due also to his own dogged persistence and to the great ability of those who served him. His generals invariably rose to the occasion, and the soldiers caught something of the spirit of their leaders. Francis had no such commanders as Pescara, de Leva, Lanois, Bourbon, and Orange had proved themselves. He had, moreover, an unfortunate knack of offending powerful supporters at a critical moment. And though he was not harassed as Charles was by eternal want of pence, his lack of steady purpose must have influenced others, and must have told in the end upon the issue of the war. Section 14 of Europe and Renaissance and Reformation by Mary A. Hollings. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 7. The Reformation. Part 1. Renaissance and Reformation are words commonly enough used, but a clear understanding is needed of their meaning in relation to each other. They are alike the outcome of the spirit of intellectual activity that quickened Europe in the fifteenth century. This new spirit first made itself felt in Italy, and across the ages it communicated with and became mastered by the kindred spirit of Greek civilization. So for the most part, the Italian Renaissance was pagan, classical, and artistic. By the failure of Savonarola's movement, we can measure the slight extent of religious revival in Italy. Upon the German mind, this spirit of inquiry had a different effect. Italian civilization was older than Christianity, but to the Teutonic world, civilization had come through Christianity. Though the German mind was slower, it was more earnest and religious than the Italian. When, therefore, later than in Italy, the spirit of inquiry took hold upon it, and as in Italy, stirred it to its depths, it was not pagan, but Christian thought, as expressed by the fathers of the church, that came uppermost. So we understand the important part played by the theology of St. Augustine in the German Reformation. In Italy, criticism applied itself to literature and the arts. In Germany, to religion. We may take the great scholar Erasmus, whose translation of the New Testament into Latin appeared in 1516, as typical of the Renaissance movement in Germany. He was linked to it by his learning and to the Reformation by his sympathies, though he was too broad-minded and perhaps also too timid to make a reformer. The new intellectual movement in Germany took a religious form for several other reasons. The close connection between the Catholic Church and the Holy Roman Empire had made Germany the greatest sufferer from the exactions and tyranny of the Holy See. With the rise of the state system in the empire, the all-embracing papal authority was irreconcilable, and the great variety of the states made it almost certain that somewhere among them the reform doctrines would take root. In every way, Germany was prepared by her past to be the leader of a revolt, which should be at once religious, national, and social. The doctrine of justification by faith, the financial burden of indulgences, and the shortcomings of the clergy, combined to produce the religious movement. The condition of the peasants caused a social insurrection, and papal interference with justice and taxation had to answer for the national movement led by the princes. The hour produced the man, and the man was Martin Luther. In medieval Christendom, church and state were so closely bound up together that acceptance of the Reformation by an individual meant also a revolt against the state, while its acceptance by a state meant revolt from the European system. Thus England, Denmark, and Sweden, 
following the lead of their kings, put themselves outside the pale of the general community, and in these countries the movement was favorable to the monarchy. In Germany, after a weary struggle, it was settled in favor of the princes and nobles as against the monarchy, and the same nearly happened in the strife between the Scots lords of the congregation and their sovereign. In France, however, Calvinism allied itself at different times with aristocratic and republican movements against the crown. In Holland, it upset one monarchy and set up another, and in certain German states, it took the part of monarchy against republicanism. Whether for a nation or an individual, acceptance of the Reformation at first meant isolation, and self-chosen isolation generally means some degree of courage, and among Luther's many gifts, courage was perhaps the greatest. Martin Luther, 1483-1546, to was the son of a Thuringian miner and born at Eisleben in 1483. His parents were simple, pious people, who brought up their children strictly. The boy Martin was intended to be a lawyer, but in the midst of his studies at Erfurt, religious doubt and despair drove him suddenly into the Augustinian convent. There he at last found conviction and peace in the study of the Bible and the writings of St. Augustine, particularly in the doctrine that men are justified in God's sight, not by works, but by simple faith. The elector of Saxony, anxious to secure the best teachers for his new university of Wittenberg, appointed Luther professor of theology. Before taking up his duties, he paid a visit to Rome, which revealed to him the true state of affairs in the capital of Christendom. Through his success in lecturing and preaching, Luther had already become a force in Wittenberg, when in 1517 a monk named Tetzel came round selling indulgences in aid of the building fund of the new St. Peter's at Rome. The practice of the church allowed indulgences to be obtained as from a kind of spiritual bank in which were accumulated the good works of all the faithful. The shortcomings of sinners could be made good by drawing, with the Pope's authority, upon this inexhaustible treasury in return for some act of penitence. By degrees, however, money payments took the place of these penances, and the system became at last a recognized means of raising funds for any ecclesiastical object. In Tetzel's hands this doctrine of indulgences became a mere matter of commercial dealing, and Luther's wrath was aroused by the error which was being sown among his flock. On All Saints' Day, 1517, he nailed to the door of the university church ninety-five theses or headings on the subject of indulgences, challenging Tetzel to a discussion. With this famous act began the first stage in the Reformation. Leo X appointed Dr. Eck to meet Luther at Leipzig. The discussion was chiefly important in arousing interest in Luther, and encouraged by the sympathy of his countrymen, he published a series of pamphlets, in one of which he appealed to the Christian nobility of the German nation to rally together against Rome. Thus Luther advanced rapidly from his original attack on indulgences to a position from which he proceeded to reject the authority of the Pope, and finally even the doctrine of the Roman Church. Leo X, who had been at first inclined to make little of the German movement, was roused at last to publish a bull of excommunication against the truculent reformer. Luther's reply was an act of open defiance. He publicly burned the bull at Wittenberg in 1520. Intense national feeling stirred Germany to the depths. All eyes were turned to the new emperor, who in the midst of this mighty agitation was about to make his first appearance in the country, neither understanding nor sympathizing with its vital needs, its hopes and fears. The Pope urged Charles to publish the ban of the empire against Luther, and though inclined to condemn him unheard, the emperor gave way to the force of public opinion and summoned the reformer to Worms. At that famous diet, the fate of Germany, it is not too much to say, hung in the balance. 
here were problems religious constitutional social and economic foreign and political awaiting solution and first in importance and difficulty was the religious problem luther's journey to worms had been as that of a hero conquering and to conquer but when first confronted with the emperor and princes nervousness made him appear ineffective this man will never make a heretic of me said charles in reply to the question whether he would retract the opinions expressed in his writings he asked for time to consider his answer on the next evening it was ready in plain and vigorous terms luther boldly declared himself unable to recant unless convinced by scripture or clear argument against conscience he could not act the audience was over as he left the hall luther lifted his hand the signal of a lanzknecht who had delivered a telling stroke next morning charles read to the princes his decision to stake upon this cause all his dominions his friends his body and blood his life and soul proceedings against luther must no longer be delayed and he was ordered to quit worms at once he left the city amid the profound sympathy of germany and a fortnight later before his safe conduct had expired he mysteriously disappeared by the order of the elector of saxony he was carried off by an armed band to the wartburg where he could follow events in safety working at his translation of the bible till the danger was over the emperor's decision reads like his honest and unalterable conviction and in face of it it is difficult to condemn him for failing to rise to the height of his great opportunity to unite germany in a national movement if it be granted that charles was an orthodox and devout catholic it is still impossible to deny that time and again he allowed political considerations to outweigh his religious principles at the diet of worms itself his eagerness to condemn luther was due to his desire to secure the alliance of the pope in the coming war with france the attitude of charles to the whole course of the german reformation was determined by political events unconnected with religion for stronger even than his zeal for holy church was his hostility to his rival francis whichever side charles had adopted he could not expect the unanimous support of his subjects in religion but had he identified himself with the national and larger party at least he would have avoided the danger of falling between them both the catholics would have upheld an attempt to reform the abuses of rome and of the clergy the protestants would not have been driven by relentless opposition into a more extreme position of reform a review of charles's dealings with his later diets leads to the conclusion that at worms he sacrificed an opportunity how great a one he was perhaps ignorant not to his unalterable belief but to temporary advantage in comparison with the religious question the other business of the diet flagged in interest but one or two points must be noticed the council of regency which had broken down under maximilian was restored it was to consist of a president four delegates of the emperor's choosing and seventeen sent by the electors and circles of the empire and to deal with general business and the question of alliances in particular during the emperor's absence the imperial chamber under the council supervision was revived as the supreme judicial court representing all interests but those of the towns a general tax was voted but the principle of the common penny levied on every individual was abandoned in favour of the matricular roll on which each state was rated according to its resources charles gave up to ferdinand the south austrian provinces of austria tyrol styria carinthia and carniola to which were added later the schwabian and alsatian territories and württemberg this was the origin of the later division of the habsburg empire between the spanish and german branches of the family the edict of worms issued by the diet against luther was followed by two social outbreaks in germany they were not directly caused by the reformation but the reformation brought all their forces up to fighting point 
they were the knight's war and the peasant's revolt the knight's war fifteen twenty two to fifteen twenty three followed hard upon the crushing blow dealt by the diet of worms to the hopes of political and religious reform its leaders were franz von siekingen a recent supporter of charles at his election the typical german knight of the age an enemy of the peaceful life and his friend ulrich von hutten the trenchant champion of humanism the war itself grew out of a little preliminary feud between von sickingen and the archbishop of treves round whom the lay and ecclesiastical princes rallied when the struggle became general in the district sickingen's castles of eberburg and landstuhl on the rhine crumbled beneath the fire of the enemy artillery and their master fell mortally wounded at landstuhl hutten fled to switzerland to perish sadly a few months later the princes used to the full this opportunity of trampling out the resistance of their ancient foes the knights and with the knights self-condemned for its failure to keep the peace fell the council of regency and the last hope of setting up a representative national government the heralds of the approaching social revolution the peasants revolt fifteen twenty four to fifteen twenty five were a band of popular preachers the prophets of Zwickau, who took up their abode at Wittenberg. Rumors of their extravagances reached Luther in the Wartburg, and he left his retreat to silence and disperse them. Soon, however, they won even greater notoriety as traveling preachers, wandering far into South Germany and preparing the minds of the peasants for revolt, as the Wycliffeite priests had done in England before the rising of 1381 the outbreak began in schwabia in the autumn of fifteen twenty four on the estate of a certain count who compelled his serfs on a holiday to gather snail shells on which to wind the countess's wool everywhere the ecclesiastical lords especially were attacked the peasants drew up the celebrated twelve articles supported by scriptural references and bearing mainly upon the abolition of serfdom the lord's rights of the chase of fishing and of enclosure arbitrary punishments and increase of dues it must be remembered that the peasants were entirely unrepresented and without constitutional means of expressing their very real grievances though not bent on using violence they were driven to it by the utter indifference displayed by their lords to their reasonable demands the schwabian league at once joined hands with the nobles to crush the insolent serfs two bloody battles on the algau and on the danube brought the schwabian rebellion to an end but the movement had already spread north to the neckar where the hasty action of the serfs in putting to death their lord the count of helfenstein drew upon them a terrible vengeance in savage cruelty there was nothing to choose between the lords and serfs in franconia the rising under goetz von berlichingen the robber knight was strongly political in character and actually aimed at strengthening the monarchy on a democratic basis in thuringia on the other hand where the leading spirit was munzer one of the prophets of zwickau religious fanaticism was the chief feature and under the rule of saints most excessive doctrines were put into practice after the battle of frankenhausen in which five thousand of his followers were slain the prophet was executed and the revolt which had spread over nearly all germany save the north was stamped out with the utmost rigour at a cost of about one hundred thousand peasant lives the general result was to make harder the already hard lot of the peasants and to delay their emancipation till the middle of the nineteenth century lack of able leaders of united action and discipline and above all the declared hostility of luther and his party to the movement were the chief causes of its failure the insurgents had laid great stress on the oppression of the lower classes thereby encouraging the growth of democratic ideas but luther saw clearly that the whole future of protestantism was doomed if it once became associated with disorder and he hounded on the nobles in suppressing the outbreak 
from this time forth he learnt to rely on the support of the princes rather than on the national enthusiasm that had surrounded him at worms it has been said that in his attitude to the progress of reform in germany charles allowed himself to be influenced by foreign policy in fact the embarrassments arising out of his relations with francis and with the pope were the strongest allies of the protestant cause to the pope as an italian power fell the task of holding the balance between france and the empire while as a spiritual power his main object was to defeat the plan of a general council with which charles proposed from time to time to settle religious difficulties in germany in the italian wars when charles seemed on the brink of disaster he was often in reality nearest to victory the reverse is true of his experience in germany indeed an italian victory sometimes wrought failure in germany thus after the battle of pavia when the fate of the reformation seemed at his mercy followed the league of cognac which drove charles to consent to the decrees of the first diet of speyer the first measure of toleration that the reformers received it established a temporary settlement in the spirit of the famous compromise cuius regio eius religio which finally closed the struggle at augsburg in other words it left to each prince the power to decide the religion of his own subjects a few years of success for charles in italy resulted in the upsetting of this decision at the second diet of speyer in fifteen twenty nine and the reenactment of the edict of worms this was followed by the formal protest of the reform party the rejection by charles of the statement of the protestant doctrines as drawn up by melancton in the confession of augsburg and the formation of the armed league of schmalkalde by the protestant princes and cities in fifteen thirty one but the turks were threatening vienna and to use force against the reform party was out of the question indeed the protestant princes hailed this chance of showing that protestantism was no enemy of patriotism and even if gratitude for their timely aid had not prevented the emperor from taking action against them his absorption in the difficult business of ferdinand's election as king of the romans had the same effect at the peace of nuremberg it was decreed that no persecution should be permitted until a general council had been assembled and all processes against the protestants in the lately revived imperial chamber should be stopped this arrangement the emperor regarded as merely temporary but since the first diet of speyer luther's bible and hymns had been largely adopted protestant doctrines taught in the schools and monastic revenues used for the endowment of lutheran churches and of education and the protestants expected some recognition of their position at this point charles was called away from germany by italian and spanish affairs and reform went steadily forward invading south germany with the restoration of ulrich of wurttemberg to his duchy the duke had previously been expelled had become a protestant and was reinstated by the league of schmalkalde with the sanction of ferdinand whose attention was urgently claimed for the defence of hungary against the turks not long after changes in the ruling families of brandenburg and albertine saxony ranged those states upon the side of protestantism indeed about fifteen forty the only influential states left to catholicism were austria bavaria the duchy of brunswick and the ecclesiastical electorates of mayence and treves End of section fifteen of europe and renaissance and reformation by mary a hollings this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 7. The Reformation, Part 2. During these years, Charles had been occupied in the third period of the war with France, namely from 1536 to 1538. On the death of Francesco Sforza in 1535, the duchy of milan as an imperial fief was annexed by charles francis who was steeped in intrigue with the pope the league of schmalkalde and even with the turks 
brought forward the claims of France. After a series of unsuccessful campaigns in Provence, Picardy, and Languedoc, Charles was ready to conclude with Francis a ten years' truce at Nice, confirming the Peace of Cambrai. But the investiture of Charles's son Philip with the Duchy of Milan reopened the Italian question, and with war imminent, Charles came to the Diet of Ratisbon to meet the Protestants. It was the most promising opportunity for a union that had occurred since 1526. A reform party led by Cardinals Contarini and Pole had arisen in the Church itself, an agreement on the Lutheran doctrines of justification, redemption, and original sin was actually made. Most unfortunately, however, nothing further was achieved, and the Church lost her opportunity of securing a broad and tolerant reform. To the strong opposition of the zealous Catholics and Luther's inability to believe in the sincere acceptance of the doctrine of justification by Pole's party, was added a general dread of Charles becoming paramount in Germany. When the whole question needed the utmost tact and delicacy in handling, Francis found little difficulty in stirring up discord among the princes. Thus the opportunity for reconciliation was lost. Charles made up his mind to suppress Protestantism by force, yet for the next three years he had to bide his time owing to the fourth outbreak of war with France, lasting from 1541 to 1544. Francis had found allies in Cleves, Scotland, Sweden, Denmark, and Turkey, and had made vain advances to the League of Schmalkalde. Charles, however, secured the support of Henry the Eighth, from whom he had been long estranged by the king's divorce from his aunt Catherine, and by the recent efforts of Henry's great minister Cromwell to unite his master with the princes of the Schmalkaldic League, notably by the marriage with Anne of Cleves. But Catherine and Cromwell were now no more, and Henry was incensed by the invasion of England by James V the ally of France. The campaigns themselves, which were unimportant, were abruptly ended by the Treaty of Caspi, leaving Henry to make his own terms with France. Peace brought to a close the long personal rivalry of Charles V and Francis I. All conquests since the Truce of Nice, 1538, were to be restored. Charles gave up his claims to Burgundy, Francis, his to Naples, Flanders, and Artois. The emperor promised either his daughter or his niece in marriage to Francis's second son, Orléans, with the dowry respectively of the Netherlands or Milan. Orléans' death prevented the fulfillment of the last article. The death of Francis in 1547 prevented anything coming of a secret understanding for the suppression of heresy between the parties to the treaty. France has never found it hard to forgive a king who sinned pleasantly, and this indulgent view, added to his own brilliant deeds of arms, has secured for him a reputation higher than his deserts. In the long rivalry with Charles, it is true that France suffered less than Spain in the empire, but this was due to no merit of the king, and there can be no doubt that the war was from first to last a mistaken policy, which laid the country under a heavy burden of debt. The corruption of the court and of the administration, the sacrifice of the independence of the French church, the increase in the absolute power of the crown, the state interests of a policy that associated Protestant persecutions at home, with Protestant alliances abroad, these evils found poor compensation in a certain shallow attractiveness of character and good service rendered to the cause of art. Even the artistic movement in which the French Renaissance reached its second stage, and which was made famous by the names of the versatile artist Cousin, the sculptor of Goujon, the writer Rabelais, and the borrowed glory of da Vinci and del Sarto, betrays a lack of originality and distinction that indirectly witnesses to the poverty of feeling and the prevailing moral deadness which centred in the Valois court. 
we must now return to germany where charles released from the pressure of foreign affairs by the peace of crespi was ready to deal with the reform movement he succeeded in persuading some of the princes that the existence of the league of schmalkalde threatened the unity of the empire at least as much as that of the church in fact that the question between them was political rather than religious german opinion was ranging itself into two camps in which empire and church were opposed to princes and protestantism just as the movement for reform of the empire under maximilian had ended in leaving the chief power with the princes so it seemed likely that the religious movement too would end it was exactly this result that charles was bent upon preventing in the first place because it would reduce his position in germany to the level of an ordinary prince and secondly because in religion as in his general habit of mind he was conservative in his slow fashion he had come to the conclusion that war could be the only means of settling the religious difficulty but he had never lost sight of that oft threatened general council to which the lutherans were also favourable alarmed at the reconciliation between emperor and king at crespi pope paul the third at last agreed to summon the council of trent in fifteen forty five the death of luther in the following february removed a strenuous advocate of peace and was the signal for the emperor's declaration of war against the schmalkaldic league charles had already been active in attracting to his side protestant princes who were also imperialists among them two from the house of brandenburg hohenzollern and morris of saxony morris had not long succeeded his father duke henry of the albertine line of saxony who had become a convert to the protestant views of the ernestine branch of the family which had befriended luther nominally a protestant himself morris was by no means on good terms with his cousin john frederick keen patriot and protestant whose electorate he coveted personal and political aims with morris stood first and he modelled his career on machiavelli's advice to princes as the league seemed to offer him no special opportunities for a career he threw in his lot with charles on the understanding that the electorate should be handed over to him the emperor struck boldly at the league and overran south germany while the princes withdrew their forces to defend saxony but at the battle of mulberg fifteen forty seven charles captured the elector john frederick and soon after the other leading spirit of the league the landgrave of hesse surrendered to morris both were treated with extreme rigour of imprisonment and morris was duly installed as elector of saxony charles was as usual however prevented from using his victory to the full the pope feared nothing so much as the complete subjection of germany by its emperor and a month before mulberg he took the sudden step of removing the council from trent to bologna thither the imperialists declined to follow the papal party and by remaining at trent created a schism the protestants thereupon declared themselves freed from obedience to the decrees of a divided council in this state of affairs charles had to come to some kind of understanding with the protestants at augsburg until the council should obey his summons to return to trent the interim of augsburg for the most part reasserted catholic doctrine while yielding on certain points of protestant practice such as the marriage of the clergy and lay communion in both kinds its reception however was not cordial various causes about this time tended to make charles unpopular he was succeeding in strengthening his authority in germany with the object of building up a strong military power in which the princes should be utilized as his generals the imperial chamber had become little more than a cabinet selected by the emperor spanish garrisons were gradually being distributed over germany and so little did charles realize the intensity of german feeling against spain that he was urging the election of philip as the next king of the romans 
not only in the face of the strongest opposition of his german subjects but also of his brother ferdinand nothing in the past or present that the dead king of france did against me nor that the present king would like to do has ever pained me so deeply as my brother's behaviour towards me wrote charles to his wise sister mary regent of the netherlands she succeeded in reconciling the brothers but the electors would not hear of philip's succession morris of saxony was influenced by the general suspicions of charles's spanish policy and was affronted by the emperor's treatment of his father-in-law the landgrave of hesse he began to draw away from charles and to formulate a new programme with the object of delivering germany from foreign troops and recovering for the princes the power of which imperial oppression seemed fast to be depriving them to this end he concluded the treaty of friedewald with henry the second of france who like his father francis i found no difficulty in being protestant abroad and catholic at home he also came to some understanding with ferdinand king of the romans whose object was to remove religious questions from politics so as to rally his subjects around him for the defence of hungary against the turks the lull in the ottoman advance that had set in under bajazet mohammed the great's successor had ended at the accession of the vigorous selim i the conqueror of syria and egypt his son Solomon the great was one of the most remarkable rulers of the sixteenth century after capturing rhodes the turks under him advanced once more into hungary took belgrade and overthrew the last jagalon king on mohach field ferdinand on succeeding to his throne found that the turks were masters of the greater part of his kingdom and not until the death of Solomon in hungary forty years later was eastern europe relieved of its fears of the last great warrior sultan the war between the emperor and the princes was not religious for the lutheran party distrusted morris far too deeply to accept him as leader and the great catholic house of bavaria stood aloof which on religious grounds should have deplored charles's defeat a certain religious appearance however was given to the war by the conduct of morris's ruffianly ally albert alcibiades of brandenburg who harried everything but the lands of the church by preference meanwhile charles depressed and inert from a bad attack of gout refused to heed the warnings that reached him of morris's doings he had a big dog in leash john frederick he said to set on morris yet it was morris who acted first and nearly surprised the emperor at innsbruck ill and white as a ghost charles was hurried on a gusty rainy night in a litter over the brenner pass to safety in carinthia by the treaty of passau he came to terms with morris in fifteen fifty two one the captive lutheran princes were to be released two complete liberty of conscience was to be granted to the lutherans who were also to be admitted to the imperial chamber even then charles absolutely refused to give way on the question of full religious toleration until it had been laid before the diet he had set his heart on recovering the three frontier bishoprics of metz toul and verdun already seized by henry the second as the price of his help to morris and confirmed to him by the treaty of Auxelles. the emperor however first came to terms with the ruffian albert god knows he wrote what i feel at seeing myself at such a pass as to treat with the said marquis as i am doing but necessity knows no law albert however earned his sovereign's gratitude by his skill in saving the imperialist guns in the retreat from metz which was successfully defended by francis duke of guise the future conqueror of calais albert then returned to his raids and his flying figure wild fair hair and freckled face became once more a vision of terror to germany until in the interests of public order the army of morris of saxony cut short his excesses in the fierce battle of sieverhausen fifteen fifty three 
Albert fled under the imperial ban to France, but a chance bullet put an end to Morris's checkered and brilliant career, his championship of princely privilege, and his dreams of the imperial crown at the early age of thirty two in 1553. His brother Augustus succeeded in the electorate, and his unfortunate cousin, the good elector, John Frederick, did not survive him many months. Charles had for some time longed to withdraw from the wearisome and perplexing struggle, and with the death of Morris, the downfall of Albert, the failure of his plans for Philip's succession, and the agreement arrived at between Ferdinand and some of the leading Protestants, he judged that the time had come. Moreover, he could not face the necessity of yielding on the religious question, so he left Ferdinand to deal on his own responsibility with the Diet of Augsburg, and setting his face toward the Netherlands, turned his back for ever on Germany. The agreement concluded between Ferdinand and the Diet, which is known as the Peace of Augsburg, 1555, contained the following clauses. 1. It laid down the principle of cuius regio eius religio, that is to say, it left each prince free to dictate the religion of his subjects. 2. All church property appropriated by Protestants before the Treaty of Passau in 1552 was to remain in their hands. 3. No form of Protestantism but Lutheranism was to be tolerated. 4. Lutheran subjects of ecclesiastical states were not to be obliged to renounce their faith. And 5 by the ecclesiastical reservation any ecclesiastical prince on becoming a protestant was to give up his see by this peace it was acknowledged that the unity of the medieval church was broken up for ever and indirectly that medieval persecution was abandoned save in the one form of banishment protestantism was now legally recognized though only in the shape of lutheranism there was to be no toleration of either Calvinists or Swinglians. Worse than this, toleration was only considered from the prince's point of view. The only privilege allowed to the Lutheran subjects of a Catholic prince or to the Catholic subjects of a Lutheran prince was that of finding a home elsewhere. Liberty of conscience did not in fact enter into the question by this means divisions in germany were made deeper until at last the only way of settling them seemed to be by the sword of the thirty years war it was impractical to suppose that while appropriation of church property was still of daily occurrence a settlement could be satisfactory which recognized no transfers made since fifteen fifty two the ecclesiastical reservation opened the way for endless difficulties it was held, for instance, that when a chapter became Protestant, it might elect a Protestant bishop. Had it been strictly enforced, on the other hand, it must have effectively checked the growth of Protestantism. The principle which made the prince the sole authority upon the religion of his state was fatal to the imperial power. The imperial chamber, the organization of circles, the maintenance of the public peace, ceased by this treaty to be under the emperor's control and in each state the position of the prince made it inevitable that the people should transfer their allegiance from the shadowy emperor to the ruler with the real authority charles in the netherlands fully realized the effects of the peace which hastened his resignation his plans for the religious and political unity of germany had failed utterly he was personally unpopular there his cherished scheme of marriage between philip and mary tudor had turned out unhappily the struggle to meet financial embarrassments never abated while henry the second had wrung from him by the treaty of vaucelles more than francis i had ever done by force of arms to his subjects in the netherlands only did he choose to bid a formal farewell since from them alone could he count upon a sympathetic response. In the hall of the Golden Fleece at Brussels, Charles, leaning upon his stick and supported by the young William of Orange, made his last public appearance in 1555. 
both emperor and audience were moved to tears by the simple pathos of his leave-taking in the spring of fifteen fifty six charles resigned the empire the spanish kingdoms and sicily his son philip succeeded to spain the netherlands milan naples and sicily and ferdinand already king of the romans duly followed him in the empire in the autumn of fifteen fifty six charles sailed to spain and at once retired to the monastery of saint just in estremadura here in his little four-roomed retreat he performed his religious exercises received visitors followed the events of the great world and amused himself with mechanical toys in august fifteen fifty eight he died the great emperor charles v used to be a common phrase of historians but it is probable that his greatness was of the kind that position thrusts upon a man in private life charles would not have been remarkable fate had called him to play his part upon a stage that would have dwarfed at any man but the greatest slow irresolute and at the same time very obstinate narrow-minded unsympathetic and limited in his affections he yet compels respect by his honest intentions his sense of duty his modesty and his shining moments of fortitude the coldness of his character is partly redeemed by his love of wife and son his fondness for children pet animals and flowers he was moderate in all his private tastes with one important exception his indulgence in enormous hasty and unwholesome meals early pointed the way to a martyrdom of gout but between its attacks charles remained incorrigible as ever though not highly educated he was well read and genuinely devoted to the fine arts especially to music few men harassed as charles was by continual toil and vexation can have realized more bitterly the experience attributed to king herod that they who grasp the world the kingdom and the power and the glory must pay with deepest misery of spirit End section sixteen of europe and renaissance and reformation by mary a hollings this librivox recording is in the public domain read by pamela nagami chapter eight the counter-reformation part one the council of trent fifteen forty five to fifteen sixty three has been referred to several times during charles v's reign its work must now be considered as a whole to meet the emperor's wishes it was held in german territory pope paul the third fifteen thirty four to fifteen forty nine who has been called the last of the renaissance popes as distinguished from those of the catholic revival at last brought his mind to the formal summons of the council in fifteen forty two so few however were the bishops who arrived to attend it that the assembly was adjourned the chief question before the second meeting of the council in fifteen forty five was whether reform or the definition of dogma should have the first place the pope was a watchful guardian of church privilege he was determined that doctrine should be considered before reform and kept in close touch with the council's proceedings by a compromise it was arranged that they should be considered simultaneously by different sections of the council the moderate catholic party led by contarini and pole were quite prepared to join hands with the lutherans in some matters of doctrine and with this end in view the great questions of justification by faith free will and the sacraments were debated at this point however some members of a hitherto little known order the society of jesus came forward and by their able and determined arguments succeeded in upholding the catholic standpoint at this stage the pope became alarmed by charles's success in germany and with the excuse that a slight outbreak of the plague in trent made the place unsafe he removed the council to bologna in fifteen forty seven charles declined to recognize any further acts of the council the diet of augsburg gave its support to the minority who remained at trent and the interim of augsburg 
provided a temporary settlement of religious affairs in germany the pope found it necessary to give way though he died before any further stage of policy was reached and his successor julius the third fifteen forty nine to fifteen fifty five whose chief aim was to live a quiet life summoned the council to reassemble at trent in fifteen fifty one much discussion of doctrine followed revealing the deep differences which separated protestants and catholics however the untimely descent of morris of saxony in pursuit of charles scattered the members with all speed before a definite decision was made relieving the pope of much anxiety not long after the latter was succeeded by marcellus the second who was upright wise and enthusiastic for reform but he unfortunately only lived three weeks longer his successor was pope paul the fourth fifteen fifty five to fifteen fifty nine the austere and rigid caraffa who had founded the order of the Teatines, a society of parish priests bound by monastic vows and upholding the doctrine and government of the medieval church the new pope was therefore wholly opposed to the more enlightened party of catholic reformers led by contarini and as an interval of ten years occurred in the work of the council after it was dispersed by morris paul the fourth applied himself to the reform of rome itself he thoroughly overhauled the government of the papal states and armed with the powers of the inquisition on one hand and with the new index of prohibited books on the other his orthodox zeal triumphed over the champions of a more tolerant and liberal catholicism yet in attempting to recover from europe a general acknowledgment of the papal claims he defeated his own ends thus he drove elizabeth of england to ally herself with the protestant party in scotland and practically assured the triumph of reform in great britain by insisting that the queen should submit her claims upon the throne to his judgment in the same way his hostility to ferdinand i obliged that emperor to rely on the support of the moderate party with the result that many south german bishoprics passed into protestant hands then in fifteen fifty nine he died and the new pope pius the fourth pledged himself in response to a general wish that reform should not be left entirely to the holy see to summon once more the council of trent at this the third and last session of the council no protestants were present and the reforms undertaken were simply those of the church from within there were many catholics who desired a thorough reform in doctrine and practice but their aims were defeated by the powerful and energetic jesuit opposition thus the use of the mother tongue in services the marriage of the clergy communion in both kinds practices which would have united them to the protestants were all rejected the doctrines of purgatory indulgences and invocation of saints though defined in accordance with medieval belief were for the first time completely defined it is true that on some important questions such as that of justification by faith protestant theories were not entirely excluded but such concession was deceptive since the pope's authority was declared to be supreme in all doctrinal matters in the future the resolve of the french to settle the question of the superiority of councils to the pope and the spanish prejudice in favour of making bishops independent of the holy see were defeated by successful papal diplomacy at the two courts concerned there was however a real reformation in morals the popes undertook to set their house thoroughly in order they gave up the pursuit of family interests and pius v decreed that church property should never be alienated from the holy see the education of the clergy was carefully provided for the breviary and the canon law were revised and the florid church music of the period met with its own much-needed reform at the hands of the great and austere genius palestrina a radical change in the character of the popes enabled them to recover much of their lost influence in europe with the aid of the new order of the jesuits 
and the Inquisition the brain and arm of the papacy. The papal Inquisition, as set up in 1542, is adapted from the system of the Inquisition as formerly worked by the Dominicans in the suppression of heretics, notably of the Albigenses in the 13th century. Having accomplished its work only too well, it would naturally have disappeared had not Ferdinand and Isabella gained leave to introduce it into Spain as a weapon against both Jews and Moors. From this time the Spanish Inquisition, so called because it was after 1497 independent of papal interference, continued to flourish, not without dire results as will be seen before long in the Netherlands. The papal Inquisition, however, which dated from the Council of Trent, confined its attentions to Italy. The second great prop of the Holy See was the Society of Jesus. The founder of this famous order was Ignatius Loyola, the son of a noble Spanish house of Basque origin. As an enthusiastic young soldier, he had been lamed for life at the siege of Pampeluna and had had to renounce his chosen profession of arms. During his slow recovery, he resolved to enlist his services in the cause of Christ and the Virgin, and began his career by a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, which inspired him with the idea of a lifelong warfare against the infidel. Realizing, however, his lack of knowledge, he devoted himself to study in Paris, where he won over to his views three fellow students, Lefebvre, Xavier, and Lainesse. This little band took vows of poverty and celibacy and placed themselves at the Pope's disposal for work among the Mahometans in the Holy Land. Paul III, however, took the view that heretics at home, rather than infidels abroad, needed their labors, and accordingly they formed themselves in 1540 into the Society of Jesus for the special service of Christ and of the Pope, under Loyola as the first general of the order. Every member of the order was bound to surrender all personal judgment and to become as wax in the hands of his superiors. It was the business of those superiors to acquaint themselves intimately by an elaborate spy system with the characters, actions, and thoughts of those whom they directed, that all gifts might be turned to account for the order in the choice of careers. A priest must hold himself in readiness to go to the ends of the earth at the bidding of his superiors, not delaying even to complete the letter of the alphabet he might be writing. The order had six divisions, of which the professed of four vows were the only fully privileged members in whose hands lay the election of the general. They were without a fixed place of abode, and took a fourth vow of obedience to the pope. The order was forbidden to accept ecclesiastical preferment. No monastic habit was worn, nor did the rules of the society permit the powers of mind and body to be worn out by excessive asceticism or long-continued religious exercises. Into the work of education and of missions, the Jesuits threw themselves with the utmost zeal and heroism. They made themselves indispensable as confessors, their learning seated them in the professors' chairs at the universities, they mixed in politics and in society. All their work was performed gratuitously, for the order was enriched not only by the property surrendered to it at admission, but by many gifts bestowed upon it. In sixteen years it numbered over two thousand members. The order has been well named the Brain of the Holy See. It may be imagined how great was the influence of a highly trained body of men, acting with the obedience of perfectly regulated machines, at the bidding of some of the most intellectual and resolute minds of the times. But in the individual it must be admitted that the absolute surrender of private judgment and the acceptance of the doctrine that the end justifies the means tended to undermine independence of character and moral judgment. In summing up the work of the Catholic reaction, the following results will be noticed. The Church, purified of abuses, inspired by new enthusiasm, and carrying the war into the enemy's country, 
encountered protestantism at a time when its first zeal was spent and disunion had begun to appear the revived papacy made rome once more the centre of southwestern europe as it had been under the roman emperors and once more brought under its sway the recently revolted regions on the danube and the rhine at the same time in the political world two great agencies of the catholic revival were the spanish monarchy under philip the second and france under the influence of the guises in the reign of philip the second fifteen fifty six to fifteen ninety eight the aims and methods of revived catholicism are fully illustrated the king regarded himself as the divinely appointed leader of the chosen people whose dominion of the world was to be the guarantee of its recovery to the church not one of the many disasters that marked his ill-starred reign ever shook philip's faith in his twofold mission as champion of the church and of spanish supremacy yet like a blight his reign rests upon the history of spain he crushed all power of initiative in the court and in the nation at large the king's family heritage was one of gloom and bigotry the slow secret and cautious policy which was his by circumstances and education hid him like a mask even from those nearest to him he grew old before his time in trying to keep pace with the thousand petty details which are the proper business of subordinates no clerk ever toiled more industriously at his papers hours were passed in making marginal notes on affairs that might have been settled in conversation lasting perhaps as many minutes but philip shunned interviews he never realized that statesmanship is the most human of occupations based on a knowledge of men in a world of men he clung to his purposes blind to things as they really were conscientious as far as his cruel bigotry allowed he strove to grapple unaided with problems too big for him to solve cold except to the very few for whom he felt any affection frugal and secluded in his habits constantly disillusioned throughout his reign yet never turning aside from the goal he had marked out for himself there is something of the relentlessness of fate about this mysterious inhuman figure in whose service men broke their hearts and sacrificed their lives yet at the end of a long reign as he lay slowly dying in great bodily anguish no visions of the persecuted and oppressed arose to disturb his mind which indeed was sustained and comforted by the thought of services he had rendered to god by a freak of fortune philip's reign opened with a collision with the pope paul the fourth the neapolitan carafa had family leanings to the angevin cause in italy and disliked the spaniard as julius the second had called in the house of aragon to drive out the french he determined to call in the french to drive out the house of aragon henry the second agreed to send an army under the duke of guise and the duke of alva of all men found himself in the position of leader of his catholic majesty's army against the pope fifteen fifty six to fifteen fifty nine by bribing ottario farnese with piacenza and cosmo de medici grand duke of tuscany with siena philip gained their support in naples where the war was marked by the gallant resistance of civitella to guise and in the papal states alva carried all before him and but for religious scruples might indeed have taken rome the pope was obliged to come to terms but they were of his own choosing and in philip's name alva asked and received absolution in 1557 for the crime of resisting an unprovoked attack meanwhile war had broken out on the northeastern border of france and philip the second had prevailed upon his english wife mary tudor in spite of an express understanding to the contrary to engage english troops on his behalf the spanish and english forces were under the command of the dispossessed duke of savoy who claimed his duchy from france the blunders of the marshal montmorency gave them a complete victory at saint-quentin 
and the town itself, though bravely defended by Coligny, fell into their hands. They would have been better employed in taking Paris, but this enterprise, though it had every chance of success, did not commend itself to the cautious Philip. Early in 1558, Guise more than avenged the defeat by falling unexpectedly on Calais, of whose weak defences the English government had repeatedly been warned, and thus the last English stronghold on French soil was lost to the great grief of Queen Mary. A brilliant victory won by Count Egmont over the French at Gravelines had no practical result, though it may have enabled Philip to make peace. Proceedings were somewhat delayed by the death of Queen Mary and Elizabeth's reluctance to accept the terms. In 1559, at the Treaty of Cateau Cambrecy, she agreed at last to the surrender of Calais for a term of eight years. The Duchy of Savoy was restored to its duke. France retained the three bishoprics taken by Henry II, but gave up all other conquests except five Piedmontese fortresses, and Philip in return surrendered his captures in Picardy. By this arrangement, Philip, however, recovered far more than he lost. Henry and Philip agreed to summon a general council and to root out heresy in their dominions. Philip was to take as his third wife Henry II's daughter Elizabeth, the girl princess who had been bespoken for Don Carlos his son, while the Duke of Savoy was to marry her aunt, Margaret of Valois. At a tournament held in honor of the two weddings, Henry II, distinguished rather as an athlete and pleasure-seeker than for more kingly qualities, was in a final bout pierced in the eye by a lance, and the wound proved fatal. His son Francis II, husband of Mary, Queen of Scots, succeeded him. End Section 17 of Europe and Renaissance and Reformation by Mary A. Hollings. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 8 The Counter Reformation, Part 2. The Treaty of Cateau Cambrecy marks the end of a period for three reasons. It closed the series of wars which for nearly forty years had exhausted France and Spain. It ended the struggle between France and the united Habsburg power, for henceforth Spain and Austria are divided. For the rest of the century, the wars of Europe are mainly religious rather than political. Even before the treaty was signed, Philip had begun to deal with the religious question in his Spanish dominions, where he took up his residence in 1559. Charles V, in a long reign, must have spent years merely in travelling between Spain, the Netherlands, Germany, and Italy. But Philip never quitted Spain again before his death in 1598. Protestantism had not gained any hold upon the country during Charles's reign, but since Philip's accession, its growth had been rapid, and the Pope urged the king to call the Inquisition to his aid. It was worked mainly by the Dominican order, which was devoted to royal interests. The head of the Council of the Inquisition was the Grand Inquisitor, nominated by the king, and Philip found the council a valuable ally in politics. All lands confiscated by its decrees fell to the crown, and no man, however privileged, was exempt from its jurisdiction. It was therefore useful in hunting down political offenders and in exacting money. The terror inspired by the Inquisition was due to the suddenness of its arrests, to the secrecy of its trials, and to a spy system which worked its way into the most intimate secrets of family life, filling the air with suspicion and a sense of insecurity. The prisoner was often ignorant of both the charge and the evidence against him, and confession was exacted by torture. If loss of goods and imprisonment did not bring him to repentance, he was handed over to the secular arm to be burned at one of the autos de fe, which took place as bullfights do now at every national festival. The methods of the Holy Office in Spain were completely successful in destroying Protestantism. 
Philip could congratulate himself that not a heretic remained in his kingdom. Yet, in crushing Protestantism, he also crushed all power of independent thought, leaving Spain far in the rear of European intellectual progress. In the same way, the commercial prosperity of the country was choked by the persecution of the industrious Moriscos, the real source of the industrial wealth of Spain. These people were at least outwardly converted Moors, who were successful farmers and craftsmen. The attitude of the Spaniards toward them at its best was but that of an armed neutrality, and a change of affairs in the Mediterranean soon aroused an active hostility. In the first place, the onslaughts of the Barbary pirates, their kinsmen, provoked two expeditions against the former, which met with only moderate success, and in the second, another great Mahometan power, the Turks, in 1565, laid siege to Malta, which was relieved, somewhat grudgingly, and only just in time, by the Viceroy of Naples. The outcome of these struggles with the infidel was a series of edicts against all the most cherished national customs of the Moriscos, so outrageous as to provoke remonstrance even from the Spanish nobles. The Moriscos then broke into rebellion in 1568, set up a king of their own, and took a cruel revenge upon all Christians in their power. Even at this point, a policy of conciliation would probably have succeeded, but Philip preferred to enter upon a war of extermination. Men, women, and children were mercilessly slain, prisoners were massacred in cold blood, and when the back of the rebellion was broken, all the surviving Moriscos were forced to leave Andalusia in 1570 and find new homes in less favored parts of Spain until their final expulsion from the country in 1609. The thankless task of crushing the last signs of the rebellion had fallen to Philip's young and brilliant half-brother, Don Juan of Austria, the prince who had every quality that Philip lacked, including that of military prowess, had unusual power of attracting loyalty and enthusiasm. He begged Philip, when the rebellion had just subsided, to accept a pressing invitation from the Pope to rescue Cyprus, then surrounded by an Ottoman fleet. The timid policy of Selim II had preferred an attack upon Cyprus to the alternative of an attack on Spain, and by so doing united against himself the forces of Venice, of Philip II, and the Pope. Great preparations were accordingly made, but not in time to save the island, whose heroic commander was flayed alive by the Turks. Don Juan succeeded in infecting his crusaders with his own fervid enthusiasm, and with the confidence of youth led the attack in opposition to the advice of older heads, against the Turkish fleet in 1571 in the Bay of Lepanto, the scene ages before of the great sea fight of Naupactus. The Turkish ships were unseaworthy and manned by slaves. Although considerably outnumbered, the Christian fleet was irresistible in its onset. Not only were the Turks for the first time defeated at sea, but their naval power in the Mediterranean never recovered from the blow, and this disaster hastened the general decline in their power which had already set in. The Ottoman Empire rested upon military foundations entirely, and as long as strict discipline prevailed it was irresistible in war. But after the death of Solomon the Magnificent in 1566, the chief supports of its power began to give way. The sultans gave themselves up to luxury and pleasure, the janissaries, from being the obedient tools of the sultan, became as arrogant as the praetorian guard at Rome. Lastly, corruption found its deadly way into every department of official life. In Persia, in the Balkans, and in Hungary they were losing ground, and the defeat at Lepanto, besides being significant of the state of things, had a great moral effect. Don Juan's head was filled with dreams of retaking Constantinople, and driving the infidel from the Mediterranean. Though prompt action might have achieved much, 
the deadly procrastination which characterized Spanish policy of the time proved fatal. Don Juan sailed for Africa and reduced Tunis, which he hoped to make the capital of an African kingdom of his own. But this plan at once aroused Philip's jealousy. Supplies from Spain ceased, and in a few months the Turks recovered Tunis and also took Goleta, one of Charles V's African conquests. It was in the Netherlands, however, where the methods of the Inquisition had a very different reception from that which they met with in Spain, that Philip's antagonism to religious reform was most remorseless. At the same time, the attempt to override local privileges and to make Spanish authority supreme contributed almost equally to the revolt of the provinces, which will be more fully described in the next chapter. Philip's religious zeal was goaded to continual effort by the belief that the displeasure of heaven manifested itself in his family life. He lost three wives in succession, and the death of the third, the exquisite and beloved Elizabeth of Valois, was a grief only second to the anguish of mind Philip endured on account of the tragic state of his only son. Carlos was the son of Philip and his first wife, Mary of Portugal. He had never known a mother's care, and his education by his aunt had done little for the defects of a very difficult character. The boy was cruel, irreverent, and passionate, and a fall on his head at the age of seventeen seems to have permanently injured his brain. There can be little doubt that he was epileptic, and his conduct after the accident became more violent and extraordinary. He insulted the court ladies, made murderous attacks on Alva and Don Juan, plotted against his father's life, and tried to escape from Spain. By Philip's orders he was put under restraint, and his guardians were men of rank, carefully instructed as to his treatment. Politics and literature, except religious books, were forbidden, as was all communication with the outside world. His warders might entertain him with conversation, but they were never to lose sight of him day or night. Under this close confinement, Carlos, who had always been weakly, lost all interest in life and rapidly sank and died at the age of twenty-three in 1568. His death remains a mystery. Many rumors were current that Philip had contrived it by poison, but natural causes seem quite a satisfactory explanation. The reason of his captivity was undoubtedly his madness, of which there seems ample proof. Though Philip might wage war on Turks and Moriscos, and attempt to stamp out by the Inquisition the reformed faith in Spain and the Netherlands, he came to understand in his slow way that the real obstacle to the success of his religious policy lay in england and scotland his great scheme for their conversion forms the climax of his reign but the story of the invincible armada belongs to the next chapter so far we have considered philip's reign from the point of view of the catholic revival the attempt to establish his own supremacy must now be noticed in fifteen seventy nine occurred an unlooked-for opportunity of adding portugal to his dominions thereby bringing the whole peninsula under Spanish rule. Philip's young nephew, King Sebastian, whose religious aims were not unlike his uncle's, had been killed in a mad expedition against the Moors of Morocco. The heir to the throne was his great-uncle, Cardinal Henry, who died, however, in 1580. Philip, as the son of the cardinal's sister, the Empress Isabel, now brought forward his claim to which the only serious rival was that of Antonio, prior of Crato, the half-Jewish son of Henry's brother Louis. Sebastian, Henry, and Antonio were all descended in the male line from Emmanuel the Great, while Philip's claim was through his mother. But this disadvantage counted for little, since he was by far the strongest candidate in the field. It was of the utmost importance in his bankrupt condition to secure the wealth of the great Portuguese colonies in Brazil, Africa, and the East Indies, and an army under Alva and a fleet commanded by Santa Cruz was dispatched to Portugal. 
the prior was personally popular which philip as a spaniard was not but the peasants who formed antonio's chief following were soon scattered by trained forces the prior fled to england where queen elizabeth made much of him as long as it suited her purposes twice though he attempted with ships lent by catherine de medici to seize the azores he was baffled each time by santa cruz and he never returned to his own country philip was crowned at lisbon in fifteen eighty one promising to uphold portuguese liberties but he made the great mistake of offending the nobles by trying to reduce their privileges and by extending the crown lands spanish rule never commanded any affection in portugal with the result that in sixteen forty at the first opportunity the portuguese recovered their independence philip however successfully introduced into his italian provinces the arbitrary system of government which was to provoke the great revolt of the netherlands in spain itself he set to work further to curtail national liberties after the example of his father castile had always been more subject to the royal authority than aragon and not much independence had been left the latter since the nobles had withdrawn in fifteen thirty eight their chief function indeed was to present petitions to the king the terrible drain on its resources steadily continuing for half a century had reduced it to the direst poverty but in aragon self-government was still a reality for the principle was yet alive that redress of grievances must precede supply and that the power of the justiciar still safeguarded justice from royal interference the inquisition too was somewhat kept in check by public opinion charles and philip had long desired to curtail the independence of aragon but not until the close of philip's reign did an opportunity arise the king's chief secretary antonio perez an uncommonly clever rogue had been deputed by his master to bring about the death of escobedo don juan's secretary who abetted the prince's ambitious plans it was perez who had poisoned philip's mind against escovedo and the prince but he failed to entrap his victim long after the special reasons for the murder had disappeared perez used the king's authority to have escovedo killed in the street to avenge a private grudge perez was thrown into prison but he escaped to aragon and claimed the protection of the justiciar who by the law of the land could detain him in his own prison and secure for him a legal trial when philip demanded his surrender all aragon was up in arms to defend its judicial privileges and after the king's failure to bring him under the jurisdiction of the inquisition he was hurried over the pyrenees into france in fifteen ninety one henry the fourth and elizabeth were equally ready to give him a welcome to their dominions and to learn all that he was ready to divulge of the state secrets of spain philip's arm was not long enough to reach the fugitive but upon aragon his vengeance fell heavily an army was sent on the pretext of restoring order the justiciar was beheaded and the inquisition dealt severely with all who were in any way connected with the resistance to the king at the same time the members of the cortes from being freely elected were reduced to the position of nominees of the crown which also usurped the appointment of all officers of justice the evil effects of this absolutist system appeared even in philip's lifetime if the government of a country be carried on by a few unless the few be also the wisest the country will not prosper the king and his officials were for instance entirely ignorant of the laws of public economy and the financial question was the most serious of all national questions in spain the income from the new world was greatly exaggerated by far the largest proportion of the revenue came from the low countries in the netherlands are those mines treasures and indies which have rendered the emperor's wars possible was said in the lifetime of charles and when the revolt of the netherlands began the burden of taxation was thrown upon already exhausted castile every imaginable means of raising money was tried a tax on wool sales the sale of offices 
the seizure of money from merchants, increase of customs duties, and the year after the Armada failed, an excise called the Millones was levied on the necessities of life, wine, oil, and meat. Later still, a house to house collection was made, which was nothing less than a public almsgiving for the benefit of the crown. Even under Charles V, recourse had been had to loans, and every year the interest upon them swallowed up the taxes before they reached the treasury. Every year, it was said, ruined that which succeeded it. By wise management, commerce should have been brought to the rescue of this terrible state of things, but it was rapidly passing into the hands of foreigners. Castile is not naturally a fertile country, and the Spaniard has an ingrained dislike to manual labor. The vast system of taxation, corruptly administered and involving great expense merely for its collection, devoured all the capital of the country. Spain became absolutely dependent on foreign countries for its supply of arms, articles of luxury, and handicrafts. To make matters worse, home industry was hampered by a network of restrictions on imported and exported goods. Internal trade in raw materials was regulated with the object of making goods cheap. When expenses continually increase and income as steadily declines, bankruptcy is not far off. And this is what befell Spain as the price paid for Philip's system of government. By the ignorance, incapacity, and bigotry of its rulers, the lifeblood of a great state was drained. In the reign of his successor, the only visible sign of national life was the great literary age of Cervantes, Lope de Vega, and Calderon. And in his caricature of Spanish devotion to lost causes and forsaken beliefs and impossible loyalties, the author of Don Quixote expresses the feeling of a country that had lost all faith in its old ideals. End. Section 18 of Europe in Renaissance and Reformation by Mary A. Hollings. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 9. The Revolt of the Netherlands. Part 1. From Charles the Bold to Charles V, the rulers of the Netherlands had chiefly aimed at uniting together the seventeen duchies, counties, or lordships that composed their dominions. Between the north and south were strongly marked differences. The north, on the whole, was Teutonic in race and democratic in feeling. The south, Celtic and in the country districts, aristocratic, while the towns everywhere were famous for their independent and wealthy burghers. Each state was complete in itself, and strong local jealousies marked their attitude to one another. Though Charles V had undoubtedly persecuted the people of the Netherlands, shorn them of many of their liberties, and burdened them with taxes, his geniality kept him popular with them to the end. But though they were outwardly peaceable when they passed to Philip II, two questions were becoming critical religion and taxation. Unfortunately, Philip had nothing in common with his subjects of the Low Countries, not even speech, and his first measures were a series of blunders. To begin with, there was the choice of a regent. For this important post, two men on the spot seemed naturally fitted. William of Nassau, Prince of Orange, was Stadtholder of Holland, Zeeland, and Utrecht, and had been a favorite of Charles V, and though only twenty-six, had already seen important political service. The other, La Morale, Count of Egmont, the Stadtholder of Brabant and Artois, and victor of the battles of saint Quentin and Gravelines, was an attractive and popular soldier, lacking perhaps the more solid qualities that William was soon to display. Philip, however, preferred docility in a regent to independence of character, and he chose his half-sister, Margaret of Parma, the wife of Ottavio Farnese, in 1559. Discontent at the appointment of a foreigner was increased when the Council of State of Native Nobles was ousted by a cabinet of three under another foreigner, 
the Burgundian Granvella, Bishop of Arras. Though quite the ablest of Margaret's advisers, Granvella was ambitious and grasping, and far too subservient to Madrid to command any confidence in the Netherlands. Upon Charles V rests the blame of bringing the Inquisition into the Netherlands, but Philip greatly widened its scope. The three existing bishoprics were undoubtedly unequal to the work of the Church in so populous a country, yet Catholics and Protestants alike stormed with indignation at the creation of fourteen new bishoprics under the three new archbishoprics of Cambrai, Utrecht, and Mechelin, each with special inquisitorial powers. Aware of the opposition he had aroused, Philip decided to keep in the Netherlands some troops that had been collected for the French war. But the hostility to their presence became so strong that Granvella and Margaret begged Philip to withdraw them. Next, the nobles supported by the regent, who had often found the cardinal's advice preferred to her own, insisted on the recall of Granvella in 1564. Philip received him with pretended displeasure, but the fallen minister remained high in the king's confidence at Madrid until his death in 1582. After Granvella's departure, the persecuting edicts were more ferociously enforced than ever, and the regent was almost distracted between her duty to her subjects and her duty to her sovereign. A number of the younger nobles, headed by William's brother Louis of Nassau, formed an association called the Compromise for the abolition of the hateful Inquisition. Why, madam, said one of the cabinet, to quiet the regent's alarm at this new movement, is it possible your highness can fear these beggars? And the name, Gu, was forthwith adopted by the members of the association, who took for their badge the wallet carried by the professional brethren of the streets. The feeling against the Inquisition showed itself among the lower classes in riots at Antwerp, Saint-Omer, and many other towns, where the images and decorations of the churches were ruthlessly destroyed. For once, Philip was roused to open fury. But Margaret, imprisoned in her palace by the mob, was compelled to promise that the Inquisition should go. The people were pacified in a number of leading Catholics, disgusted at the desecration of their churches, rallied round the government. Even Orange, who had hitherto been a Catholic and was at the time passing into Calvinism, used his influence to maintain loyalty. It really seemed as if an understanding at last might be arrived at when the nobles were commanded to take a fresh and more explicit oath of allegiance. Many of them chose rather to resign their offices, and William, warning Egmont against the perils of submission, moved with all his household into Nassau. Immediately after, Alva arrived, with an army, to take the regent's place and reduce the Netherlands by force. I have tamed men of iron in my time, said the duke. I shall know how to deal with these men of butter. The arrival of Alva was the final cause of the revolt. Margaret of Parma, hurt to the very bottom of her soul by this slight upon her authority, soon resigned. The new regent lost no time in arresting Counts Egmont and Horn, only regretting that as they had not caught William, they had caught nothing. A reign of terror followed upon the terrible blood council created by Alva's sole authority and directed entirely by Spaniards, one of whom, the vice-president Vargas, forestalled Judge Jeffreys in brutal behavior to his victims. It was Alva's boast that he had put to death over 18,000 persons, and it was estimated that three times as many fled the country, many of them to England. Great efforts even by the most exalted personages were made on behalf of the imprisoned counts, Louis of Nassau led an armed force into the country and defeated the Spaniards at Heiligerli. This decided their fate, as Alva's presence was needed in the field, and he would not leave his prisoners alive behind him. Their trial, which had been illegal in every respect, hastily ended in sentence of death for high treason. In the great square of Brussels, where now stands their statues, 
they met their unexpected doom with unshaken courage in the midst of a vast and sorrowing crowd, 1568. Resolute for vengeance as the Netherlanders were, their cause appeared to Orange, pondering over it in exile, to be almost hopeless. He sold his plate and jewels and collected money to raise forces, knowing how ill they must compare with Philip's trained troops. The proof of this appeared at the first encounter with Alva's army, when after Louis of Nassau's men had been utterly annihilated at Yemigen, William, attempting to retrieve the disaster, was forced to retire without an engagement. The two brothers then joined Coligny in his Huguenot campaign in France. Meanwhile, Alva was pressed for money, and he introduced from Spain the taxes known as the twentieth and tenth pennies. These were imposts of five and ten per cent on every sale of land or goods. The increase in cost of every article that had been thus taxed from its first stage as raw material to the last one as a finished product was ruinous in a commercial country like the Netherlands. The bakers refused to bake the brewers to brew, and the tapsters to tap. Shops were shut, and trade stagnated or removed to happier climes. In the prevailing gloom, suddenly, an unexpected ray fell upon the scene. About 1569, William of Orange granted letters of mark to a group of pirates of mixed origin, part Dutch, part English, who terrorized the North Sea, making bloody reprisals on Spanish towns and shipping. Their loot, splendid church vestments and gold chalices, they openly sold in Dover, and that Elizabeth tolerated these proceedings was a sign of growing recklessness in her treatment of Spain. Since her refusal of Philip's offer of marriage, the relations between them had been civil, but as France became involved in her religious wars, and Spain, hampered by the Netherland troubles, the danger diminished that these two Catholic powers might unite in favor of Mary Stuart. Elizabeth, therefore, careless how she might provoke Philip, harbored the sea beggars in Dover Roads. She was not, however, ready for open rupture, and since this had not been brought about even by Philip's clearly proven share in the Rodolfi plot against her life, she yielded to pressure from Spain and refused de la Marque further shelter. This wild rover who had sworn never to cut his hair until he had avenged his kinsman Egmont accordingly made for the Zeeland coast. On the spur of the moment he seized Brille as a refuge in 1572, taking formal possession in the name of Orange as Stadtholder, whose flag for the first time hoisted over the little port was the symbol of the new sea power on that day born into the world, Edmondson. For from the capture of Brille dates the rise of the Dutch Republic. Like a flame, open revolt spread through the northern provinces, and funds began to come in for the cause. William, already acknowledged Stadtholder by Holland, Zeeland, Gelderland, and Utrecht, began to hope that with help from Elizabeth and Charles the Ninth, then under Coligny's influence, he might make way in the south also. These hopes were soon dashed by the tidings of the massacre of St. Bartholomew. Alva drove Louis of Nassau from Mons, which was intended to be the base of the patriot resistance in the south, and William himself only escaped capture through the watchfulness of his favorite spaniel. Satisfied of the security of the South, Alva entered upon a campaign for conquest of the North, in which there is nothing to choose between the two sides in savage cruelty and unyielding valor. The war in the Northern States principally took the form of sieges. The conquest of Zeeland went on under Mondragon, a tried and valiant soldier whose most famous exploit showed true Spanish tenacity. A shallow channel ten miles broad divided the island of South Bevelant from the coast, to save Hos, its chief town, from the besieging Patriot army. Three thousand of Mondragon's men crossed this channel at night. Even at low tide, the water was breast high, 
and the ten miles had to be covered in six hours or the full tide would sweep away the invader yet grim determination carried all but nine safely to the rescue of Hoss. the patriots in their turn made a memorable resistance at harlem the town is without natural defences but the citizens were spurred to great exertions by the cruel slaughter that had followed the surrender of zutphen and narden they kept up communication by means of carrier pigeons and swift skaters when the spaniards had recovered from surprise at the strange sight alva ordered seven thousand pairs of skates and had his soldiers taught how to use them within the town women and children worked at the breaches fought in the ranks and helped in pouring boiling water oil and pitch on the besiegers heads the spaniards now and then threw into the town the heads of leaders of defeated relief expeditions the dutch retaliated with interest whenever they could all the son after failing in two great assaults to capture harlem was only kept to the task by his father's threat to disown him if he gave it up but when rats and mice nettles and hides had all been devoured at the end of seven months the town itself surrendered its garrison was slaughtered and many leading citizens were either hanged or drowned in harlem lake yet the fate of harlem may be said to have saved holland by stealing other towns to even greater resistance alva was at last weary of his work and begged for his recall in fifteen seventy three he left behind his memorial in more senses than one his services in having extinguished sedition chastised rebellion restored religion secured justice and established peace were already recorded upon his colossal bronze statue at antwerp his rather colourless successor the grand commander recasens fifteen seventy three to fifteen seventy six was anxious to bring the war to an end but nothing could move orange from his three indispensable conditions religious toleration restoration of national liberties and withdrawal of all foreigners from public service so the war went on mondragon was forced to surrender the last spanish stronghold in zealand to the sea beggars however louis of nassau marching to relieve leyden which was strongly invested early in fifteen seventy four was killed with his younger brother henry at the battle of mokerheide the position of leyden seemed so hopeless that orange persuaded the states to cut the dikes and let loose the sea the rhine and the meuse upon the carefully cultivated land it is better to drown it than to lose it he urged yet the winds held contrary till it seemed as if this sacrifice had come too late early in october however a furious westerly gale heaped the waters upon the land and the sea beggars their ships laden with provisions flew before the wind past chimney stacks and fruit trees to the spanish entrenchments the sight of the oncoming flood drove the spaniards into flight but succour was already too late for some eight thousand of the famished citizens the following day the wind changed sweeping the waters back to the sea so that the rebuilding of the dikes began almost immediately in memory of the great defence william founded the university of leyden as philip remained inflexible on the subject of toleration a conference held by the two parties at breda had no result the estates of holland and zeeland then agreed to offer the sovereignty of the netherlands to queen elizabeth but the moment had not arrived for the queen to declare herself against spain the sudden death of recasens in fifteen seventy six was followed by a wave of mutiny which passed through the army from north to south and overwhelmed antwerp the rebel forces from outside combined with the garrison to sack the town with shouts of santiago spain blood fire pillage the savage soldiery slew and robbed and tortured in the spanish fury of fifteen seventy six they stole or destroyed about twelve millions worth of property including jewels lace rich stuffs and the private savings of the poor the flames of a thousand burning houses raged about the cathedral 
sparing the grand building itself, but the wealth and splendor of Antwerp were laid in ruins. End. Section 19 of Europe and Renaissance and Reformation by Mary A. Hollings. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 9. The Revolt of the Netherlands. Part 2. The strong indignation aroused by the Spanish fury united both north and south in the famous pacification of Ghent. 1 all were to unite in expelling the spanish troops two all persecution was to cease and a states general representing the seventeen provinces was to consider the religious question three orange was to continue as governor in philip's name four all prisoners were to be set free and all confiscated property restored just at this time in fifteen seventy six arrived the new governor don juan of austria who had ridden through france disguised as a moorish slave by the perpetual edict since his instructions were to yield he confirmed the pacification of ghent on condition that his authority should be acknowledged and the northern citadels handed over to him william however cautioned the states against fulfilling these demands and kept himself more than ever on the alert Don Juan came with high hopes. His youth and confidence, his personal attractions, and his great military reputation made him popular everywhere. He looked forward, after settling affairs in the Netherlands, to winning a crown as husband of either Elizabeth or Mary, Queen of Scots. But he soon discovered that the only recognized authority in the Netherlands was that of the wise and wary William of Orange, and that, as we have already seen, philip's minister antonio perez was setting to work to poison his master's suspicious mind against him at the same time william whose highest point of success was reached with his entry into brussels a few months after don juan's was also being disillusioned his leadership was never again unanimously accepted this apparent lapse of loyalty in the southern states is explained when we remember that differences of race, religion, and language divided north and south, that the great Jesuit centers of Douai and Saint-Omer acted as powerful magnets on their surroundings, that Ricassens and Don Juan, and still more successfully Parma, turned to account the religious rivalry between the north and south, that the latter, though more easily aroused, was less steadfast than the North, and that a strong section of the Walloon nobility regarded Orange as usurper of their position and rights. To sum up, William had become too closely identified with the party of the Northern Calvinists to be accepted as ruler by the United Seventeen States. The first sign of the change was the setting up of the Archduke Matthias of Austria by the southern nobles as a rival to Don Juan, mainly by the help of his nephew Alexander Farnese. Don Juan defeated this party decisively at Jean Bleu, and the Archduke retired. A substitute was found in Francis, Duke of Anjou, brother of Henry the Third of France, who, though mean in person and base in mind, was the object of Elizabeth's flirtations. She allowed it to be understood that she favoured his pretensions in the Netherlands, while she intrigued secretly against this dangerous opening to French influence. Meanwhile, Don Juan, forced to inaction through want of definite instructions and much-needed supplies, became utterly dispirited, and sank into a fever which rapidly overcame his strength after fighting imaginary battles in delirium, he then died quietly on October 1st, 1578, worn out and disappointed at 33. His successor, Alexander of Parma, 1578 to 1592, was for William a far more formidable opponent. The son of Charles V's daughter, Margaret of Parma, and her second husband, Ottavio Farnese, he had been brought up with Don Juan and Don Carlos at Madrid. His passion for fighting found an outlet at first in incognito duels, 
but at twenty-three he was already a master in fortification, and he distinguished himself for daring at Lepanto. His military genius was almost equaled by his diplomatic gifts, to which must be added the advantage of personal fascination. A rare engraving of the time shows him alert and dignified with aquiline features and pointed beard, wearing a deep lace ruff, gold inlaid armor, and the collar of the golden fleece, as became a prince of fashion. Athletic and temperate habits kept a perfect balance between his bodily and mental gifts, and so, armed at all points, Alexander Farnese brought his energy, persuasiveness, and concentration of purpose to bear upon the problems of the Netherlands. Meanwhile, the Calvinists were growing more aggressive and lawless, and the great nobles and others were rallying to Catholicism. In 1579, the Treaty of Arras, in support of that faith, was concluded between Artois, Aino, and certain Flemish towns. The northern provinces responded in the Union of Utrecht, and these two important measures already forecast the ultimate division of the Netherlands. By this union, Holland, Zeeland, Helderland, Utrecht, Friesland, and later Honingen and Overijssel formed a confederation to defend their civil and religious liberty. Farnese continued to win supporters by bribes of gold or promotion, and even approached Orange with splendid offers. These tactics failing in 1580, by Granvella's advice, Philip published a ban against William, offering twenty-five thousand gold crowns and the rank of noble to any man who should hand over the traitor alive or dead. William replied in a vigorous apology defending himself from the charge of rebellion and denouncing Philip for his tyranny as no true king. Despairing of success without foreign aid, William circulated the apology in the courts of Europe, came to a final understanding with Anjou, and with his own hands fastened upon Francis's shoulders the ducal mantle of Brabant. Holland and Zeeland, however, regarded Anjou with disfavor, and chose Orange as their hereditary count. Thus the Netherlands at this time formed three groups, the west under Spain, the center under France, and the north under William of Orange. But the choice of Anjou as sovereign of the Netherlands did not lead, as Orange had hoped, to a European alliance against Spain. Queen Elizabeth gave up her pretenses of engagement, and Henry III's offers of help ended in talk. Parma continued to gain ground, and Anjou grew restive under the authority of Orange and of the Estates. Hoping to assert his independence by capturing the prince, he organized an attack on Antwerp. After the first shock of surprise, the burghers flew to arms in the French fury, 1583, and in less than an hour the streets were piled dead with French soldiers. His own followers expressed their disgust at such an act of treachery, but Anjou, unabashed, publicly attributed the affair to mischance, while he confided to Henry III that the manifest intention of the states to make a Matthias of him had been the cause of the catastrophe. Still, Orange remained convinced of the necessity of maintaining the French alliance, and though much criticized for doing so, he married about this time as his fourth wife, Coligny's daughter Louise. He continued to negotiate with Anjou in France until the Duke's death, and for a time became so unpopular that he moved into the midst of his loyal Hollanders at Delft. One attempt upon his life by Jarigui had already failed when in July came the Burgundian fanatic Balthazar Gerard, with the pretext of bringing the news of Anjou's death. He bought a pair of pistols with some money Orange had given him, and under an arch in the passage outside the prince's dining room he awaited his return from the family dinner. On July 10th, 1584, as William leading the way mounted the stairs, Gerard fired three bullets, and the prince fell into the arms of one of his soldiers, crying, 
God have mercy upon my soul and upon this poor people. A few minutes later he died. Gerard rushed out of doors, but he was caught, and glorying in his crime was put to death with barbarous tortures. At the time of his murder, William was fifty-one years old, and in spite of his arduous life in full vigor of mind and body. In an early portrait, at the age of twenty-eight, his expression is that of a man not yet certain of himself. His latest picture shows him white-haired and a little weary, but serenely calm as having weathered some of the worst storms of human experience. When the assassin struck him down, his work was done, for the future of the United Netherlands was assured. William's character was a union of wariness and simplicity. Though sparing in all his private tastes, he was good company at table and a frank and genial talker. His title of the silent is said to have been earned by his discreet reserve when Henry II confided his plans of persecution to him. He was quick to grasp and cautious to act, and in emergencies conspicuously brave. Though far more open than most rulers of his time, he did not disdain to meet craft with craft. Like Philip and Elizabeth, he was served by spies, but he never stooped to employ assassination. For ten years he daily received copies of Philip's most secret correspondence, and at one time he carried on all his political business under the name of a firm of merchants, G. and L. Certain. He had a close knowledge of men and the useful faculties of hearing everything and forgetting nothing. His energy and steadfastness were inexhaustible. In toleration and breadth of religious views, he belongs to the modern world. William's eldest son, Philip, had been in 1568 forcibly carried off to Spain and brought up to hate his father's cause. The second son, called after his famous grandfather, Morris of Saxony, was elected to rule Holland and Zeeland. For several years after his father's death, Morris, from the age of seventeen, was absorbed in the scientific study of war, for the son of William the Silent, strangely enough, was to prove no politician, but one of the first soldiers of his age. Had Orange accepted the sovereignty of the Netherlands, as he was so often pressed to do, some central authority would have remained at his death. But by the federal constitution of the United Provinces, each retained its own government under its own stadtholder and dealt with its own financial and foreign policy the business of the federal government was to organize in the states general the defense of all the provinces under their appointed officials the captain and admiral general under these circumstances the five states feeling the need of a visible bond of union in the face of parma's rapid progress south of the meuse applied in turn to France and England. Henry III and Elizabeth both declined the honor for themselves, but English troops under the command of the Queen's favorite Leicester were dispatched to the Netherlands, 1585 to 1587. Without consulting his mistress, he accepted the office of governor-general, and in high displeasure she refused for months to recognize the appointment. Leicester's own strong Calvinistic leanings, his unwise appointments, exclusive support of the popular party, and quarrels with his subordinates, increased his difficulties. His military undertakings were nearly always unsuccessful, and are chiefly remembered in connection with the loss at Zutphen of his nephew, Sir Philip Sidney. Finally, in 1587, he returned to England. Elizabeth still hoped to avert a rupture with Philip by intriguing with Parma, who was merely playing with her to gain time for his master. Instead of disowning her responsibility for Drake's singeing of the Spanish king's beard and doling out niggardly support to the Netherlands, the wisest course would have been as nearly always the boldest. Had Elizabeth thrown herself unreservedly into the cause of Holland, it is possible that the Armada could not have sailed in 1588. 
indeed it might never have done so for time gained was everything but elizabeth's indecision gave the opportunity and the execution of the queen of scots the pretext for the sailing of that invincible fleet so elizabeth found herself instead face to face with the task of saving england while philip not only failed to conquer it but by checking parma's victorious advance threw away his best chance of recovering the netherlands the armada as planned by philip was a military rather than a naval expedition the soldiers were superior in authority and numbers to the sailors the king's orders were to make for the netherlands and guard the channel while parma's army of seventeen thousand men was transported in the flat-bottomed barges which had been for some time collecting in the only available ports newport and dunkirk parma vainly urged that a base of operations as at flushing or in the isle of wight should be first secured four ships of war he wrote could sink every one of my boats but philip with the hopefulness of the ignorant clung to the idea that parma even without the armada's help might contrive to slip unnoticed across the channel with his troops the armada's history from drake's destructive swoop upon cadiz in fifteen eighty seven to the mutterings of the gale that blew on august fourteenth fifteen eighty eight is one long catalogue of disaster the death of its commander-elect santa cruz the unfortunate appointment of medina sidonia the dishonesty of food contractors the blockade of parma's transports by justin of nassau's little fleet even the weather conditions by each and all these untoward events the armada was thoroughly dispirited when after a running fight up channel with howard's squadron from plymouth it found itself on july twenty seventh at calais and almost in touch with parma by specially constructed canals alexander had brought all his vessels to the starting point and could embark his men in a day but until he should have cleared away the dutch fleet from the entrance to his two ports medina sidonia resigned himself to at least a fortnight's delay in calais roads to the english however whose provisions were running short delay meant disaster and by launching old burning hulks into the harbour they drove the armada panic-stricken out to sea next day august eighth fifteen eighty eight a great battle raged off gravelines drake frobisher and hawkins leading the attack poured their broadsides into the towering spanish ships evading all attempts to grapple the english vessels of lighter build outmanoeuvred their opponents by superior seamanship and the heavy spanish shot passed harmlessly above their decks the english artillery was more numerous and more modern their gunnery better than the spaniards and the battle was decided in favour of those who could pound hardest it is not surprising that the english ammunition gave out before the day was over yet not a single ship and scarcely sixty men were lost while sixteen of the finest spanish men-of-war and between four and five thousand of their men perished about five o'clock medina sidonia signalled the retreat then said howard we put on a brag countenance and gave chase as though we wanted nothing all next day the pursuit lasted and a sudden change in the wind drove the armada northwards before it as it freshened into a mighty gale near the firth of forth howard turned back and left the storm to work its will without pilots without charts ignorant of the northern seas with battered ships and ruined hopes the armada was scattered and wrecked upon the coasts of norway scotland and ireland about one-third straggled painfully back to spain most of the tried and valiant spanish captains had already perished or died broken-hearted on their return but medina sidonia survived to find himself once more among his orange trees End of section twenty of europe and renaissance and reformation by mary a hollings this librivox recording is in the public domain 
read by pamela nagami chapter nine the revolt of the netherlands part three philip in his usual patient way accepted the blow not despairing of fitting out a second armada but the english now took the offensive of the many buccaneering expeditions that left our coasts the most conspicuous was a miserable fiasco that occurred in aid of don antonio of portugal in fifteen eighty nine and the successful descent of essex and howard upon cadiz in fifteen ninety six meanwhile in holland new men were coming to the front john van olden barnefeldt morris and lewis william of nassau olden barnefeldt the advocate of holland formerly a close friend of william the silent was a lawyer and statesman of remarkable grasp and ambition morris at this time described as an unmannerly schoolboy was engaged with the help of his cousin lewis william in adapting the military science of greece and rome to modern warfare between them they held the stadtholderships of the seven provinces and with olden barnefeldt they worked in complete accord lewis william was a man of broad and earnest religious views unselfishly devoted to his country and a student of classical wars the army which consisted largely of english scots german and french mercenaries had to be turned into a weapon not merely of defence but of attack the musket displaced the pike as the chief arms of the infantry the troopers equipped with carbines instead of lances became mounted infantry rather than cavalry a regular engineer corps was introduced and all prejudice against the use of the spade was soon overcome in morris's army by the important place it was given in the work of fortification a regular system of pay was set up the strictest discipline was enforced and pillage the curse of the time was rigorously suppressed at the head of this reformed and efficient force stood morris lacking perhaps french dash and italian swiftness but cool scientific and resolute with his great rival parma he scarcely came into contact for under the strain of incredible exertions the latter's health had given way twice in fifteen ninety and fifteen ninety two he had been required to march into france to relieve paris and rouen for the catholic league but these masterly achievements among the finest in his career were the work of a dying man his loyalty had long been overcast at madrid by cruel slanders which he vainly urged philip to treat not only as a king but as a gentleman his successor was in fact already chosen but from the knowledge of this final insult death saved him no longer able to mount his horse unaided at the end of a long day's work in the saddle when superintending preparations for yet another french campaign he fainted and so passed away in fifteen ninety two in all the war there is no more heroic figure than the forsaken but unconquerable parma battling to the last with disease and death his successor the archduke ernest son of the emperor maximilian the second was designed by philip to marry his daughter isabella and rule france he was gentle fat and fond of comfort and his habit of bursting into tears under difficulties must have been puzzling to an official generation that had known parma in little more than a year he died and was succeeded by his brother the ex-cardinal archduke albert a dignified and hard-working soldier and politician of some ability he at once made overtures of peace but the states had other views and formed with france and england a triple alliance against spain the first foreign recognition of their independence during these years morris of nassau had sprung into the first rank as a general and the results of his campaign from fifteen ninety one to fifteen ninety six may here be summarized during parma's absence in france he mastered the course of the val and overran the northern provinces of friesland Groningen, and drenthe 
the next year the capture of Hertrudenberg secured control of the Meuse, and with the surrender of Groningen fell the last Spanish stronghold in that province. Temporarily checked in the north by the nonagenarian hero Mondragon, he scored a great success in South Brabant in his next campaign. In a week, he cleared North Brabant and Zeeland from the marauders he had driven from Turnout in South Brabant, and followed up the work of this little winter campaign by capturing a number of places on the Cleve frontier, which strengthened his position on the Rhine. At this point, to the great disappointment of the Dutch, Henry the Fourth of France concluded with Spain the Peace of Vervins, May 1598 in which the states declined to be included without acknowledgment of their independence the spanish provinces at the same time were formed into a separate sovereign state to be ruled by the archduke albert and his proposed bride the infanta on the understanding that they should revert to spain should the archduke die childless in the autumn died philip the second the war continued between the spanish and united provinces till sixteen o nine its monotonous course being relieved by two great exploits at Newport and Ostend. To secure a base of attack on Dunkirk and strike at Flanders, the heart of the enemy's power, Morris invested Newport. Caught unexpectedly by the Archduke's army between the harbour behind and the sea on the left, Morris had to give battle in the sand dunes. After several hours' fierce struggle, his soldiers broke into flight, but were rallied by their general's extraordinary quickness and resolution the tables were instantly turned the archduke's army stampeded and albert himself who had fought bravely only narrowly escaped with his life this first great victory of the states in the open field was marked by the loss of some five thousand of the enemy and the capture of large numbers of prisoners guns and standards the second great military event of the old age of the war was the long siege of Ostend, 1601 to 1604. The capture of this fort, the only one held by the states in Flanders, was of great importance to the Spaniards as being the single thorn in the Belgic lion's foot. Sir Francis Vere was the first of a line of stout defenders of the town. Morris and Lewis William watched over it outside intercepting supplies for the besieging army and as it was open to the sea it had ample provisions on the land side the approaches were mined and countermined and the forts captured one by one till it seemed as if ostend would be nibbled to pieces at last the marquis spinola head of a great genoese banking family offered the archdukes to advance large sums on condition that he might command the besieging forces spinola was no soldier but a refined and dignified aristocrat of thirty-three whom velasquez has made familiar in his famous picture of the surrender of breda yet he had once proved himself as tough as a tried campaigner and as reckless of his own life as he was of the lives of his troops it was soon clear that ostend was in his grasp from which morris tried to wrench it by a counter-attack on a more important place, Sluss. Having secured Sluss on Spinola's failure to relieve it, Morris was unwillingly preparing, at the States General's orders, to attack Spinola's army before Ostend, when a further waste of human life was spared by the garrison's surrender. They marched out with all the honours of war, leaving the archdukes to take possession of the grim and desolate heap of ruins that had once been Ostend seventy thousand men the lifeblood of the army in belgium had been sacrificed to take it and meanwhile in sluss the states had gained a more useful seaport commanding the western entrance to the scheldt for five years longer the war lingered its final exploit taking place at sea a dutch fleet under the daring navigator heemskirk attacked the spanish fleet in gibraltar bay and utterly destroyed it at a trifling cost of life with the good offices of france and england negotiations after a time of great suspense ended in april sixteen o nine 
in a twelve years truce on the following terms one the united provinces were acknowledged by spain to be sovereign and independent two freedom of trade was granted to the provinces no mention was made of liberty of worship for the catholics but this was practically secured by the toleration shown in the states to all forms of belief so the great forty years of struggle ended with the astonishing result that a race of traders and fishermen striking for liberty had in achieving it not only reduced the greatest empire of the age to the position of a second-rate power but had found itself it had made proof of its rugged virtues and in the strength of its new-born national feeling it displayed its energy in every field of human enterprise no more extraordinary contrast can be imagined than that produced by the war between the northern and southern netherlands the south had become a desert fields lay waste population had migrated trade had drifted northwards antwerp was totally eclipsed by amsterdam but in the north trade throve on the war the dutch became the corn and timber carriers of europe the cloth trade was transplanted from flanders to holland france and england each absorbed in its own affairs made no opposition to the world-wide expansion of dutch commerce from the kara straits to patagonia from japan to brazil their ships were on every sea the first of all chartered companies for indian trade was formed in holland the arctic adventures of barents and heemskirk have never been surpassed in interest we may trace the dutch settlements in new amsterdam new york new holland australia northern new guinea cape horn tasmania the fiji islands ceylon and cape colony progress in literature science and art kept pace with that of discovery during the war refugees of various races and opinions from the south brought new ideas and fresh vigor to the dutch stock about a generation later were born a brilliant throng of men and women destined to win for frederick henry's reign the title of the golden age the age of Hotius, descartes and spinoza of the great dutch poets and of the great dutch painters headed by hals and rembrandt after the conclusion of the truce which had been strenuously opposed by morris of nassau the political power in the states eclipsed that of the army and brought into greater prominence oldenbarnefeld whose diplomacy secured for holland a great place in european politics he joined hands with france over the important affairs of the julier cleve succession soothed the commercial jealousy of england and kept on friendly terms with the northern powers unfortunately at home it was plain that friction was arising the political military and naval authority of the states was centred in the half hereditary house of orange by which is meant that election was practically restricted to this one family but oldenbarnefeld was advocate of holland where the republican party was uppermost yet it was religion and not politics that finally separated the two friends the great rivalry between the two branches of dutch calvinism the remonstrance and the counter remonstrance liberals and strict calvinists came to a head in a famous controversy between their leaders arminius and gomarus the states declared in favour of the arminians the party to which belonged both the house of orange and oldenbarnefeld but the counter remonstrance proved defiant and it became necessary to appeal to force though morris confessed he did not know whether predestination was blue or green he yielded to the persuasions of the advocate's enemies and offered his military services to the counter remonstrance oldenbarnefeld urged the state of holland to raise irregular forces of its own and claimed that morris must take his orders from that authority and not from the states general but morris and his soldiers were irresistible a large majority took up the counter remonstrant cry for a national synod and the remonstrant leaders among them oldenbarnefeld and hotius were arrested 
while the synod of dort representing most of protestant europe was engaged in condemning the remonstrance and drawing up its own confession of faith in a legal court packed with his personal enemies was conducting oldenbarnefeldt's trial in the harshest manner he was condemned to death and morris declined to interfere with the sentence the old advocate was beheaded on may thirteenth sixteen nineteen do not believe that i am a traitor to the country were his last words to the assembled crowd i have always acted as a good patriot and as such i shall die the verdict of history has confirmed his defence if orange was the founder oldenbarnefeldt was the master builder of the united netherlands his death was due to the malignity of his enemies and casts a dark shadow upon the reputation of morris of orange the fall of oldenbarnefeldt postponed for thirty years the struggle between the house of orange and the republican party morris was sovereign in all but name till his death he was unmarried and did not care about the title yet nothing he admitted went well with him after the advocate's execution on the expiration of the truce with spain he took the field against spinola and achieved one success in the relief of bergen op Somme. but his failure to rescue breda cut him to the heart and hastened his end on his deathbed he settled the succession upon his brother frederick henry the son of william the silent and louise de coligny whom he had also trained to be the heir of his fame in war during the reign of frederick henry sixteen twenty five to sixteen forty eight the power and prosperity of the house of orange reached its greatest height reference has been made to the famous period of discovery literature and art which won for his age the name of golden the prince who had inherited the diplomatic gifts of his father with the military genius of his brother was exactly the ruler to foster the growth of the monarchy in holland and this development is the chief interest of his reign in european history while frederick himself took the field gaining in a series of campaigns an important line of border fortresses hertogenbas maastricht and breda his clever wife amalia of Solms, conducted political and diplomatic business and transformed morris's quiet household into a court in the diplomacy of the thirty years war holland played an important part and two great naval triumphs over spain in sixteen thirty one and sixteen thirty nine signalized her growing sea power at frederick henry's death in sixteen forty seven the house of orange had attained sovereign rank the act of survival had already declared the hereditary succession of his son william the second whose marriage with mary daughter of charles the first linked his family with a great reigning house section twenty one of europe and renaissance and reformation by mary a hollings this librivox recording is in the public domain read by pamela nagami chapter ten the french reformation part one the french reformation must not be regarded as a side issue of the german reformation for it had a character all its own the church in france had always been somewhat independent of rome and the reform movement there never threatened as it did about the time of the diet of worms in germany to become national the huguenots were always a minority perhaps about one-thirtieth of the population while in germany by fifteen eighty the protestants have been estimated at twenty-seven thirtieths of the whole the many political divisions of the empire favoured differences of opinion but for bare national existence france needed a centralised government and uniformity of religion thus in germany the reformation could succeed partly in france it must succeed altogether or fail independence of thought may be said to have been the watchword of germany but a stricter and more binding moral law was the aim of the french reformers it has been remarked that the german reformer fought against the pope the french reformer against the devil 
Edwards. The personal interest of the French Reformation, especially of its heroines, is stronger than in Germany. Each movement, however, gave birth to a great Protestant reformer, the one to Luther, the other to Calvin. Lastly, Protestantism was strong in North Germany and South France. South Germany was finally recovered by the Roman Church, but had the Reformation come fifty years sooner, it might possibly have succeeded in the south of France. The French Reformation struggle is so long and complicated that a general plan of its course may be sketched here. The first stage is that of growth, the second of organization as a religious party, the third of organization as a political party, the fourth of the triumph of the political party over the religious party. At this point, with the massacre of St. Bartholomew, the real reform movement ends. The wars of religion now become a struggle for the throne between the Guise and the Bourbon factions, or in other aspects, a contest between tyranny and republicanism, or between national independence and Spanish rule. The accession of Henry of Navarre in 1589, followed by his admission to the Roman Church, cannot be regarded as an Huguenot victory, and is succeeded by the Catholic reaction. The Reformation entered France hand in hand with the Renaissance, and the welcome given by the royal house to the latter saved the former from a severe reception at first. About 1520, the new movement gained a footing in Paris with the evangelical reformers Lefebvre, Farel, Marot, Brissonnet, and Margaret, Queen of Navarre, sister of Francis I. Lefebvre's translation of the New Testament into French enabled him to set up the Bible as the sole standard of faith. Under Bishop Brissonnet, Meaux became the centre of a band of preachers inspired by Lefebvre, of whom the chief was Farel, the young and imaginative apostle of Switzerland, and Marot, the favourite poet of Francis I, whose beautiful version of the Psalms did much to make Protestantism popular. Lastly, there was Margaret of Valois, the patroness of learning and darling of the court, who presented the reformed religion to the world in its most attractive aspect. When she left Paris to become the Huguenot Queen of Navarre, Mo already eclipsed Paris as the headquarters of Protestantism, and challenged the opposition of the Sorbonne, or theological faculty, of that university. During the king's captivity, in 1525, the Parliament of Paris set on foot persecution. But at Francis's return the clouds temporarily lifted. Unfriendly relations with the Pope, his sister's great influence, and the attraction of reformers' learning had for the king nearly led him to adopt their cause. This, however, was not to be. The wild outbreaks against the mass forfeited his sympathy. The Catholics convinced him that the success of the Reformation would hopelessly divide the country. Pope Clement VII succeeded in involving France in a new Italian war, and at the same time in making his cousin Catherine de' Medici Dauphiness. For these reasons, Francis I finally decided against the Reformation. Though the new ideas rapidly spread in the provinces, there was up to this point no union between those who held them. But in 1536, the year of Lefebvre's death, appeared the Institutes of the Christian Religion, upholding the reformers' religious views as being quite compatible with the character of good citizens, this remarkable book, dedicated to the king and written by a young man of twenty-six, had the effect of welding the French Reformation into one whole and of giving it the distinctive name Calvinist. Its author, John Calvin, 1509-1564, born in Picardy of well-to-do and respected parents, had studied law at Bourges and Paris. In the capital he fell under the influence of the reformers, and on account of his views he was forced to leave the city. 
Before long he settled in Basel, a town teeming with the new ideas, and there he published the Institutes. This book, The Critical Outlook Upon Religion of a Deeply Spiritual Mind, became the code of law for the new church. Calvin, at Forel's entreaty, was soon actively engaged in work in Geneva. The free imperial city was French in language, which may account for the fact that it, and not German-speaking Basel, was destined to become the new Rome of the Protestant church. Much friction and mental activity was generated on this meeting ground of four races, under the curiously divided authority of the bishop, the Duke of Savoy, and the citizens. During Calvin's first day of two years he tried to carry out a thoroughgoing reform in the life of the city, but his severity defeated his object, and he and Farrell were driven away. Three years later he was recalled with a free hand to rule the church. First he drew up a scheme for the education of ministers, so that before long Geneva was the mine whence came the ore of heresy, which was distributed throughout France, Holland, England, and Scotland. In Geneva was set up the consistory of six ministers and twelve annually elected elders. They were responsible for the city's morals, and with the aid of the civil government had power to punish lapses from a very exacting standard. Attendance at church was compulsory, disrespect to parents, card-playing, the wearing of gay clothes, frivolity and irreverence were punishable offenses, and the penalty of heresy was death. The Genevan model of church organization was copied wherever Calvinism took root, whether in Europe or America. In France, the congregations were organized during the second period of the Reformation. Each congregation formed a distinct church, ruling the life of the community through its consistory of ministers, deacons, and elders. The pastor and one elder represented each church in the district meeting. Above this stood the provincial synod, and at the head of all the national synod, which in 1559 drew up at Paris the Calvinist Confession of Faith. The only recognized sacraments were baptism and the Lord's Supper, of which latter Calvin, differing from both Catholics and Lutherans, taught the doctrine of a real presence revealed only spiritually to the faithful. The Bible was to be the sole standard of belief, but no salvation was possible without the fold of the church. Though the constitution of the church was democratic by means of the election of all officers but Calvin himself, obedience to authority was strictly enjoined. It was not until after Calvin's death that the well-known views of free grace and predestination came to the front. Calvin lived to see his church firmly settled in many countries, and he remained both Pope and Emperor of Geneva until his death in 1564. Gloomy as was his teaching, and severe and unesthetic as were its practices, it lived in the Huguenot, the Dutch, the Puritans, the Covenanters, and the Pilgrim Fathers, as a purifying and reviving force in the history of nations. By 1535, Francis had definitely decided against the Reformation, and as soon as there was a lull in the Italian War, persecution began. For nearly ten years, the Waldenses, the peaceful and law-abiding followers of Peter Waldo, whose only crime was association with the Lutherans, were treated with merciless severity. Finally, in 1545, they were abandoned to the cruel president of the Parliament of Aix, whose troops destroyed their village and slew a population of 3,000 in the space of two months. Next year a descent was made upon the reformers of Meaux, fourteen of whom were tried, tortured, and burnt by the Parliament of Paris. Yet it was evident by the time of Francis's death that Protestantism had gained ground everywhere except in the northwest. Henry II, 1547-1559, to 1559, however, did not share his father's interest in the reformers' learning, and he was strongly influenced by their enemies, the constable, 
the marshal, and the all-powerful favorite, Diane de Poitiers. The Guises recovered their influence at court, which had lately waned. Persecution became more active. A special chamber of the Parliament of Paris, set apart for the trial of heretics, soon justified its name of la chambre ardente the church as well as the civil courts were empowered to deal with heretics and from neither jurisdiction was there any appeal yet it was at this time that the movement reached its highest level of purity of belief and of motive in the completion of its organization and in the saintliness which every age of persecution seems to manifest even the orthodox parliament of paris had become infected with the new ideas before the end of henry the second's reign the accession of francis the second fifteen fifty nine to fifteen sixty henry's eldest son coincides with the beginning of the third period of the reformation the political organization of the protestants here ends the purely religious interest motives become mixed and the movement declines in moral force but it appeals to a wider circle converts were first found about this time among the noble or military classes which had been set free by the peace of cateau cambresi three great families control the state of parties and each was represented by three distinguished brothers the young king francis the second was at the age of sixteen entirely in the hands of the guises the uncles of his wife mary queen of scots though regarded as semi-foreigners the guises had in their veins the blood of all the royal houses of france and were the grandsons of that rene of lorraine who had recovered his duchy from the clutches of charles the bold they were fanatically catholic popular with the lower classes and therefore strong in northern industrial france and ambitious of supreme power through their sister mary of lorraine james v's widow and regent of scotland for her daughter mary stuart they worked the catholic interest of that country to the utmost hoping to make good their niece's claim to the english throne in despite of queen elizabeth the scots protestants headed by the lords of the congregation therefore made successful overtures of alliance to both elizabeth and the french protestants the long-standing enmity between france and spain although just officially closed by the treaty of cateau cambresi nevertheless kept philip the second in constant dread of the guise policy and obliged him to be civil to elizabeth it was not until the danger of a union between france scotland and england had passed away with francis the second and in a secondary sense with the improved position in england of the tudor queen that the catholic sympathies shared by the guises and philip were able to draw them together with the disastrous results to france known as the wars of the catholic league the guises of whom we have spoken were the three brothers the cardinal of lorraine a subtle suave and commanding personality francis duke of guise the hero of metz and calais less able but more straightforward than his brother and the cardinal of guise altogether less prominent than the other two they were supported on the whole by the great nobles the clergy the official classes and the peasants and geographically their influence was strongest in paris northeast france toulouse and brittany of the same religion as the guises but separated from them by personal dislike was the house of montmorency whose head was the stern and upright old constable coligny's uncle they formed at first with the queen mother and the chancellor l'hôpital what may be called the middle catholic party but when war broke out they supported the crown against the huguenots foremost in rank on the protestant side stood the house of bourbon an offshoot like the guises of the royal family but next to the throne after the reigning valois and ready to dispute place and power with the guises the head of the family was antony 
through his wife Joan, Margaret of Valois's daughter, King of Navarre by courtesy, a soldier and a Calvinist, but far too much of a weathercock to make a party leader. Louis, Prince of Conde, the second brother, small in person, gay and gallant, had been converted to Calvinism by his wife, Eleanor, Coligny's niece, and showed some of the strong qualities of a leader. The third brother belongs to the Catholic party, for Charles, Cardinal of Bourbon, leapt into fame for a short space only as the leaguer's king, Charles X, of France. The third of the great governing families was the house of Châtillon, which gave to the French Reformation the one man it produced of supreme fitness for leadership, Gaspard de Coligny, Admiral of France. He had served his country well, having delivered Paris from a Spanish army in 1557 by his dogged defense of Saint-Quentin, yet like William III of England, he was more successful in retrieving disaster than in winning battles. In his military ordinances he had shown himself stark and stern in reducing to order an insubordinate soldiery. But his gifts were those of a statesman rather than of a general. He had yielded slowly to the reformed opinions, and at last was persuaded by his wife to declare himself a Calvinist. He hoped to heal internal disorders by making war upon Spain and by a definite attempt at colonization. His settlements in Brazil and in Florida, if successful, would have placed France in the forefront of colonizing nations. Coligny was of middle height, ruddy and well-built, with a pleasant voice and calm eyes. He was highly educated and an enthusiastic art collector, yet a man of solitary tastes and too honest to be a perfect diplomatist or courtier. He was just and honorable with a moral force that won him undisputed authority over his party. Something of the Old Testament leader, something of the fearless, unworldly character and primitive faith that have set apart General Gordon in our own age, were united in Coligny with a sound, balanced judgment. The three Châtillon brothers were said to be kindled as by one soul. The cardinal, O'Day, sympathized with the Reformation and the youngest, Dandolo, a very brave and popular soldier, was, though a Calvinist, a friend of the king, and regarded by the Guises as one of their most formidable opponents. The chief supporters of the Huguenot party were to be found among the lesser nobility and the gentry and the trading and artisan classes. Their influence was strongest in a district lying between Orléans and Avignon bounded by the rivers Loire and Rhone. Politics as well as religion entered into their program of reform. They demanded the reassembling of the States General, which had not met for seventy-five years, reduction of taxation, the abolition of the sale of offices, and the exclusion of foreigners from important posts. The Parliament of Paris, though on the whole favorable to their views, was jealous of any plan to revive the States General. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Section 22 of Europe in Renaissance and Reformation by Mary A. Hollings. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 10. The French Reformation, Part 2. Between these two parties stood the Queen Mother, Catherine de' Medici, watching as an ambitious woman and an Italian for the long postponed chance of exerting her influence. She had possessed her soul in patience under the slights of her husband and his court till the accession of her son. At the age of forty, she was at her best, without pretensions to charm, but full of vitality, indefatigable and witty. Her nature was steel smooth and cold. She lived apparently without either attracting or feeling affection. By nature and education she was crafty, but not deliberately cruel. 
though her conduct was not hampered by ordinary notions of right and wrong, her own life was respectable, and she had great self-control and common sense. The Guises immediately took possession of France on the king's death. A reign of terror followed, directed by the Cardinal of Lorraine, with the military support of the Duke of Guise. Two attempts were made by the Huguenots to overthrow this tyranny. By the first, the tumult of Amboise, Navarre and Condé, failed to get possession of the king. By the second, a constitutional movement, led by Coligny and supported by Catherine, they secured a promise that the states-general should meet to discuss religious and political grievances. Meanwhile, the Guises made the most of the time by managing the elections and arresting both Navarre and Condé. Only the sudden death of the feeble king saved the latter from execution. As the second Valois boy, now Charles the Ninth, fifteen sixty to fifteen seventy four, was only ten, Catherine secured the regency after satisfying Antony of Navarre, the nearest prince of the blood, with the lieutenant generalship of France. Her intentions were to rule with the help of the middle party the constable and l'hôpital, and thus set up an eternal balance between Catholics and Huguenots. By way of beginning the reduction of the Guises' power, she compelled them to dispatch their niece, Mary Stuart, to her own kingdom, and to set free the Bourbon princes. The long-delayed states-general met at Pontoise. The Huguenots, who were in the majority, brought forward their political reforms, and also demanded that a national church of the reformed opinions should be established. At the conference of Poissy, some of the chief partisans of both sides were present to discuss the two religions, among them L'Hôpital, who was of all men the most capable of working Catherine's policy of balance, if it could be worked at all, on account of the respect in which he was held and his power of appreciating the good in each religion. As Chancellor, he had influenced the Parliament of Paris against persecution, and he hoped to turn men's minds from religious strife in the direction of reform. Though the Conference of Poissy, which was his idea, did not arrive at any reconciliation, by the Edict of January both religions were made legal in France the Huguenots being allowed to gather for worship outside walled towns. But the balance thus fixed soon failed, for the extreme wing of each party defied compromise, and the position was altered by the constable joining the Guises, with whom he had always been in religious sympathy, and by the desertion of Navarre, whose vanity and weakness had been played on by the Guises and by the Pope. The Guises, led by the triumvirate, the duke, the marshal, and the constable, were aware of their power, and bent upon the decision of the sword. An unexpected opportunity came when Guise, with a body of retainers, was riding through Vassy. His men, pushing their way into a barn where a Huguenot service was quite legally being held, caused a disturbance which ended with their firing upon and killing some sixty of the congregation, 1562. As the Duke supported this outrage, the massacre of Vassy became the signal for civil war. The Guises forthwith obliged the King and his mother to return to Paris, which the Duke, contrary to Catherine's orders, had occupied with his forces. The Huguenots' failure to secure either the King or the capital shows that they were taken by surprise, and it told heavily against them. Since the massacre of Vassy startled the country, the Huguenot nobles had been mustering in Paris, and their number astonished the Catholics. The signal for action was Condé's declaration that he came to deliver the king from the triumvirate. Both sides appealed to the German princes for help, which was forthcoming in each case. Queen Elizabeth also sent troops to the Huguenot, on the understanding that she should be compensated for the expense by the immediate possession of Havre and the future possession of Calais. 
speaking generally each of these short civil wars followed the same course a siege a battle a peace rouen and orleans were the first huguenot strongholds to be attacked fifteen sixty two to fifteen sixty three and it was hoped that by besieging the first the english would be prevented from getting a foothold in normandy conde's hasty march to join his friends in the north drew the enemy away from orleans and caused the battle of dreux rouen however was finally stormed and sacked by guise's soldiers navarre indeed lost his life but that was a gain to the huguenot since conde assumed the headship of his house during the boyhood of young henry of navarre at the battle of dreux marshal saint andre was killed and the constable captured soon after the third member of the triumvirate the duke of guise while superintending the siege operations at orleans was shot in the back by the huguenot fanatic poltro the surviving chiefs met at orleans and under conde's lead issued the pacification of amboise huguenot worship was to be allowed in the nobles houses and in all towns which had held calvinist services before 1563 the result of the first war was to embitter party feeling and by removing the triumvirate to place power once more in catherine's hands from this moment too realizing that coligny was her chief rival she changed her policy she threw herself on the catholic side and to weaken conde's influence caused the king though only thirteen to be declared of age in a royal progress through the kingdom it appears that some plan for the forcible destruction of the protestants in france and the netherlands was arranged even as early as this with the legate and the duke of alva the second civil war fifteen sixty seven to fifteen sixty eight alarmed by rumours the huguenots tried by the enterprise of meaux to seize charles and failing marched on paris hoping to end the war at a blow but the battle of st denis in which the old constable fell was a drawn engagement the peace really only the truce of long jumeaux left matters as at amboise soon after the dismissal of l'hopital from court marks the failure of his policy of toleration the third civil war fifteen sixty eight to fifteen seventy was provoked by the catholics attempt to seize conde and coligny through the forest tracts of central france they escaped to rochelle held by la rochefoucauld which became thenceforth the chief huguenot stronghold thither too came the southern nobles and joan of navarre with her son henry the royal army under the nominal command of the king's next brother henry of anjou but actually led by marshal tavannes entered the south and in the spring of fifteen sixty nine encountered coligny at jarnac in a desperate effort to retrieve the day conde was shot after surrendering his sword and the three hundred nobles fighting round him fell almost to a man the calvinist cause seemed crushed but the loss of conde brilliant and popular as he was made way for far stronger leaders coligny and joan of navarre the admiral soon put a second army into the field with german and flemish reinforcements and they besieged poitiers after a seven weeks able defence by henry of guise the son and successor of the murdered duke the siege was raised by anjou at severe cost to the huguenots the clamorous german mercenaries drove coligny into a still more disastrous battle at montcontour resulting in a loss of ten thousand killed or taken and of guns standards and baggage but the stubborn resistance offered to anjou by the huguenot towns the premature recall of the spanish and papal forces and the king's jealousy of his brother gave coligny time to raise yet another army and without further important fighting the war was concluded by the peace of st germain the terms were almost as favourable to the huguenots as if they had been victorious one 
previous edicts to their advantage were confirmed. 2. Two places in each province were added to the number of those where services might be held. Four cities of refuge, Rochelle, Montauban, Cognac, and La Charité, were placed in their hands. 3. Calvinists were admitted to all public employments. 4. They were allowed to appear before Calvinist judges. The Peace of Saint Germain is a landmark in the war, not only because more fully than any previous treaty it recognized the Huguenot position, but because it coincides with a change in the Queen Mother's foreign policy. Coligny's idea of a national war against Spain was eagerly taken up by Catherine and Charles. There was much talk of marriage alliances between the king's sister Margaret and Henry of Navarre. Between Charles himself and the Emperor Maximilian II's daughter Elizabeth, between Elizabeth of England and Henry of Anjou. Though the last proposal ended in talk, Elizabeth agreed to the sending of a French expedition to help Orange, while Charles renewed negotiations with the German Protestant princes with a view to their support in the Netherlands. The Battle of Lepanto had deepened Charles's jealousy of Philip and the capture of Briel by the sea beggars convinced him that the moment had come to strike at Spain. At this point, Catherine discovered that the king was drifting from her own influence under Coligny's, and she swiftly decided upon the admiral's removal. She succeeded in setting at rest his distrust, so that he surrendered three of the cities of refuge, and encouraged Joan of Navarre to visit Paris about her son's marriage with the Princess Margaret. Joan's death, soon after her arrival, was set down as usual at the period to poison, but of this there is no real evidence. The Huguenot world crowded to Paris to witness their leader's wedding on August 18th. On the 22nd, as Coligny was walking from the palace to his lodging, a bullet fired from a house belonging to the Guise faction broke his arm. The king, greatly upset, threatened an inquiry. The alarm and indignation of the Huguenot was unbounded, while in Catherine's eyes Coligny, scotched but not killed, became more dangerous than before. She hastily took counsel with her Italian supporters and Anjou, and browbeat the miserable king into consenting to her plan. Charles, as he yielded, exclaimed that not an Huguenot must be spared to reproach him with Coligny's death. This fell in with Catherine's view that, in a general massacre, Coligny would only seem to share the common fate. Once the signal for killing the leaders was given, the mob of Paris would answer for the rest. At midnight on August 23rd, 1572, the ringing of church bells ushered in St. Bartholomew's Day. At this signal, parties of armed men turned into the streets, recognizing their fellow Catholics by a white badge. Guise had personally undertaken to dispose of Coligny. The admiral, weak from his recent wound, was aroused by a tumult on the stairs, but he received his murderers with perfect calmness as he propped himself kneeling against his bed. They thrust him through with a pike and flung the still living body from the window into the courtyard below, where Guise was waiting to receive it. Besides Coligny, his son-in-law Teligny and La Rochefoucauld were slain. Henry of Navarre and young Condé were spared on condition they became Catholics. During the day and on the next, Two thousand of their followers perished in Paris, and the movement spread through other towns including Meaux, Orléans, and Rouen, finally reaching Bordeaux and destroying in its course from twenty to thirty thousand souls. The massacre did not, however, produce any change in the political situation. Rome and Madrid expressed their joy, and the English court went into mourning but Henry III's share in the crime did not prevent his election to the throne of the partly Protestant Poland. Elizabeth promptly resumed her negotiations with Alençon, and Orange still clung to his policy of liberating the Netherlands with French aid. Immediately after the massacre broke out the Fourth Civil War, 
1572 to 1573, consisting mainly of sieges of the chief Huguenot strongholds, among which that of La Rochelle stands out for its stubborn and successful defence. The election of Anjou, who commanded the besiegers, ended the war. By the Treaty of La Rochelle, liberty of conscience was secured to all Huguenots with liberty of worship in Rochelle, Montauban, Nîmes, and Sancerre. After St. Bartholomew, the character of the French Reformation changed in several ways. First, a third party, the Politique, came to the front, who, though Catholics themselves, and led by the Montmorency family, notably strengthened the Huguenots. Their war cry was liberty of conscience, but weariness of strife and personal ambition rather than religious enthusiasm were the mainsprings of their conduct. Secondly, the growth of political theory and experiment became a feature of Calvinism. The loss of many of the military nobility in the war brought forward the middle class and the preachers. Democratic ideas spread in the form of pamphlets or took shape in the two small republics of Languedoc and Upper Guienne. In fact, the South, the stronghold of the politique, under its elected governor, Damville de Montmorency, became almost independent. The politique, having loudly but unsuccessfully called for toleration, arranged a general rising in the South and Normandy, which became the Fifth Civil War, 1574 to 1576. At this time, the king, who, though thoroughly unbalanced, was the best intentioned of his family, died of consumption, haunted at the last by visions of St. Bartholomew. Henry III stole away at dead of night from Poland, where he had been extremely unpopular, to claim his new crown, 1574 to 1589. Several of the old leaders had passed away since he left France, and a Catholic revival was setting in. But the Fifth War was ended by the Peace of Monsieur, with the best terms the Huguenots had yet secured. 1. It sanctioned Huguenot worship throughout France except near Paris. 2. Cases concerning Protestants were to be tried by Chambre mi parti, Catholic and Calvinist judges in equal numbers, in every parliament. 3. Eight cities of refuge were handed over. This peace was fiercely criticized by the Catholics in general and the Guises in particular. It therefore hastened the Catholic revival and caused many old provincial associations to merge themselves in a new league which originated in Picardy, which rested on armed force and aimed at the defense of church and king. At a meeting of the States General at Blois, it adopted much the same reform program as the Huguenots had brought forward at Pontoise. It controlled its members so absolutely that they almost ceased to be French citizens. The Guises, from being the main supporters of the crown, now became the leaders of a democratic movement to dispose of the crown at the will of the people. Active rivalry between Guise and Bourbon for the throne of the Valois had in fact begun and the League, in the borrowed plumes of Huguenot republicanism, entered upon its twenty years' destructive career, fostering civil war, and swallowing up some of the most cherished institutions of France. End of Section 23 of Europe and Renaissance and Reformation by Mary A. Hollings This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pamela Nagami Chapter 10, The French Reformation, Part 3 Henry III was at first puzzled how to deal with the League, but he could not wink at the Guises' daring claim to his throne. He turned to the States General at Blois for help, but in the course of drawing up a constitutional reform, the Catholics' demand for the exclusive recognition of their religion brought on the Sixth Civil War in 1577. Alençon, who had been playing with the Calvinists, and Damville, both joined the Royalists, and only Elizabeth's timely aid enabled Navarre to cut short hostilities, mainly in the West, by the Treaty of Bergerac. It justified the saying, 
the worse the fortunes of the Huguenot in war, the better their luck in treaties. Except that the right to worship was confined to places actually in their possession, and that the Chambre mi parti were limited to the south, their position was unchanged. No one, however, believed that peace would last, and a quarrel between the king and Henry of Navarre about Cahors, claimed by the latter as Margaret's dowry, led to the lovers' war in 1580. A great slaughter of Catholics took place at the disputed town, but the strife was local and hardly deserves the name of the Seventh Civil War. It was closed by the Peace of Flex, confirming the Treaty of Bergerac. Five years followed without an important outbreak, and men had time to observe with disgust the demoralization of the court and of the country. Henry III, who had shown more bodily and mental vigor than the rest of his degenerate family, declined into a luxurious fop. This curled and scented king, fantastically dressed and surrounded by favorites as brainless as his pet lapdogs, gave himself up to a life of pleasure, occasionally relieved by superstitious acts of penance. Constant brawls and duels took place between his mignon and the followers of Guise. Murders and other crimes became incessant and almost unremarked. Jealousy between the king and Monsieur, Anjou, was partly at the bottom of the fiasco of the latter's appearance in the Netherlands, compared with which his death in 1584 was an event of real importance. But it left Henry of Navarre heir to the French throne. Almost at the moment when Orange's murder marked him out as the natural champion of Protestantism, and it led to the offer to Henry III of the sovereignty of the United Provinces, which, as we have seen, he declined. Meantime, the League became aggressive under Guise, whose ability, courage, and fascination made him a formidable leader. By the Treaty of Joinville in 1585, the League united with Philip II to root out heresy in France and the Netherlands, and upon the death of Henry III to crown the Cardinal Bourbon. The Leaguers published a reform manifesto and made themselves masters of Metz, Toul, and Verdun, and a ring of fortresses barring invasion from Germany, Switzerland, and the Protestant South. Paris was dominated by the Sixteen members from the sixteen quarters, who speedily usurped its government. Much as the king hated the necessity, he was obliged to yield to the Guises, and by the Treaty of Namur he withdrew all previous promises of toleration. Calvinists refusing to change their religion were to leave the country in six months. Northeastern France passed entirely under the control of the Guises, who drew a revenue from the state for their expenses. Immediately after the treaty, Pope Sixtus V excommunicated Navarre and Condé, and declared them incapable of succeeding to the throne. The Eighth Civil War followed, popularly known as the War of the Three Henrys, 1585 to 1589, since the King and the Duke of Guise were opposed to the King of Navarre. The Huguenot outlook was not encouraging, for the King's lieutenants, Mayenne, Joyeuse, and Epernon, were dispatched into the south. The Protestants had little influence elsewhere except in Normandy, and across the northern frontier Parma's triumphant advance might shortly place his unrivaled services at the League's disposal. In the opening campaign, Navarre's brisk movements gained him considerable reputation, and at Courtra, where Joyeuse was killed, he won the first Huguenot victory in the open field. Guise, having assembled the forces of the League at Nancy, disregarded Henry III's express orders, and entered Paris amid great rejoicing. His object, after consultation with the Spanish envoy, was to compel the king to take drastic measures against heresy. Henry, vainly attempting to assert his authority, became a prisoner in the Louvre, while Guise rode unarmed through the city, 
quieting the populace. Finding the situation intolerable, the king stole out of Paris with a few attendants to bid without success for the support of the estates at Blois. There again the hand of the League was mighty, and to Henry there seemed but one way of escape from such thraldom. He summoned the duke and his brother the cardinal to a council at Blois. Guise, who had been warned of danger, scorned precautions. As he stepped into the royal antechamber, he was treacherously stabbed by the bodyguard. The cardinal was arrested and murdered next day, but the remaining brother, Mayenne, escaped to Burgundy. To the queen mother lying on her deathbed, Henry III announced that at last he was king of France, for he had killed the king of Paris. But the League, bitterly enraged by the murder of its idol, took stronger measures to assert itself. Mayenne, now lieutenant-general of the realm, governed Paris with a council formed from the League and its branches, which spread all over the kingdom. The Spanish ambassador became its confidential adviser. The Sorbonne, urging that the crown was really elective, proposed the deposition of Henry. At last, at his wit's end, the king threw himself upon the protection of Henry of Navarre. At Plessis-les-Tours, preparatory to a common attack upon Mayenne, they agreed upon toleration of the Huguenots. Then they marched on Paris to strike at the very heart of the League, when a friar named Jacques Clément avenged the murdered duke by stabbing Henry III as he was reading a petition. So, to the joy of his people, perished the last of the Valois, 1589. Henry of Navarre, 1589-1610, to was now, as Henry III had acknowledged in his dying moments, the lawful king of France. To declare himself a Catholic, as his friends advised, would forfeit the support of the Huguenots, so he merely agreed to receive instruction and turn to military preparations. The League acknowledged the Cardinal of Bourbon as Charles X, and with the support of the lesser clergy, the official class, the Pope, and the King of Spain, seemed powerful indeed as compared with Henry, whose foreign allies, England, the German princes, and the United Provinces, were cautious and poor. But as a party leader, Henry was a host in himself. His wit, his irresistible spirits, his frank sympathy with every class of his subjects, his real military ability and splendid daring, combined to make him the most popular king France ever knew. Faults of private character he had in plenty, but it was much in his favor that a brave nation should feel that in him they had once more a king who was every inch a man. Henry's object in his opening campaign was to cut off Paris from the northern region which supplied her food. To keep in touch with England, he occupied Dieppe and frustrated Mayenne's attempt to dislodge him in the Battle of Arc. Reinforced by Lord Willoughby's band of English, the king advanced on Paris, between which and the enemy he placed himself by the capture of Dreux. To save the capital, Mayenne gave battle at Ivry, March 14th, 1590. There the leaguers were completely routed, at a cost to the victor of only about five hundred lives. Henry's order to spare all Frenchmen caused his troops to slake their vengeance on Mayenne's foreign allies, and both Count Egmont and the Duke of Brunswick fell in the slaughter. Unfortunately, Henry missed his chance of taking Paris by assault, and settled down to a three months blockade when thirty thousand of the inhabitants had died from hunger and the rest were reduced to eating rats mice grass and even the flesh of children parma was ordered to march at all costs to the rescue combining forces with mayenne he stormed lagny on the marne threw provisions into the city by way of the river and forced henry to raise the siege during a short absence of Mayenne, Paris fell into the hands of the Sixteen, 
who indulged their Spanish sympathies by putting to death some members of the Parliament who opposed their views, by seizing the treasury and drawing up proscription lists of the politiques. Mayenne, with a soldierly dislike of disorder, returned promptly and hanged the ringleaders, whose downfall put an end to the League as a revolutionary government. After Parma's return to the Netherlands, Henry invested Rouen in 1592, the last of the Leaguer's northern strongholds. In spite of its splendid defense, Parma had once more to be called to the rescue. Henry raised the siege, hoping to enclose Parma, who had planted himself between Caudebec and Rouen, and cut off his retreat. Escape seemed impossible, for neither bridges nor transports for the river were available. But once more, Parma proved himself a master of resource. Fortifying both banks of the Seine to cover his retreat, with the utmost secrecy, he collected everything in the neighborhood that could float and transported his army by night. Henry came up to find the enemy beyond the range of his guns. It was one of Parma's most famous exploits, but it was also his last. The question of the succession brought together the States General in 1593. The League, as an avowed partisan of Spain, supported Philip II's proposal that his daughter Isabella should be declared inheritress of the French throne through her mother Elizabeth of Valois. But neither the estates nor the Parliament would hear of any violation of the time-honoured fiction of the Salic law. So it was suggested that the Infanta should marry the young Duke of Guise, who should be crowned king. This conclusion Mayenne, who had hoped to reign himself, was resolved to prevent, and Henry was ready to offer the only real solution of the problem. After receiving instruction, he formally entered the Roman Church, and as Reims was still held by the League, was crowned at Chartres, 1594. In the much-discussed conversion of Henry IV, there cannot have been any sacrifice of conviction. Religious opinion sat lightly upon the man who declared himself to be of the religion of all who are brave and good. He has not unjustly been called the Prince of the Politique, whom Tavan defined as those who preferred the repose of the kingdom or of their own homes to the salvation of their souls. This repose Henry alone could secure for France. No Protestant could ever hope to become the national king of a people of whom at least nine-tenths were Catholic. It was equally clear that the Huguenot leader was the man to win toleration for the Huguenot minority. Henry's declaration had immediate effect. The great majority of Catholics joined him. Under the benign influence of gifts amounting to a year's revenue, the League began to melt away. The real price of Paris, declared by Henry to be worth a mass, was a big bribe paid to its governor. Henry at last entered his capital, and as the Spanish garrison marched out, he sent greetings to Philip, adding with meaning, But do not trouble to return. As Mayenne and his cousin Mercure still held out in the hope of turning their governorships of Burgundy and Brittany into independent provinces with Spanish help, Henry declared war on Spain, 1595 to 1596. The Pope's absolution cleared the ground under his feet, and he strengthened himself further by an offensive and defensive alliance with England and Holland. Picardy became the chief scene of operations, and the most important events were the capture of Cambrai and Amiens, and the surprise of Calais by the Spaniards. By great exertions Henry recovered Amiens, and the retreat of the Archduke Albert opened the way for peace. Philip II was mortally ill, and desired to settle the affairs of his successor and of his dear daughter Isabella, especially in view of the great progress made by Morris of Nassau. Thus came about the Peace of Vervins, 1598. 1. Henry recovered the Picard towns conquered by Spain. 2. Savoy agreed to submit Saluzzo to papal arbitration. 
neither england nor holland it will be noticed chose to be included in the treaty at home mayenne had already been bought over and remained loyal but there was still mercure who had succeeded in capturing the affections of Brittany. as the result of henry's personal influence he submitted and surrendered nantes where was issued the famous edict which closed the wars of religion fifteen ninety eight of its seven chief clauses the first three deal with the religious the last four with the political aspect of the question one private worship and liberty of conscience were allowed to the calvinists throughout france two two hundred towns two cities in every district of a certain size and over three thousand castles might hold public protestant worship three a grant was made toward the support of protestant schools and colleges and the publication of calvinist books was legalized four huguenot received full civil rights with admission to all public offices five special chambers whose judges must include one huguenot were set up in the local parliaments to try cases concerning protestants six the possession of two hundred towns was guaranteed to the huguenot for eight years their garrisons being maintained by the crown seven with royal permission the huguenot might hold synods and provincial political councils catholicism was thus acknowledged to be the religion of the country but the protestants though in the position of dissenters were without civil drawbacks and were protected by securities their failure to establish their church as the national faith was due mainly to their small numbers and to the craving of france for unity the catholics had powerful allies in the crown the city of paris and the law courts and the support of the national revenue and of superior foreign aid calvinist excesses cooled the zeal of moderate disciples massacre and expulsion had reduced their numbers owing to the difficulty of getting noble and bourgeois to work together they lacked party organization and unity the loss of coligny the one leader who commanded the respect of all was irreparable and brave as were the gentry they did not prove very reliable soldiers the edict has been criticized for granting too much political too little religious liberty that is to say that it did not admit any general principle of toleration only the right to worship in certain towns and castles on the other hand such political privileges as the right to hold federal assemblies and to send deputies to present petitions at court marked out the protestant community as a state within a state and went beyond even modern ideas of local independence when based merely on religious differences as time went on the huguenots displayed a desire to develop their political organization still further until they attracted the notice of richelieu with fatal results End section twenty four of europe and renaissance and reformation by mary a hollings this librivox recording is in the public domain read by pamela nagami chapter eleven the ascendancy of france part one before undertaking the restoration of his kingdom henry the fourth had to deal with the insecurity of his frontiers between france and the spanish possessions in italy lay savoy whose interests were thus both french and italian her duke aimed at becoming count of provence and playing a leading part in french affairs his reluctance to surrender saluzzo according to the papal award led to war in which the invaders carried all before them the duke agreed to give up to france bresse and bouget in exchange for saluzzo and from this time his house turned its attention increasingly south of the alps his desire to strengthen his position still further on the italian side caused henry to ally himself with tuscany the pope pronounced a divorce between faithless henry and his equally faithless queen margaret of valois thus enabling him to marry the grand duke's niece mary de medici in sixteen o one was born a son and heir 
afterwards Louis the Thirteenth. With the help of his friend and minister, Maximilien de Rony, Duke of Sully, Henry thoroughly overhauled domestic affairs. Though entirely different in character, they worked together admirably. Henry's breadth of view tended to correct Sully's excessive economy and rather narrow and scrupulous attention to details. Henry was inventive, Sully was resourceful, and both were unwearied in well-doing for France. The financial question was one of supreme importance. The revenue was yearly swallowed up by the high interest due on a funded debt of over three hundred million pounds. Owing to a ruinous system of collection, three-quarters of the taxes never reached the treasury at all. The main sources of income were the tie, the gabelle, and the customs duties. In the Pays d'État, which were the five provinces most recently added to the monarchy and consisting of about one-third of France, the tie was levied on land by the local estates. As the estates of the church and the nobility were exempt, the amount raised, while falling heavily on the lower classes, only realized a tenth instead of a third of the total taxation. The remaining two-thirds of France formed the Pays de l'Action, those provinces which had for a considerable time belonged to the crown and where the tie was levied on income. There the taxes were farmed out from the intendant or financial agent downwards, and there was no check on the amount the officials would wring from the unhappy peasants. The most unpopular tax was the gabelle. Each French family was legally bound to buy an excessive quantity of inferior salt, which was a government monopoly. Lastly, there were the customs duties levied at the frontier of each province, discouraging trade between them. Not much help was to be gained from current economic principles, and Sully was not the man to supply new ones. His skill in money affairs fell as far short of genius as good account-keeping falls short of high finance. But he made innumerable small reforms in every department and sternly repressed abuses. He insisted on the local registers being kept with extreme exactness, so that the Chambre des Comptes might check abuses in the collection of the tie. He struck a blow at the host of greedy tax-gatherers by a decree forbidding any impost without the king's order registered in the Parliament. Noblemen and governors of districts might no longer raise money by credit. Usurped domain was recovered and well administered. The result of these and many small reforms were seen in Sully's report of 1609. One hundred millions of debt had been paid off. Nearly twenty-five millions had been gained from domain. The revenue had risen from about nine millions in 1596 to twenty millions. A reserve of thirty millions was laid by in the Bastille. Sully made no attempt to abolish the hateful gabelle, and he introduced another very questionable tax, the Paulette. This tax, one-sixtieth of all official incomes, rendered the offices in question hereditary, and doubled their sale value. This system made a caste of the French official class, and one very burdensome to the country. The stronghold of hereditary office was in future the Parliament of Paris. Recognizing that France is by nature an agricultural country, Sully made a great point of tillage. He persuaded landowners to live upon and cultivate their sadly devastated estates. He protected the peasants from bandits. He remitted the tie between 1594 and 1596 and insisted on the free exportation of corn. From some prejudice against crafts as unfitting men for soldiers, Sully set his face against manufactures. But the king was bent on their encouragement. He ordered thousands of mulberry trees to be planted, and fostered the silk factories at Lyon, Nîmes, and Tours, the potteries at Nevers, and the glassworks at Paris. 
he planned a great canal system connecting the seine the loire the saone and the meuse he concluded commercial treaties with england and holland and renewed one already existing with turkey the beginnings of colonial policy were to be seen in the formation of the french east india company and the foundation of quebec by champlain order was restored after the lawlessness of the civil wars by frequent executions for robbery and murder an attempt was made to put down duelling by making offenders liable to the penalties of high treason the rebellious or discontented nobles with whom their class interests stood first were humiliated one by one and the aristocracy generally was reduced to the position of mere courtiers henry also did much for public works built royal fortifications and founded a school of engineering for his officers many of these measures aroused strong opposition but the work of moulding a state cannot be done with a lenient hand henry's frontier policy shows that the rivalry between france and austria was active and sully's great design a sort of political allegory points in the same direction an opening for the king's diplomacy appears in the julier cleves question in sixteen o nine which in ordinary circumstances would hardly have attracted european attention but these catholic duchies lying south of the united provinces seemed about to pass on the death of duke john william to his lutheran great-nephews john sigismund elector of brandenburg and wolfgang william of neuberg as a protestant ruler was certain by the principle cuius regio eius religio to convert his territories to his own religion the award of the duchies by the imperial courts was watched with the keenest interest by both catholics and protestants the emperor's claim as their suzerain to occupy the duchies with an army pending the decision alarmed both french and dutch and henry the fourth at once set on foot a league for the protection of the lutheran claimants sixteen ten three armies mustered by english dutch german and savoyard troops made ready to invade the pyrenees milan and the disputed duchies when the house of Habsburg was rescued from its most critical position by an unforeseen tragedy as henry the fourth was driving through paris one afternoon his coach was blocked in a narrow thoroughfare while the grooms cleared the way one ravaillac who had followed the royal coach from the louvre mounted the footsteps and stabbed the king twice before his attendants realized what had happened henry the fourth was dead may fourteenth sixteen ten ravaillac a fanatic who probably harbored the idea that henry was about to make war on catholicism made no attempt to escape and was astonished at the universal grief caused by the death of this soldier statesman and benefactor of his people without his practical genius to guide it the war against austria was abandoned and the minority of louis the thirteenth under the regency of his mother mary de medici sixteen ten to sixteen fourteen threw back for fifteen years the development of henry the fourth's work the queen mother was a foolish mischief-making and overbearing woman who was entirely under the influence of an italian lady-in-waiting leonora galagai and her husband concini the latter rose to the highest position as marquis d'ancre and marshal of france though he had never fired a shot in battle and was bitterly hated by the old nobility sully the one man who might have been strong enough to guide the state failed in courage and retired to poitou the only result of the great campaign against austria was the capture of juliet after which the princes of brandenburg and neuberg remained in possession respectively of cleves and juliet and the french withdrew from the war the queen regent's own sympathies lay with spain and no time was lost in arranging a double marriage alliance between louis the thirteenth and the infanta anne and the princess elizabeth of france with philip the third's heir 
Sully's reserve treasure was squandered in buying the support of discontented nobles, who nevertheless demanded that their grievances against the feeble and expensive government should be laid before the States General. The assembly was accordingly summoned for the last time, as it turned out, before the French Revolution. Unluckily, they had no common purpose, but each estate, clergy, nobles, and commons, was occupied with its own special interest. On one subject only were they agreed, the shameful financial mismanagement of the Regency, and they succeeded in reducing pensions and in temporarily suspending the Paulette. The king, who came of age at fourteen, was encouraged by his favourite, de Luina, to resent the ascendancy of Dancre, Though himself a protégé of Dancre, de Luynes had gained unexpected influence over the boy king by sharing his sporting tastes. A rising of the nobles confirmed their purpose to destroy Dancre, who, as he entered the Louvre, was shot by the guard on refusing to surrender his sword. His wife was burnt as a witch. The queen mother left the court for Blois, where Richelieu, was carefully watching events and was finally the means of reconciling the king with his mother. Luynes, with the title of constable, succeeded in place of Dancre, but his ministry was found to be no improvement upon his predecessors. A serious rising of the Huguenots soon occurred in 1620. The recent addition of Béarn to the monarchy by force of arms and the enforced restoration of church property there alarmed the Calvinists, who plotted to set up a southern republic. Louis the Thirteenth, who had a hereditary love of fighting, led the attack upon the Huguenot strongholds, Montpellier, Rochelle, Saint-Jean-d'Angely, and finally Montauban, which resisted with heroic success under La Force. The death of Luynes from camp fever prepared the way for peace which was signed on the surrender of Montpellier. The Edict of Nantes was confirmed, but the guaranteed towns were reduced to two, Rochelle and Montauban. The privilege of holding political assemblies was entirely withdrawn. Meanwhile, Mary de' Medici had returned to court, and her confidential adviser, now Cardinal Richelieu, became chief minister of France, 1624. Armand du Plessis de Richelieu came of a noble Pontevin family and was now nearly forty. He had early left the military profession that he might hold the family bishopric of Luçon, whose responsibilities he undertook at twenty-four. Luçon was a quiet, even a dull home for a keen spirit, but Richelieu took an active interest in his diocese, besides intently watching political events and corresponding with his friends, among whom François du Tremblay, Le Père Joseph of history, was the most famous. By 1614, Richelieu was sufficiently notable to be chosen orator of the clergy in the States General, and his speech appears to have made the desired impression at court. He became almoner to the young Queen Anne, and soon won the confidence of the Queen Mother. In appearance, Richelieu was tall and spare with a pale complexion, an aquiline nose and piercing dark eyes under slightly raised eyebrows. He was restless and highly strung, but his courage, strength of will, and resource were extraordinary. He was ruthless and vindictive, and domineered over his family circle as he did over the state. On entering the ministry, Richelieu's objects, as he explained later, were three, namely, to destroy the political power of the Huguenots to humiliate the great nobles, and to win prestige abroad for the king. The first shadow cast by coming events abroad was a dispute for the control of the Val Tellina, a valley connecting Tyrol with Lombardy. During a quarrel between the Catholic population of the district and their masters, the Swiss Grison League, the Spaniards in North Italy had supported the former and a dreadful massacre of the Protestants had followed. The Spaniards at once sent a garrison to Coeur on the pretext of keeping order, but it was clear that their real object was the preservation of their communications with the empire. 
Richelieu was keenly alive to the importance of the question. For two centuries, France had been the recognized protector of the Grisons, and this gave him the opportunity of opposing the Pope's arbitration as being too favorable to Spain, and of pouring troops into the valley of which by 1625 they were in full possession. By the Treaty of Monzon, the Valtellina was restored to the Grisons. Before Richelieu had disposed of the Valtellina, a Huguenot rising occurred at Rochelle, 1625. The time was well chosen. The cardinal's position at court was as yet insecure, and the attitude of England was becoming openly hostile. The expulsion from England of Henrietta's mischief-making ladies, Buckingham's peak at the cool reception of his proposal to visit the French court, his desire to win popularity at home by a successful naval expedition, these causes contributed to bring about what was really Buckingham's war. The English expedition landed on the Isle of Rhe, facing the harbour of Rochelle. But Buckingham lost the chance of seizing its two badly defended forts and settled down to a blockade. To Richelieu, the reduction of Rochelle, that gate always open to the foreigner, was of vital importance. His early military training and his wonderful organizing powers had full scope in directing the siege. He took pride in the excellent provision he made for his army, prompt pay, warm clothing, abundance of food, and dry quarters to ward off malaria. Father Joseph and his Capuchins upheld the strict moral discipline of the camp, catechized the soldiers in their leisure, and pronounced absolution in the dangers of action. On the land side, Rochelle was infested by triple lines, and to cut off access to a friendly fleet, Richelieu caused a great stone barrier to be built from each end of the harbour. As these two moles approached each other, the space between was filled with sunken hulks and finely guarded by floating batteries. Rochelle, under its heroic mayor Guiton, held out valiantly amid the agonies of starvation, but the help of England, on which all depended, never reached it. Buckingham, who had been obliged to raise the blockade of Ray after Richelieu's revictualling of the garrison, was murdered at Portsmouth before his second expedition could start and when the English squadron did arrive it made no serious attempt to force the barrier. After eleven months' resistance, Rochelle surrendered. Richelieu showed moderation in his triumph. The fortifications were destroyed and the municipal privileges of the town abolished, but the lives and property of the citizens were spared, and they were promised freedom of worship. A simultaneous Huguenot rising in the south under Rouen was ended by the Peace of Alais, by which all independent political privileges and the last of the guaranteed towns were withdrawn. Henceforth, the Huguenots' only security for the promised liberty of conscience lay in the king's word. Section 25 of Europe in Renaissance and Reformation by Mary A. Hollings. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter Eleven: The Ascendancy of France, Part Two. Thus ended, in the only way possible for her welfare, the religious wars in France. In the interests of national unity, Richelieu had separated the political and religious demands of the Huguenots, destroying the first and securing the second. For among the political aims, that of independence aided by foreign enemies of France, had for the last fifteen years been steadily coming to the front. The Huguenots, it was said, preferred a Spaniard to a French Catholic, while if they proclaimed a fast, it was in order to mask some plot on foot against the government. Before this, Richelieu's first great object had been completely achieved. Foreign affairs again claimed his attention. On the death of the childless Duke of Mantua and Montferrat in 1627, the duchy was claimed by his next of kin, the Duke of Nevers, a French subject, and by numerous candidates supported by Spain. 
the emperor undertook to arbitrate, but imperial activity was not welcome in Italy, and Milan and Savoy, on their own account, occupied Montferrat, and with Spanish troops under Spinola besieged Casale, into which a French garrison had been thrown. Ferdinand II, indignant at this slight upon his authority, at the first opportunity in the Thirty Years' War, sent troops into Mantua. Richelieu set out in person for the scene of action in command of three French marshals and a formidable expedition, which was, however, diverted into Savoy on account of the Duke's double-faced policy. But the capture of the fortress of Pinerolo was their only success, and France was glad of the opening afforded by Spinola's death to make a truce. Though French military intervention had not been very effective, there remained the indirect methods of diplomacy. It was possible to hamper the House of Habsburg at home, and this Richelieu did in two ways. By negotiating a peace between Sweden and Poland, he opened the way into the Thirty Years' War for Gustavus Adolphus. And at the Diet of Ratisbon, Father Joseph played an important part in securing Wallenstein's dismissal and in frustrating the election of the Archduke Ferdinand as King of the Romans. By the Treaty of Ratisbon, the Emperor promised to invest the new French Duke of Mantua, after which event all foreign powers were to clear out of territories recently occupied by them. Richelieu was bent on keeping Pinerolo, and actually disavowed the treaty to which Father Joseph had been a party. The probable explanation of this move will be seen in domestic affairs. The new Duke of Mantua was finally installed by the Treaty of Carrasco, but France forced him to sell a large part of Montferrat to Savoy, in order to compensate the latter for the loss of Pinerolo. For France in the end secured her key to the passage of the Alps. It is probable that the peace, had it come earlier, would have made Richelieu no longer indispensable, hence his rejection of the first terms. There was always a danger that the constant pressure exerted against him by the two queens, his enemies, might take sudden effect. Louis, though moody and uncertain, was very far from being a negligible quantity in politics. While he depended on Richelieu's advice, even in small private matters, he almost unconsciously resented his ascendancy. He was almost incapable of attachment to anyone, and the only road to his favor was success. Yet even success might be too dearly bought at the price of domestic peace. Before the Italian question was at an end, a plot for Richelieu's arrest was on foot under the patronage of both queens, and the king's worthless brother, Gaston of Orléans, and supported by the Chancellor and his brother Marshal Mariac. Mary de' Medici brought matters to a point by a violent attack on Richelieu in the king's presence, challenging her son to choose between his mother and his minister. Louis, who was greatly annoyed, hesitated some hours, and the court considered Richelieu a doomed man. Then the king left for Versailles and sent for Richelieu to join him. The sudden reaction that followed has made November 11th, 1630, famous as the Day of Dupes. The Queen Mother's influence was shattered, and in the spring she escaped to Spanish protection in Brussels. Gaston fled to Lorraine, the Chancellor was driven into exile, and the Marshal executed after an arbitrary trial. In following his second great aim, the humiliation of the nobles, Richelieu made only one exception to his rule of always bringing the most powerful offender to justice. The exception was the king's brother Gaston, whose contemptible character prevented his becoming a dangerous force in France. But he was constantly the cause of bringing others into trouble. Thus, after the day of dupes, the support lent to him by the Duke of Lorraine was the means of bringing that country under French occupation, while his confederate Montmorency, though the last of an illustrious family, perished on the scaffold. 
yet gaston's name is again found among the conspirators cinq mars de and bouillon who tried for the last time to overthrow richelieu the cardinal as he lay apparently dying revived to bring cinq mars the king's favourite equerry and his less guilty friend de Thou, to execution exhausted by this final victory richelieu passed away december fourth sixteen forty two declaring that he had had no other aims than the welfare of god and of the state the list of great nobles who suffered death at richelieu's hands for political reasons included five dukes four counts a french marshal and the king's chief equerry but the humiliation of their class was achieved by edicts against duelling the building of castles and of fortresses though it is possible that change of fashion was at work in the same direction as the real organizer of the professional army of france he took the opportunity to suppress the offices of constable and admiral and raised many infantry regiments without the customary agency of the nobles for the navy which scarcely existed in sixteen twenty four he did even more leaving at his death a fleet of fifty-six warships most important however of all his measures to reduce the nobles was the superseding of all but four of the nineteen great territorial magnates by royal officials this permanent class of intendants created by richelieu was responsible in each district to the crown alone for the local administration of finance justice and police the suppression of feudalism was inevitably the first step toward the unity of france under a powerful crown and as the french nobles had accustomed themselves to enjoy privileges without corresponding duties it is impossible to regret the fate which overtook this least useful and most troublesome class of society the third of richelieu's great objects will be dealt with in connection with the thirty years war his great claim to his country's gratitude is that he gave her unity except through the power of the crown this end was probably unattainable and richelieu therefore made the king the source and centre of national life his idea of royalty was absolute monarchy it is useless to discuss in view of his opinion and circumstances whether he should or could have given france a constitutional government the question is rather whether the despotism he bequeathed to his country was benevolent at all it is not easy to defend richelieu from the charge of sweeping away traditional rights merely to unfetter the action of the crown the effect was certainly to encourage contempt for law and custom for instance the parliament of paris in its proper court was thoroughly able to deal with political prisoners yet the cardinal invariably appointed a special commission to try offenders again the provincial estates belonging to the pays d'etat may not have been either fully representative or very useful still they stood for local opinion which was stifled in certain provinces by the introduction of elu or royal officials the whole system of local government by the intendants was unknown to the law though they took precedence of all the district officials if any man could have wrestled successfully with the abuses of privilege that man was richelieu most powerful of french ministers yet though his hand was heavy upon the nobles he left them in full possession of the seigneurial rights that burdened the peasant's lot under his rule taxation had increased fourfold yet the nobles the clergy and the official class continued to be exempt all the old bad taxes and abuses since sully's time remained he neglected the agricultural interest which has always been the chief source of the country's wealth and at his death the revenue for the next three years was already spent there is no doubt he could have been better served had he chosen than by the financial agents he employed and his habit of directing important campaigns himself may partly account for the absence of first-class military talent under his rule 
As a spiritual force in the religious life of his time, he counted for little. He regarded the church as a useful moral influence and as the best training school for the highest branches of public service. He did something to reform the religious orders and seems to have thought of making himself independent patriarch of France, since all his attempts failed to win papal favor. His successor, Cardinal Mazarin, far less commanding in personality and less original in statesmanship, only continued part of his work, the campaign against Austria. Giulio Mazzarini, chief minister, 1642 to 1661, born in Italy in 1602 and educated at Rome and in Spain, had, like Richelieu, forsaken a soldier's career for diplomacy. For two years he acted as papal nuncio in Paris and became a naturalized Frenchman. He succeeded Father Joseph in Richelieu's confidence, became cardinal in 1641, and was commended by his dying master to the king. As Louis XIII's own health was fast failing and the Dauphin only four years old, Mazarin foresaw the coming importance of the queen, and by his personal attractions and deferential manners won her favor. Anne was lonely and unappreciated. After her husband's death in 1643, she responded by giving Mazarin her entire confidence and affection, and it is probable that they were secretly married. It was through his influence that the queen was recognized by the parliament as regent with full sovereign powers, instead of sharing them with the rest of the council as Louis the Thirteenth had intended during his son's minority. Though Mazarin was heir to Richelieu's ideas, nothing could have been more different than their methods. No changes took place among the officials, but the return of many exiles ushered in milder rule. Mazarin was, unlike Richelieu, neither vindictive nor jealous of other able men. The discovery of two soldiers of the first rank at the outset of his ministry was hardly accidental. Mazarin always avoided frontal attacks. He was patient, adroit, and full of dissimulation. To win a point, he could fawn and cringe, and his manner was one of confiding innocence. These qualities, his foreign origin, and his great avarice, jointly account for the exceeding hatred he inspired in France. Even in her neglected days, Anne of Austria had not been without her own circle, and these Queen's friends, styled Les Importants, aimed at ousting the Cardinal, with the result that their leader Beaufort was imprisoned and their party broken up. A much stronger expression of feeling against Mazarin appeared in the movement known as the Fronde, 1648 to 1653, called after the sling, which was the typical weapon of the Paris gamin. Except in gaining a brief breathing space for Spain at a critical period of the war, the Fronde forms no part of European history and will only be sketched here in outline. Its causes may be summed up as hatred of Mazarin, reaction against Richelieu's lawless absolutism, ambition on the part of the nobles to recover lost ground. The First Fronde was also a constitutional movement, partly inspired by the example of the English Civil War. The Second, an undisguised struggle between the king and the nobles. The first movement centered round a program of reform drawn up by the Parliament of Paris and containing two demands of vital interest for the future, the control of taxation by the Parliament and of arbitrary imprisonment by means of a habeas corpus act. The court party foolishly seized the leaders of the agitation, whereupon ensued a tremendous uproar, street barricades, and the usual signs of a Paris mob's displeasure. The court gave way and the demands were registered. It is not greatly to the point to criticize the unfitness of the Parliament to carry out constitutional reform. It was surely a step forwards to control by whatever existing institutions the government's arbitrary power to tax and imprison. Unfortunately, however, the Parliament proved too weak and the nobles too selfish to carry reform. The nobles who led the second movement though the famous Condé was of their number, 
were mere holiday warriors or great ladies who lent their spasmodic interest and fascinating wiles to politics the arrest of cond and his nearest kinsmen exposed mazarin to the full force of the storm he fled to cologne whence he continued to direct french affairs he was declared an exile and his library and art treasures were sold by order of the parliament eight months of civil war followed finally the prestige of the crown proved too strong for its enemies the valuable services of turenne conde's unpopularity in paris the disorganization of trade and the general distress of the plundered kingdom were all factors in the defeat of the fronde mazarin was recalled to undisputed supremacy conde took service under the spanish government and other leaders were exiled or excluded from power the nobles were permanently reduced and the parliament forbidden to meddle in state affairs the remaining seven years of mazarin's ministry were occupied by the conclusion of the war with spain which will be noticed in the next chapter and in the accumulation of a fortune of thirty millions his interests were less varied than richelieu's but he was a generous friend to men of letters he did nothing for the financial disorders of france but in the management of his own prosperous affairs he trained colbert a great financier whom on his death in sixteen sixty one he bequeathed to the king's service with the advice that louis should be his own chief minister section twenty six of europe and renaissance and reformation by mary a hollings this librivox recording is in the public domain read by pamela nagami chapter twelve the thirty years war part one in tracing the causes of the thirty years war three important changes in the condition of germany since the peace of augsburg must be noticed first there is the growth of princely power due chiefly to the seizure in protestant states of church lands and to the increase of the ruler's authority since charles v especially during the reigns of maximilian the second and rudolf the second secondly the reformation which by fifteen fifty five had invaded the greater part of both north and south germany reached its high water mark and was already on the ebb the weaknesses of protestantism began to appear its want of organization the ignorance and pitiable poverty of the pastors the quarrels about definition of the faith though unrecognized by the peace of augsburg calvinism was spreading and an impassable gulf divided its followers from the lutherans the enmity between the electors palatine twice calvinist and twice lutheran in sixty years and the lutheran electors of saxony was one of the chief drawbacks to the cause of protestantism the appropriation by protestant princes of church lands in their dominions provoked unceasing protests from catholics while the ecclesiastical reservation was continually evaded when a chapter that had become protestant elected a bishop of its own views in this way eight important north german bishoprics passed into their hands thirdly the progress of the catholic or counter-reformation brought the opposing forces up to fighting point before sixteen hundred the protestant advance had been stayed england holland and scandinavia were its undisputed conquests but in once ultra-protestant poland catholicism was restored in fifteen eighty seven in the spanish netherlands by fifteen seventy nine and recognized as the state religion of france in fifteen ninety eight in spain and italy it had no rival in germany itself bavaria had become by fifteen seventy nine an active centre of jesuit influence and in fifteen ninety six styria carinthia and carniola passed under a fanatical ruler ferdinand cousin of rudolf the second who obliged his subjects to bow to catholicism rudolf followed suit in austria bohemia and moravia and by forsaking the tolerant position of ferdinand i and maximilian the second he laid the match to the train rudolf the second fifteen seventy six to sixteen twelve 
a bigoted, art-loving, and unbalanced recluse, was probably by 1594 quite insane. Yet he continued to reign seventeen years longer. At last, a Habsburg family council appointed his next brother Matthias to rule Hungary and Austria in the hope of saving the eastern frontier from the Turks and of soothing religious discord by a tardy promise of toleration. The anxious fears of the Protestants had been aroused the year before by the enforced restoration of Catholicism at Donauwurt, on the pretext afforded by a riot during a religious procession. The Protestant princes and cities of the South at once united in the Protestant Union under the leadership of the Calvinist Christian of Anhalt, a hopeful and impetuous spirit fatally prone to despise the enemy's strength. The Catholic League, a rival association led by Maximilian of Bavaria, was immediately started by the three ecclesiastical electors. The Julier Cleves question all but kindled war, which was, however, delayed by the death of Henry IV, the dread of a crisis, and the pacific influence of the Lutheran princes. Of these, the chief was John George of Saxony, doubly opposed to Christian of Anhalt on account of his own Lutheran and imperialist sympathies, and lacking the necessary decision and strength of a leader. In Maximilian of Bavaria, the Catholics were more fortunate, for the Duke, who had been educated at the Jesuit College of Ingolstadt, was both resolute and moderate, and an able and practical ruler of his state. The Bohemian Protestants, encouraged by the successes of their Hungarian brethren, wrung from Rudolf II a royal charter, Majestatsbrief, granting complete toleration on royal domains and freedom of conscience elsewhere. Amid the strife following this enactment, Rudolf was succeeded by Matthias, 1612 to 1619, during whose reign came the proverbial lull before the storm. Being worn out and childless, Matthias desired to secure the succession of his cousin Ferdinand of Styria, who had an heir, and might be trusted to keep together the Habsburg dominions. In the family possessions this was easy, and by adroit management the elective crowns of Bohemia and Hungary were also promised to Ferdinand. Suddenly, however, the Protestant nobles of Bohemia, headed by Count Thurn, awoke to the reality of their danger, and having vainly appealed to Matthias, sent an armed deputation to Prague. They entered the castle, and charging the two unpopular and fanatical regents, Martinets and Slavada, with responsibility for the emperor's attitude, they flung the hapless men with their secretary for company into the fosse some seventy feet below. Though not one of them was seriously injured, this violent deed proved the beginning of the Bohemian Revolution, 1619 to 1623. But neither at home nor abroad were any declared allies. The Bohemian nobles were half-hearted, and as reluctant as the towns to bear the cost of an army, and Ferdinand would have made short work of the Bohemian resistance, had it not been for the energy of Christian of Anhalt, and the support of his young friend, Frederick V, Elector Palatine. It was assumed that James I of England, the Elector's father-in-law, would lend his aid though he was known to be a man of peace and warmly disposed towards Spain. Troops under Count Mansfeld, first of the many adventurers who shouldered their way through the war, reduced Ferdinand's forces to their last fortress in Bohemia, and the storm had just burst, when on the death of Matthias, Ferdinand II succeeded to the helm of state, 1619 to 1637. He was a man of upright life, narrow sympathies and resolute character, who, without the grasp of a statesman, was yet able to take a firmer hold of affairs than either of the last two kings. Immediately Ferdinand was surrounded in Vienna by Protestant troops under Thurn, to whom the Austrian nobles threatened to open the gates unless they were allowed to unite with the Bohemians. The firmer the king, the more insolent grew the deputation, till the sound of cavalry galloping up announced that the siege of Vienna was raised, 
and that Ferdinand was free to pursue his election at Frankfurt. Thanks to the disunion among the Protestant leaders, he was unanimously chosen emperor. Exactly two days earlier, the Bohemians, having already deposed Ferdinand, invited the elector of the Palatinate to be their king. Frederick, a rigid Calvinist, was inexperienced and easily led, especially by his hero Christian of Anhalt. The transfer of Bohemia to a Protestant would definitely incline the balance of German religious parties to that side, and all Europe intently awaited the event. Christian's influence prevailed, and Frederick was crowned at Prague. Unfortunately, he had reckoned without his host, for none of his possible allies, England, Holland, or the German Protestant Union, were at all prepared to act. The last, indeed, only undertook the defense of the Palatinate, while the Calvinist zealot, Bethlen Gabor, on whom hopes had been formed, secured Transylvania as his principality by temporarily coming to terms with Ferdinand. On the other hand, the Emperor's allies, Spain, Poland, Tuscany, and the Catholic League, were ready for deeds. Spinola and his Spaniards descended upon the Palatinate, Tilly of Alun, who had served under Parma, occupied the duchies of Austria with the army of the League, and drove the enemy before him under the walls of Prague. We are just outside the town, on the White Hill, Christian of Anhalt's forces awaited events. Tilly attacked promptly, and in an hour the Battle of the White Hill was won. Frederick, who was lunching inside the city with some English envoys, only reached the field in time to be swept away by his own fugitive troops. Only a winter king, as the Jesuits had foreseen, he escaped with his family to the Netherlands. In Bohemia, the Protestant movement was pitilessly crushed. Ferdinand tore up the Maya State's brief, executed the leading nobles, planted foreign soldiery on the confiscated lands, and set the Jesuits to convert by persecution. Many Protestants left the country with disastrous results to its progress. The Protestant Union was dissolved in 1621, and its disbanded forces enlisted under Mansfeld, who, having been driven from the upper palatinate by Spinola, betook himself to the Rhineland and roused Christian of Brunswick, one of the new Protestant bishops, and the Margrave of Baden-Durlach, to adopt the cause of the fair Queen of Bohemia. But both were defeated by Tilly before Mansfeld could come to the rescue. The upper palatinate with its capital, Heidelberg, fell into Tilly's hands, and was made over to the administration of Maximilian of Bavaria, with the title of Elector Palatine for life. Frederick, now a landless exile, was obliged to dismiss his army, whose leaders, Mansfeld and Christian of Brunswick, lived by pillage in Alsace and Lorraine. Thus closed the first or Bohemian period of the Thirty Years' War. Unfortunately, Ferdinand did not use this opportunity to come to terms with the Elector Palatine, and the control of the fortunes of the war soon passed into other hands. Protestant North Germany was becoming thoroughly alarmed for the safety of its church lands, which seemed to run an equal risk of being confiscated by the emperor and being pillaged by Mansfeld, who had quartered himself in East Friesland. Since the marriage treaty between England and Spain had failed with the Prince of Wales's Madrid visit, Parliament was urging James to form an armed alliance for the recovery of the Palatinate. The result was the betrothal of Charles to Henrietta Maria of France and the declaration of war between England and Spain. It was at this moment that Richelieu had become first minister of France, and by disputing the Spanish occupation of the Valtellina and pressing Mansfeld into the service of the Dutch, he opened his campaign against the Habsburgs and added politics to religion as a cause of the Thirty Years' War. While the siege of Rochelle occupied his attention, England had come to an understanding with Christian IV of Denmark, who was keenly interested in the independence of the Lower Saxon bishoprics. 
and in return for English subsidies entered upon the second or Danish period of the war, 1625 to 1629. In the face of this triple alliance of English, Danish, and North German forces, the emperor's position was very critical, when suddenly from Bohemia itself sprang his champion, Wallenstein. Born in 1583 of an old Bohemian family, Albert of Wallenstein had already, as a daring and lucky agent of the Catholic Reformation, carved out from Bohemian confiscations the almost regal estates of the Duke of Friedland. He now proposed to raise an imperial force to be supported by compulsory contributions. It soon numbered 50,000 men. This regularly paid and disciplined army, where Catholic and Protestant were alike welcome, and promotion was decided by merit alone, was a strange contrast to the rabble that had hitherto done duty as such, without uniform, without pay, and cruel beyond belief in its license to plunder. In strategical and tactical ability, Wallenstein ranks next to Gustavus Adolphus in the war, while his courage, justice, and consideration for his men gathered recruits from every quarter. But it was a dangerous precedent for the emperor to depend upon troops enrolled by an independent leader and paid by a system unknown to the law. Serious hostilities began at the bridge of Dessau by Wallenstein's utter defeat of Mansfeld, who had hoped first to join hands with Betlen Gabor. Instead, he was obliged to disband his forces, and while struggling through Bosnia to Venice, he died. Christian of Brunswick had already passed away, but Christian IV, preparing to join his allies in Bohemia, was outnumbered by combined forces of Tilly and Wallenstein, who defeated him with overwhelming loss of officers, men, and guns at Luda. North Germany was left at the mercy of the Catholic League. Brandenburg was prevailed upon to declare for Ferdinand, and Wallenstein and Tilly invaded Schleswig-Holstein, driving Christian before them to the islands of Denmark. There Wallenstein realized the crowning importance of control of the sea, and though he could not persuade the Hansa towns to lend him their ships, he overran the twin duchies of Mecklenburg and demanded that certain Baltic ports should admit imperial garrisons. Among these, Stralsund stoutly refused. As Wallenstein, though general of the Oceanic and Baltic Sea, was without a fleet, Stralsund was accessible to help from Sweden and Denmark, and its burghers preferred to accept foreign aid rather than to submit to persecution and military despotism. At the end of five months, Wallenstein, to his intense mortification, was obliged to turn his back on Stralsund. Peace was at last in sight. Christian's weariness of the war, Wallenstein's suspicions of Sweden, the German prince's suspicions of Wallenstein, prepared the way for the Peace of Lübeck, 1629, by which the King of Denmark recovered Jutland, Schleswig, and his Holstein possessions on undertaking to renounce all claims to the German bishoprics held by his family. The Catholic League was determined, however jealous it might feel of Wallenstein's victories, to turn them to account in the service of religion. They prevailed on Ferdinand to issue the Edict of Restitution, restoring to the Church all property that had been secularized since 1552. Two archbishoprics, twelve bishoprics, and more than a hundred monasteries were about to be torn from the Protestants, whose opposition in the face of the huge armies of Tilly and Wallenstein was unavailing. The edict was, however, entirely contrary to the principle of religious equality on which Wallenstein's army was based, and to his patriotic ideal of regenerating Germany by maintaining an armed neutrality between the creeds. He looked to establish a strong emperor upon the ruins of the princely power that he despised, to lead a crusade against the Turks to ask in return it might even be a crown for himself. But Ferdinand was undecided, and the princes, rather than lose their independence, were ready, like the Stralsund burghers, to call in foreign aid. 
this divergence of aims between the league and the emperor's general gave richelieu his opportunity of dealing a blow at the habsburgs and gustavus adolphus an opening for his entry into german politics of which both took advantage at the diet of ratisbon father joseph one of the best informed most penetrating and supple diplomatists of his time succeeded in turning the scales against ferdinand's general strange to say wallenstein the master of legions accepted his dismissal and retired into private life on his bohemian estates while tilly succeeded to his command the next problem for the princes was to discover the intentions of the king of sweden and here the history of the house of vasa must be briefly sketched End section twenty seven of europe and renaissance and reformation by mary a hollings this librivox recording is in the public domain read by pamela nagami chapter twelve the thirty years war part two between thirteen ninety seven and fifteen twenty three the three kingdoms of denmark norway and sweden were united under one crown by the union of kalmar no real national feeling existed however and the work of the house of vasa was to win for sweden her independence of the predominant partner denmark in avenging the fate of many of his fellow nobles in the stockholm bloodbath gustavus Eriksson accomplished this task and was crowned king of sweden in fifteen twenty three his family took the name vasa from the sheaf in their coat of arms it was the aim of gustavus to build up a strong monarchy under which the power of the church and of the nobles should be levelled the disorders of the country suppressed and its internal wealth and foreign influence developed as in england the king made use of the reformation to strengthen the crown by the famous recess of the diet of vesderas the adoption of lutheranism not only gave the king the support of the clergy whom he appointed but confiscated the church lands for his benefit in fifteen forty four at a later diet of the same name the throne was made hereditary whereby a serious blow was dealt at the independence of the nobles the foreign policy of sweden as a european power though indicated by gustavus vasa remained for his successors eric and john to develop it inevitably roused the rivalry of other northern nations with like interests namely denmark and russia and under john's son sigismund the third the restorer of roman catholicism in poland a determined effort was made on his election to the throne for the recovery of sweden to the church the swedes however resented foreign interference with their religion and in fifteen ninety three the synod of Uppsala formally accepted the confession of augsburg sigismund soon retired to poland and was scarcely more than king of sweden in name until his deposition in fifteen ninety nine the real ruler afterwards charles the ninth was the ablest of gustavus vasa's sons who was a strong champion of protestantism and the founder of sweden's forward policy in the baltic a policy that brought him into collision with both poland and denmark he made good his hold on livonia and estonia but his death at the outbreak of the danish war left its burden on the broad young shoulders of his son though gustavus adolphus sixteen eleven to sixteen thirty two was only seventeen his public life had begun at nine and he was already well trained in war and politics he could speak seven languages had a protestant's love and knowledge of his bible and cared for poetry and music in appearance he was a typical northman tall fair and blue-eyed and he inherited the characteristics of his race their ambition versatility fiery temper and joy in battle but with these qualities gustavus united a noble and generous nature and a sound judgment which guided his pursuit of the ideals that lay near his heart it is the union in gustavus of the imaginative and the practical that makes him the most attractive figure of his age for the first eighteen years of his reign 
Gustavus was at war in turn with Denmark, Russia, and Poland. For the second, he gained the provinces of Ingria and Karelia, closing her access to the sea. From the third, he conquered Livonia and a long line of Prussian coast, with the right of levying customs at the ports, which enabled him to pay his way at the outset of the Thirty Years' War. Almost more valuable was the thorough military training his troops received in these campaigns. On his landing in Germany, fully half his army of 70,000 Scots, Poles, Germans, and Swedes consisted of his own subjects, a great achievement for a population numbering under two million. The Third or Swedish Period of the War, 1630 to 1635, opens with Gustavus's landing in Pomerania. He joined the struggle at his own time and for his own reasons. He fought because he believed the Swedish nationality and the Protestant religion to be at stake, because Protestantism was bound up with the past and future of his house and of his kingdom, and because he believed that the Habsburg designs on the Sound and the Baltic would stifle Swedish national life in its cradle. The undertaking was doubly uncertain from the condition of his allies. Denmark, latently jealous, England, preoccupied at home, the Dutch, lukewarm, the German princes, except Bernard of Saxe Weimar aloof, the two important electors of Saxony and Brandenburg remaining stolidly neutral. With France, he was only able to come to terms when Richelieu realized that Sweden was not to be exploited in the interests of his own or any other country. The cardinal's first reason for entering the war was to secure the frontiers of France. Before long, everything opposed to German unity appeared to be a direct gain to French interests, and finally his policy stopped at nothing short of annexation. His calculations were disturbed by the presence of Gustavus as of a new planet, that swam into his ken. The reserve, the sturdy independence, and the Lutheran sympathies of the king interfered with the true course of the cardinal's policy to hold the balance between the Catholic League and the Protestant Union, and to avoid a declaration of war until its profits could be secured. Yet it was impossible at the same time to be a supporter of the loyalist Maximilian of Bavaria and an open enemy of the emperor or to direct the Catholic policy of Europe, while undermining the Habsburg power through Protestant allies. As long as the genius of Gustavus threw the balance of success on the Protestant side, Richelieu must perforce protect the Catholics. The death of Gustavus obliged him to devote himself to the task of saving the Protestant alliance. Thus, the religious character of the war was slowly merged among national interests for whose sake Germany gradually rallied round her emperor against the foes of his house. By the Treaty of Barwalde, France and Sweden agreed to defend the freedom of the Baltic and of the open sea, to restore the liberties of the German states, to observe neutrality toward the League, and to respect the liberty of Catholic worship in conquered districts. Tilly, commanding the armies of both Empire and League, failed to divide Gustavus and Pomerania from Horn in Mecklenburg, and was driven by them back upon the Elbe. The Swedes stormed Frankfurt and secured the line of the Oda. Urgent appeals for help reached them from Magdeburg, a Protestant stronghold near the Brandenburg boundary of Saxony, which was besieged by the imperialists under Pappenheim. Gustavus judged that the town could hold out two months longer and he hoped to avoid risking the hostility of the electors of Brandenburg and Saxony through crossing their territory to rescue Magdeburg by first securing their act of alliance. But the electors were slow and obstinate, and though the deliverance of Magdeburg was a supreme necessity, Gustavus, who was not wont to stand upon the letter of the law, hesitated, and Magdeburg fell. Twenty thousand men, women, and children were slaughtered, and the whole town, except the cathedral and a few houses on the outskirts, was burnt to the ground. Tilly then invaded Saxony, and the electors were driven by the force of circumstances to declare for Sweden. 
the armies of Gustavus and John George of Saxony came up with Tilly on the Breitenfeld in the famous battle plain of Leipzig, September 1631. Tilly's long line of solid squares confronted a double line of the Swedes in a loose formation of smaller squares, which have been compared to little movable fortresses, and which were interspersed with cavalry. Though the Saxons fled headlong with their elector, the superior artillery of the Swedes and their greater mobility won the day. Tilly's Walloon veterans made a last stand round their old leader and bore him wounded from the field. The imperialists, as a fighting force, had been wiped out. Their guns, standards, and camp spoils fell into the enemy's hands. Tilly retreated to the Weser to gather up his fragments. The whole of North Germany was won for the Protestant cause. The Catholic territories now lay open to attack, and disregarding Richelieu's advice to make for Austria, Gustavus took the road known as the Priest's Lane through Franconia to the ecclesiastical states. He rightly judged that even the capture of Vienna, not then a national capital, would assure his position less than a march of deliverance among the South German Protestants. Great plans were shaping in his mind to destroy what was left of the imperial forces, to weld the Protestants into a general alliance, a corpus of Angelicorum, under himself as a member of the empire, possibly even as emperor. Through the Thuringian forest, Gustavus marched victoriously by Würzburg down the Main, annexing Franconia, and threatening to treat the neutrality of the three Rhine electors as equivalent to hostility. They appealed to France, and Richelieu's jealousy of Sweden's influence on the Rhine prompted the demand that all Gustavus' conquests, except in Treves and Cologne, should be restored. Even to these exceptions, however, Bavaria refused to agree, so Maximilian renounced the French alliance and openly joined the emperor. With the loss of its leader, the League ceased to exist. While Bernard of Weimar conquered the Palatinate, removing every obstacle to the elector Frederick's restoration except the latter's invincible objection to his Lutheran subjects, Gustavus had captured Frankfurt and Mainz and was preparing to advance into Bavaria, where Tilly had reinforced himself and had united with Maximilian. Meeting with an enthusiastic welcome at Nuremberg on his way, the king crossed the Danube and confronted Tilly, who had successfully entrenched himself on the Lech. 1632. As the bridges had been destroyed, Gustavus threw pontoons across the stream in the night, and for six hours engaged Tilly's troops in a furious cannonade. The old general was mortally wounded in the thigh, and under cover of night, Maximilian carried him and his forces off to Ingolstadt, where he died. At Ingolstadt the king met his first repulse, but he quickly overran Bavaria, and made ready at last to carry the war into the emperor's own territories. No escape for Ferdinand seemed possible, when Germany suddenly rang with the news of Wallenstein's return to his old master, April 1632. But his terms were his own, absolute control of his army, toleration as the basis of peace, expulsion of the foreigner, and a principality, possibly an electorate, as his reward. The magic of Wallenstein's name soon gathered round him soldiers of fortune of every nation, rank, and religious belief, who were only to be restrained by the severest discipline. Of the Saxon army which was occupying Bohemia he made short work, and plundering Saxony as he went, he marched south to join the Bavarian forces. Well aware of the uncertain nature of John George's alliance, Gustavus was on the point of hastening to his rescue when the news of Wallenstein's approach turned him southwards to defend his staunch ally, Nuremberg. Round the city he gradually concentrated his reinforcements under Oxenstierna, Bernard, Banner, and Hesse, till they finally numbered about four-fifths of Wallenstein's huge army. On the hills north of the town, opposite the main Swedish position, Wallenstein fortified his camp, resolving to risk no engagement without manifest superiority, 
but to isolate and starve out Gustavus. Famine and pestilence and summer heat wrought even more deadly havoc in the overcrowded town than in both camps, although their total death roll exceeded that of any great battle in the war. With starvation staring them in the face, the discipline of the soldiers began to break down. After a desperate night attack on Wallenstein's position, the king withdrew. Wallenstein directed his march on Saxony, intending to terrorize the elector into alliance, but in his own words, the Swedes came as if they had flown and concentrated at Erfurt. Convinced that the bitter cold of those first November days would drive Gustavus into winter quarters, Wallenstein fortified his position at Lützen and detached Pappenheim for service at Cologne when the amazing news arrived of the enemy's advance. Hastily recalling Pappenheim, Wallenstein hurried his regiments into position. At nightfall, November 16, 1632, the two armies divided by the Leipzig road were drawn up on the plain of Lützen, and at daybreak a thick mist hung over the field. The formation of Breitenfeld seems to have been repeated, the Swedes in two lines opposed to one of the imperialists. The king without armor on his white charger commanding the cavalry on the right wing. Bernard on the left, the infantry and the big guns massed in the center. Under cover of an artillery duel, the Swedes advanced to the high road, and from that moment charge followed charge all along the line. The Swedes seized the guns in an attack on the imperialist center, but were instantly repulsed, and with terrible loss of life among their officers, the guns were recaptured. Gustavus, galloping to the rescue at the head of his picked cavalry, rode into a patch of mist and lost touch with the main body. A party of cuirassiers discovered him wounded and tended by one faithful page. I am the king of Sweden, Gustavus answered to their challenge. They thrust him through with their swords and the page beside him, plundered the dead bodies and rode off. The white charger carried the fatal news in his frantic rush riderless along the lines. Bernard took command, and wild for vengeance, the Swedes flung themselves upon the enemy. They recovered the king's body, retook the imperialist guns, and though temporarily forced back by the arrival of Pappenheim's troopers, gripped their footing at the high road, and in a last charge drove the imperialist army from the field. But though victory was with the Swedes, it was dearly bought in a heavy death roll, and above all, in the supreme loss of the king, general, and statesman whose place no other man could fill. His chancellor and friend Oxenstierna took up his political work and guided the minority of Gustavus's six-year-old daughter, Queen Christina. Bernard and Horn alternated in command of the army. But France and the majority of German Protestants felt genuinely relieved at the king's death, because France had never been able to control him, and the Germans found him a stronger master than their emperor. Yet Richelieu's eagerness to enlarge French frontiers was checked by the immediate danger of the collapse of the Swedish power, so he supplied money and encouragement, and allied himself with the new League of Heilbronn, the nearest realization of Gustavus's corpus evangelicorum. It was a defensive and offensive union of circles, Franconian, Schwabian, and Rhenish with Sweden. The elector of Saxony held aloof. He was in fact negotiating with Wallenstein, who had withdrawn to Bohemia after Lützen, and with whose name rumor was busy. The advance of Bernard and Horn in the Danube Valley was attributed by the Bavarians to his indifference. His many enemies joined in the general chorus of suspicion and gained the imperial ear. Even now his aims are hardly understood but his chief desire seems to have been the restoration of peace, mainly through turning Richelieu's ambitions in the direction of the Low Countries. Yet Ferdinand was bent on cooperation with Bavaria and Spain, and if Wallenstein's peace meant large concessions to Protestantism, he must expect to break with the court. His reliance on his army received its first shock in the desertion of some of his leading generals. Next he was declared guilty of treason, dismissed from all command, 
and his soldiers were released from their allegiance. Finally, before he could rally other supporters round him at Eger, his most faithful officers were lured by the governor of the fortress to a banquet and there assassinated. Devereux, an Irish captain, sought out Wallenstein's quarters and with a following of soldiers murdered him as he was turning in for the night. February 1634. End section twenty 